Preface and Introduction of Gallipoli Diary. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Preface and Introduction. Preface. In the kind and courteous letter which you will read on page 15, General Sir Almer Hunter Weston says that it is not possible for him to write a preface to this book. That is my own and the reader's great loss, for General Hunter Weston, as is well known, commanded the 29th Division at the landing on the Gallipoli Peninsula on April 25, 1915, and during those early months of desperate fighting, until, to the universal regret of all who served under him, he became one of the victims of the sickness that began to ravage our ranks. And as one of the chief players of the great game that was there enacted, his comments would have been of supreme interest, and would have added immeasurably to such small value as there may be in this diary of one of the pawns in that same game. But since the player cannot, the pawn may perhaps be allowed to say a few words by way of comment on and explanation of the following pages. Towards the completion of the mobilization of the 29th Division in the Leamington area in early 1915, I heard secretly that the division was bound for the Dardanelles at an early date, instead of for France as we had at first expected. By this I knew that in all probability the division was destined to play a most romantic part in the Great War. I had visions of trekking up the Gallipoli Peninsula with the Navy bombarding a way for us up the Straits and along the coastline of the Sea of Marmora, until, after a brief campaign, we entered triumphantly Constantinople, there to meet the Russian army, which would link up with ourselves to form part of a great chain encircling and throttling the Central Empires. I sailed from England on March 20th, 1915, firmly convinced that my vision would actually come true, and that sometime in 1915 the paper boys would be singing out in the streets of London, Fall of Constantinople, British link hands with the Russians. And I am sure that all who knew the secret of our destination were as firmly convinced as I was that we should meet with complete success. We little appreciated the difficulties of our task. For these reasons, and perhaps because the very names, Gallipoli, Dardanelles, Constantinople, sounded so romantic and full of adventure, I determined to revive an old, if egotistic, hobby of mine, the keeping of a diary. Throughout the Gallipoli campaign, therefore, almost religiously every day, and with very few exceptions, I recorded, as I have done in the past, the daily happenings of my life and the impressions such happenings made on me, and the thoughts that they created. The diary was written by me, to myself, as most diaries are, to be read possibly by myself and my nearest relations after the war, but with no thought of publication. But when the division was in Egypt after the evacuation, and just prior to its embarking for France, a supply officer joined us, whom I had met and talked to on the peninsula, as one meets hundreds of men without knowing or caring to know anything more about them than that they are trying to do their job as one tries to do one's own. His name is Lancelot Cayley Shadwell, and we became firm friends. We talked often of Gallipoli, and one day in France I showed him my diary. He read it and then told me I should try to get it published. I laughed at the idea but he assured me that these first-hand impressions might interest a wider circle than that for which they were primarily intended, but that beforehand the diary should be pruned and edited, for of course there was much in it that was too personal to be of interest to anybody but myself. I asked him if he would edit it for me. He consented and very kindly undertook the necessary blue penciling, and in addition to his labor of excision was good enough to insert a few passages describing so far as words can, the exquisite loveliness of the peninsula. For these, which far surpass the powers of my own pen, I am deeply indebted to him. 
They will be found under dates May 2nd, Moonlight at Hellas, May 13th, The Sensations One Experiences When a Shell Is Addressed to You, May 26th, Moonlight Scenes, May 30th, Coloring of Imbros, July 15th, Alexandria, September 16th and 17th, The Bathing Cove. I am also indebted to the kindness of Captain Joslyn Bray, the Assistant Provost Marshal of the 29th Division on the Peninsula, for many excellent photographs. The diary next had to be submitted to the censor, who naturally refused to pass it until the Dardanelles Commission had finished its sittings, and it was nearly a year before it came back into my hands, passed for publication, but with a few further blue pencilings, this time not personal but official, and in this form, hastily scribbled by me from day to day, with a stumpy, indelible pencil, on odd sheets of paper, pruned, edited, and improved by Shadwell, and extra edited, if not notably improved, by the censor, my diary is now presented for the consideration of an all-indulgent public. Enough has been said to show, if internal evidence did not shout it aloud, that my diary has no literary pretensions whatsoever. I am no John Massfield, and do not seek to compete with my betters. Those who desire to survey the whole amazing Gallipoli campaign in perspective must look elsewhere than in these pages. Their sole object was to record the personal impressions, feeling, and doings from day to day of one supply officer to a division whose gallantry in that campaign well earned for it the epithet immortal. If in spite of its many deficiencies my diary should succeed in interesting the reader, and if in particular I have been able to place in the proper light the services of that indispensable but underrated arm, the Army Service Corps, I am more than content. I have now seen the Army Service Corps at work in England, Egypt, France, and Flanders, as well as in Gallipoli, and the result is always just the same. Tommy is hungry three times a day without distinction of place, and without distinction of place three times a day, as regularly as the sun rises and sets, food is forthcoming for him, food in abundance with no cues or meat cards. The Army Service Corps must never fail, and it never does fail, for its organization is one of the most brilliant the Army knows. But few other than those in the Army Service Corps itself or on the staffs of armies, can appreciate its vastness and its infallibility. To do so, one should watch the supply ships dodging the enemy submarines and arriving at the bases, the supply hangars at the base supply depots receiving and disgorging the supplies to the pack trains, the arrival of the trains at the regulating stations on the lines of communication, whence they are dispatched to the railheads just behind the line, the staff of the deputy directors of supplies and transport of armies at work, following carefully the movements of formations and the rise and fall of strengths, to ensure that not only shall sufficient food arrive regularly each day at the railheads, but that there shall be no surpluses to choke the railheads. It is hardly less important that there should not be too much than that there should not be too little. The slightest miscalculation may easily lead to chaos, to the blocking of trains carrying wounded back and ammunition forward, or the deprivation of a few thousand men of their food at a critical moment. One should watch the arrival of the supply pack trains at the railheads, where the supply columns of motor lorries or the divisional trains of horse transport unload the pack trains and load their vehicles, regularly each day at scheduled times under all conditions, even those caused by a 14-inch enemy shell bursting at intervals of five minutes in the railhead yard, causing all and sundry to get to cover except the Army Service Corps, who must never fail to clear the train at the scheduled time. One should watch the divisional train headquarters at work, following its division and arranging for the daily correct distribution and the delivery of the rations to units. Often horse transport, by careful managing on the part of train headquarters, 
is released for other duties than those of drawing and delivering supplies to units. Then one may watch the Army Service Corps driver delivering Royal Engineer material, etc., to the line, along roads swept by high explosive shell and shrapnel and machine guns, where all but the Army Service Corps driver can get to ground, while he must stand by his horses and get cover for them and himself as best he can. Then, although one has only seen the skeleton framework of this vast service, and has had no opportunity to go into the technicalities of the system or to investigate the many safety valves of base supply depots, field supply depots, reserve parks, and emergency ration dumps in the line, all of which are ready to come to the rescue should a pack train be blown up or a convoy scuppered, nor to study the wonderfully efficient organization of transport, covering mechanical transport, horse transport, Foden lorries and tractors, which ply from the base to the line, carrying as well as supplies, ammunition, royal engineer material, and every imaginable necessity of war, and moving heavy guns in and out of position, at times under the very noses of the enemy. Yet one cannot fail to have gained a great respect for that vast and wonderfully silent organization, the Army Service Corps. J. G. G. France, May, 1918. End of preface. Introduction. Letter from Lieutenant General Sir Almer Hunter Weston, Knight Commander, Most Honorable Military Order of the Bath, Companion of the Bath, Distinguished Service Order, Member of Parliament, Deputy Lieutenant, who commanded the division at the landing April 25th, 1915. Dear Gillam, the diary of a man who, like yourself, took part in the historic landing at Gallipoli and was present on the peninsula during the subsequent fighting will, I know, be of interest to many besides myself. There are but few of us who, in those strenuous days, were able to keep diaries, and even fewer were those who had the gift of making of their daily entries a narrative that would be of interest to others. I should like to have time to write a preface for this book of yours, giving the salient points of our great adventure, and the effect it had both on us and on the enemy. I should also like to have shown the influence that you and the Army Service Corps generally had on our operations, by the successful manner in which you were able to keep the troops fed and supplied under circumstances of apparently insuperable difficulty. But being, as I am, in command of a big army corps on one of the most difficult parts of the front, it is impossible for me to find any time for writing such a preface. I can but wish your book the greatest success, and hope that it will be widely read. Yours sincerely, Aylmer Hunter Weston. Headquarters, 8th Corps, British Expeditionary Force, February 18th, 1918. End of introduction. Part 1 of Gallipoli Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillam. Section 1. The Climate at the Dardanelles by Henry E. Piers. Author's Note by Graham Gillam. After the evacuation of the peninsula, the following article, which appeared in the Westminster Gazette early in September 1915, was shown to me. After reading it through, I compared the weather forecasts that the author sets forth, and was interested to find that they agreed very closely with the notes on the weather that I had made in my diary. The article is therefore republished here, as it may be of interest to the reader. J. G. G. End of Gillam's Note The dispatch of August 31st of Reuters Special Correspondent with the Mediterranean Forces, of which a summary was published in the Westminster Gazette of the 18th instant, speaks of the weather at the Dardanelles, and as to there being two months of fine autumn weather in which to pile up stores, etc., 
It would be more correct to say three months rather than two. It may be interesting to some of your readers to have a few remarks on the weather in the Marmora. Such remarks are based on the results of observations made by a close observer of nature during a period of over thirty years. The fact that particular interest was taken in weather conditions at such a place arose from a cause other than a meteorological interest in the weather, the object being an endeavor to throw light on the migration of birds. Bird naturalists in general, and especially Frenchmen, have fully recognized that the two stretches of land, namely the shores of the Bosporus and that of the Dardanelles, being the closest points of juncture between Europe and Asia, as also the European coast between these points, are the concentrated passageway or route for the huge migratory flocks of birds proceeding from the western half of Europe into Asia. Three results stand out in respect to this migration. First, the absolute regularity of the autumn migration or passage. Secondly, certain conditions of weather at almost fixed dates. Thirdly, the result of the weather conditions as affecting the density of the flights, the resting and stopping of various birds at certain places. The subject is a very wide one, and is somewhat foreign to the real purpose of my remarks. Taking the month of September to begin with, the weather is very fine, a continuation of summer, cloudless skies day after day, with perhaps a rain and thunderstorm or two, only one generally in the first week and another about September 17th, but always brought on by a north to northwest wind. As a rule, the constant summer land breezes, northeast about, are of less intensity in September than in August which allows for a keeping up of an average day temperature, as the Marmora, Bosporus, and Dardanelles owe their moderate day temperature to these daily breezes, called Meltem, from the north to northeast during the summer. The wind generally dies away at sunset, which fact, however, rather tends to make the night temperature higher during the summer, the result being that, as between day and night temperature, when the north wind blows during the day, there is but little drop in the temperature, and the nights are hot. About September 21st to 24th there is, however, a marked period in the weather. It is either a calm as regard winds, and consequently very hot, or such period is marked by southerly winds, but not of any great intensity or strength, very dry, hot winds. These are the first southerly winds of autumn. But as a general rule, such period is, in nautical terms, calm and fine with southerly airs. From such time up to the end of September, the north or northeasterly wind set in again, but later on, generally about the first week of October, the winds get more to the north and northwest, and there is a heavy thunderstorm or so, and as a result a drop in temperature. From October 10th to 14th, there is a period of uncertainty, sometimes a southwesterly wind which veers round to the northwest and a good rainstorm. The first distinct drop in temperature now takes place, about the 10th to the 14th. One feels autumn in the air, the nights continue fairly warm, and this period continues fine and generally calm up until about the 20th, sometimes the 18th or 19th, when a well-defined and almost absolutely regular period is entered upon. This spell begins with three or four days of very heavy northerly or northwesterly wind, sometimes a gale, generally accompanied by rain for several days. And it is this period, from October 20th to 25th, which is intensely interesting to naturalists, owing to the big passage of all kinds of birds, the arrival of the first woodcock, the clockwork precision of the passage of the stock doves, pigeons, in fact, it is the moment of the big migration, when the air night and day is full of birds on the move. Toward the end of October, and in the way of counter-coup or reaction to the northerly gales, there is generally experienced a fierce three or four days of southerly winds, sometimes gales. It is to be noted that these gales, or changes in the weather, are usually of three or seven days' duration the first day generally being the strongest. And for some of these regular winds, the natives have special names. November almost always comes in fine, 
for the lovely first ten days or so. It, however, becomes rather sharp at night, and a very marked period now of cold weather is to be expected, a cold snap, in fact. This snap is generally in the second or third week of the month, and only lasts a few days, the weather going back to fine, warm, and calm till the end of the month. Barring such cold snap, the month is marked by fine weather and absence of wind, and many people consider it the most glorious month of the year, the sunsets being especially fine. The cold snap is rather a peculiar one. Snow has been seen on November 4th, and, if I remember rightly, the Battle of Lulay bourgaz three years ago was fought on November 5th, 6th, and 7th, and during such time there raged a storm of rain and sleet, succeeded by two or three nights of hard frost, which caused the death of many a poor fellow who had been wounded and was lying out. Another year there was a very heavy snowstorm on November 16th and 17th. Although the weather may be of this nature for several days, it recovers and drops back into calm, warm weather. In the last days of November or the first days of December another period is entered upon. There is generally a heavy south wind lasting from three to seven days, which is succeeded by a lovely spell of fine weather, generally perfectly calm and warm, which brings one well through December. From a little before Christmas or just after, the weather varies greatly. The marked periods are past. The weather may be anything, sometimes calm and mild, sometimes varied by rains, with strong north winds, but no seriously bad weather. In one word, no real winter weather need be looked for until, as the natives put it, the old new year, otherwise the new year, old style, which is January 14th, our style, comes in. After January 14th, or a few days later, the weather is almost invariably bad. There is always a snow blizzard or two, generally between January 20th and 25th. These are real bad blizzards, which sometimes last from three to seven days and anything in the way of weather may happen for the next six weeks or two months. The snow has been known to lie for six weeks. Strong southerly gales succeed, as a rule, the northerly gales. But one thing is to be noted, that the south and west winds no longer bring rain. It is the north and northeast which bring snow and rain. This winter period is difficult to speak of with anything like precision. Nothing appears to be regular. Some years the weather is severe, other years snow is only seen once or twice. Winter is said to have finished on April 15th. The only point about a severe winter is that a period of cold is generally followed by a period of calm, warm weather of ten days or so. It has often been noted that a very cold winter in England and France, etc., generally gives the southeast corner of Europe, about which we are speaking, a mild winter with a prevalence of southerly airs whereas a mild winter in England and France marks the southeast corner of Europe for a severe winter, with a prevalence of northerly winds. No doubt experts will be able to explain this. Of late years, no great cold has visited the Marmora. In 1893, the Golden Horn from the inner bridge at Constantinople was frozen over sufficiently for people to walk over the ice, and the inner harbor had floes knocking about for some weeks. That winter, however, was an exceptional one, but even then the winter only began about January 18th, lasting into March. The great point about the climate is that, however hot or cold a spell may be, it is always succeeded by calm weather, a blue sky, and a warm sun, quite a different state of things from winter weather under English conditions. To those who have relations or friends at the Dardanelles, and I quote from a letter from a friend, let them send good, strong, warm stockings for the men, besides the usual waistcoats and mufflers, and, as for creature comforts, sweets, chocolate, and tobacco, especially cigarettes. It is the Turks who will suffer from the cold. They cannot stand it long, and being fed generally mainly on bread, they have no stamina to meet cold weather. Most of their troops come from warm climbs. End of section one. Section two of Gallipoli Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 2. Prologue, March 1915 and April 1st to 23rd. Prologue, March 1915. On March 20th, 1915, I embarked on the SS Arcadian for the seat of war. My destination, I learned, was to be the Dardanelles, and the campaign, I surmised, was likely to be more romantic than any other military undertaking of modern times. Our ship carried, besides various small units, part of the general staff of the expedition. The voyage was not to be as monotonous as I first thought, for I found many old friends on board. After the usual orderly panic consequent on the loading of a troop ship, we glided from the quay, our only send-off being supplied by a musical Tommy on shore, who performed with great delicacy and feeling the girl I left behind me on a tin whistle. The night was calm and beautiful, and the new crescent moon swung above in the velvet sky, a symbol, as I thought, of the land we were bound for. As we passed the last point, a voice sang out, "'Are we downhearted?' and the usual no bawled by enthusiastic soldiers on board vibrated through the ship, and so, with our escort of six destroyers, we left the coast of old England behind us. Nothing of interest happened during the passage across the bay. On arrival at Gibraltar, searchlights at once picked us up, and a small boat from a gunboat nearby came alongside. We dropped two bags of mails into her, and in return received our orders. As we sailed through the Mediterranean, hugging the African coast, the view of the purple mountains cut sharp against the emerald sky was very beautiful. Our next stop was Malta, which struck me as very picturesque. The island showed a buff color against the blue sky, and the creamy color of the flat-roofed houses made a curious color scheme. As we went slowly up the fairway of Valletta Harbor, we passed several French warships, on one of which the band played God Save the King, followed by Tipperary, our men cheering by way of answering the compliment. The Grand Harbor was very interesting, swarming with shipping of all kinds. The small native boats darting over the blue water interested me greatly. The buff background of the hills, dotted with the creamy-colored buildings and a few forts, the pale blue sky and deeper tint of the water, the wheeling gulls, all went to make up a charming picture. We went ashore for a short time and found the town full of interest. We visited the club a fine old building, once one of the auberge of the Knights of Malta, where we were made guests for the day. Afterwards we strolled round the town. The flat-roofed houses made the view quite eastern, and the curious mixture of fashionable and native clothing at once struck me. The women wore a headdress not unlike that of a nun, black and kept away from the face by a stiffening of wire. We passed many fine buildings, for Malta is full of them, and one particularly we noticed, namely the governor's palace with its charming gardens. As to the country itself, what I saw of it was all arranged in stone terraces, no hedges except a few clumps of cactus being visible. In the evening we returned to the ship, and before very long set sail once more. I found that two foreign officers had joined us. One was a Russian and the other French but both belonged to the French army, and both spoke English perfectly. On April 1st, after an uneventful trip from Malta, we arrived at Alexandria, our base, and from this date the diary proper begins. End of prologue. Gallipoli Diary, April. April 1st to 17th. We arrived at Alexandria on April 1st. The harbor is very fine, about three miles wide, and protected from the open sea by a boom. The docks are very extensive, and just now are, of course, seething with industry. All the transports have arrived safely. The harbor itself is full of shipping, and, anchored in a long row, I am delighted to see a number of German liners, which have been either captured on the high seas or captured in port at the beginning of hostilities and interned. 
all the division disembarks and goes to four camps on the outskirts of the town my destination was bare desert and reminded me irresistibly of the wilderness as mentioned in the bible there was a salt water lake nearby with a big salt works quite near it in the center of alexandria is a fine square flanked by splendid up-to-date hotels and picturesque boulevards but the native quarter is most depressing consisting of mud hovels sheltering grimy women and still grimier children the huts themselves are without windows and only partially roofed flies abound upon the filthy interstices a noxious smell of cooking tainted with the scent of onions greets the nose of the passer-by at all hours i find my work at the docks rather arduous as after the troops have disembarked we have to take stock of what supplies remain on board and then make up all shortages i sleep and have my meals on a different ship almost every day which is interesting about the fifth of the month the troops return to re-embark i have to work very hard on the ships with gangs of arabs these folk are just like children and have to be treated as such watched and urged on every moment if one leaves them to themselves for an instant they start jabbering like a lot of monkeys i finally find myself on a fine red star boat the s s southland there are a lot of our staff on board also french staff including general de Maud, the french general officer commanding who did such good work in france in the retreat he is a distinguished looking old man with white hair mustache and imperial i hear that way and myself are to be the first supply officers ashore at the landing half the army service corps have been left behind in alexandria and there are only five of my people with me sunday april eighteenth we are now steaming through crowds of little islands some as small as a cottage garden others as large as hyde park sea beautifully calm and troops just had their church parade we have the king's own scottish borderers on board and it is very nice having their pipers instead of the bugle on account of drifting mines we are keeping off the usual route two o'clock arrive at our rendezvous lemnos a big island with a fine harbor seven battleships in and all our transport fleet as well as some of the french and australian we remain in the outer harbor a while opposite a battleship that had been in the wars one funnel being nearly blown away. All battleships painted a curious mottled color and look weird. One of our cargo boats has been converted into a dummy battleship to act as a decoy, very cleverly done, too. Later, we go into the inner harbor and moor alongside another transport, the Aragon, on which is my brigade staff and the Hampshires, who were at Stratford with me. The staff captain hands over to me a box which I find is my long-lost torch and batteries from Gamage. French headquarters staff and General de Maud leave and go on board Arcadian. The transport Manito, one of the boats on which I ate and slept, and which left Alexandria, too, in front of our transport, was stopped by a Turkish destroyer off Rhodes, and three torpedoes were discharged at her. The first two torpedoes missed, and the troops rushed to the boats. Owing to some muddle, two boats fell into the sea, and a ship's officer and fifty soldiers were drowned. The third torpedo struck, but did not explode, as the percussion pin had not been pulled out. Two cruisers arrived on the scene and chased the destroyer off, which ran ashore, the crew being captured. After dinner, go on board Aragon with Hampshire officers and C. Panton. Also talk to Brigade Major and Captain Reed of Hampshire's. Monday morning, April 19th. Lovely morning, fleet left, troops with full kit on, marching round deck to the tune of piano. Most thrilling. Piano plays, Who's Your Lady Friend? Soldiers singing. What men, splendid! What luck to be with the 29th. April 22nd. This is a fine harbor, very broad, and there are quite a hundred ships here, including the fleet and transports amongst which are some of our best liners i had to go to a horse boat lying in the mouth of the harbor two mornings ago and took two non-commissioned officers and a crew of twelve men we got there all right a row of two and a half miles 
but the sea was so heavy that it was impossible to row back. I had to return, and fortunately managed to get taken back in a pinnace that happened to call, but the rest had to remain on board till the next day, and then took three hours to row back. This gives us an idea of the difficult task our landing will be at Gallipoli. For a time we were moored alongside the boat on which was the headquarters of the 88th Brigade, and it was cheering to be able to walk to and fro between the two ships and to see all my pals of the Hampshires. The Hampshires and the Worcesters spend the day marching with full kit on round the deck to the cheery strains of popular airs played by a talented Tommy. The effect with the regular tramp is very exhilarating. Later I am ordered to join another ship, the Dongola, in which are the Essex and the Royal Scots, the other regiments of my brigade. Two Essex officers were staying in the Warwick Arms with me, and it was good seeing them again. The harbor at night is a fine sight. A moon is shining and not a cloud in the sky, and the temperature about 50 degrees. The last few days, however, have been wet and drizzling, just like a typical day in June in England when one has been invited to a garden party. One can see the outline of the low, irregular hills on shore, and the ships are constantly signaling to one another, silently sending orders, planning, and arranging for the great adventure. Have to go up to the signaling deck above the bridge to take a message flashed from a tiny little Tinkerbell light away on our starboard. The sight is wonderful. Busy little dot-dash flashes all around the harbor. How the signalers find out which is which beats me. The view of the hills in the background contrasts strangely with the scenes of modern science and ingenuity afloat. I saw the Queen Elizabeth at close quarters two days ago, and I hope to go over her tomorrow. Also the Askold, a Russian cruiser with five funnels. Tommies call her the Packet of Woodbines. It is interesting to note the confidence the Army and Navy have in each other. While being rowed over here by some blue jackets, Stroke told me that he was in the Irresistible when she was sunk. He looked sullen and then said, However, they'll catch it now the khaki boys have arrived. The prevailing opinion amongst the Tommies is that the landing will be a soft job, with Queen Bess and her sisters pounding the land defenses with shells. Then the confidence French, British, and Russians have in one another is encouraging. The feeling prevails that when, once the landing is effected, Turkey will cave in, and that will have a great influence on the duration of the war. But a Scotsman said to me today, remember, Kitchener said, a three years' war. Sir Ian Hamilton this evening sent around a brief exhortation beginning, Soldiers of France and of the King, which bucked up everybody. April 23rd. A bright day. Took estimate of stores on board to see if troops had enough rations. Found shortage. Signaled headquarters who send stores to make up. Received orders where to land on Sunday. Have to go ashore at V Beach with the first load of supplies and start depot on beach. Naval officer on board with a party. Breezy, good-looking young man, very keen on his job. The first boat of the fleet leaves, named the River Clyde, an old tramp steamer painted khaki. She contains the Dublin and Munster Fusiliers. Fore and aft, on starboard and port, the sides are cut away, but fastened like doors. She will be beached at V Beach, and immediately that is over, her sides will be opened, and the troops aboard will swarm out onto the shore, Good luck to those on board. She slowly passes the battleships and, turning round the boom, is soon out of sight. The strains of the Russian national anthem float over the harbor from the Askold, and the first large transport leaves the harbor. A big canarder, the Alcania, with some of the 86th Brigade on board. Great cheering. What a drama, and how impressive the Russian national anthem is. Evening again. Little Tinkerbell flashes begin to get busy. On lower deck the Tommies give a concert, with an orchestra composed of a tin can, a few mouth organs, and combs and paper. Tipperary, who's your lady friend, etc. Feel just a bit lonely and homesick, longing for the time when I can see my sisters again and punt up the river at dear old Guilford. 
But what about the Tommies on board? They have just the same feeling, and yet keep playing their mouth organs. Hear that Ian Hamilton feels a bit anxious over this job, but that Hunter Weston, our divisional general, is full of pluck and confidence. He says that he will not down the man who makes mistakes, yet tries to remedy them, but that the man that he will down will be the one who slacks and avoids work. April 24th. Another bright day. Some transports and battleships leaving harbor. Issue extra days rations to troops on board, which makes four days that they will have to carry. Their packs and equipment now equal 60 pounds. How they will fight tomorrow beats me. I tried a pack on and was astonished at its weight. We have left harbor and are steaming for the scene of the great adventure. Hope we shall not meet a submarine or drifting mines. Have spent the evening with some young officers of the Essex. They all seem a trifle nervous, yet brave and cheery. They play a naval game called Priest of the Parish, but it falls flat. I felt nervous myself, but after cheering them up, felt better. Told them it was going to be a soft job. We arrive at five in the morning, and troops are to land at six. London will be ringing with the news on Monday or Tuesday. If successful, the war out here will soon be over, we think. End of section two. Section three of Gallipoli Diary. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 3. April 25, 1915. April 25th. Was awakened up at four by the noise of the distant rumbling of guns, and coming to my senses, I realized that the great effort had started. I dressed hastily and went on deck, and there found the Essex and Royal Scots falling in on parade, with full packs on, two bags of iron rations, and the unexpended portion of the day's rations, for they had breakfasted, entrenching tools, two hundred rounds of ammunition, rifle, and bayonet. I stood and watched, watched their faces, listened to what they said to each other, and could trace no sign of fear in their faces and no words of apprehension at forthcoming events in their conversation. It was a simple fall-in, just as of old in the days of peace parades, with the familiar faces of their non-commissioned officers and officers before them, like one big family party. They seem to be rather weighed down with their packs, and I pity them for the work that this parade is called for. The booming of the guns grows louder, it is very misty, but on going forward I can just see land, and the first officer points out to me the entrance through the Dardanelles. How narrow it seems, like the Thames at Gravesend, almost. I can see the Askold distinctly. A Tommy said, There's the old packet of woodbines, giving them the what ho. She is firing broadsides, and columns of dust and smoke arise from shore. The din is getting louder. I can't quite make out which is the Asiatic side and which Gallipoli. It is getting clearer, and a lovely day is developing. Seagulls are swooping over the calm sea above the din, and a thunderous roar bursts out now and again from Queen Bess. Her fifteen-inch guns are at work, and she is firing enormous shrapnel shells, terrible shells, which seem to burst thirty feet from the ground. 8 a.m. The Essex are disembarking now, going down the rope ladder slowly and with difficulty. One slips on stepping into a boat and twists his ankle. An onlooking Tommy is heard to remark, Somebody will get hurt over this job soon. Young Millward, the naval landing officer, is controlling the disembarkation. He has a typical sailor's face, keen blue eyes, straight nose, and firm mouth, with a good chin. They are landing in small open boats. A tug takes a string of them in tow, and slowly they steam away for W Beach. We hear the Lancashires have landed at W Beach and are a hundred yards inshore, fighting for dear life. Tug after tug takes these strings of white open boats away from our ship towards land with their overladen khaki freight. Slowly they wend their way towards the green shore in front of us, 
winding in and out among transports, roaring battleships, and angry destroyers, towards the land of the great adventure. Never surely was navy and army so closely allied. I go below to get breakfast, but hardly eat any. The breakfast tables are almost empty, except for a few quartermasters and people like myself who do not fight. I feel ashamed to be there, and a friend says the same. The steward calmly hands the menu round, just as he might on a peaceful voyage. What a contrast! Two boiled eggs, coffee, toast, and marmalade. Here we are sitting down to a good meal, and men are fighting up the cliffs a few hundred yards away. I get it over and go up on deck again. 8.30 a.m. It is quite clear now, and I can just see through my glasses the little khaki figures on shore at W Beach and on top of the cliff, while at V Beach, where the River Clyde is lying beached, all seems hell and confusion. Some fool near me says, Look, they are bathing at V Beach. I get my glasses on to it and see about a hundred khaki figures crouching behind a sand dune close to the water's edge on a hopper which somehow or other has been moored in between the river Clyde and the shore, I see khaki figures lying, many apparently dead. I also see the horrible sight of some little white boats drifting with motionless khaki freight helplessly out to sea on the strong current that is coming down the straits. The battleships incessantly belch spurts of flame, followed by clouds of buff-colored smoke, and above it all a deafening roar. It is ear-splitting. I shall get used to it in time, I suppose. Some pinnace comes alongside our ship with orders, and the midshipman in command says the Australians have landed, but with many casualties, and have got John Turk on the run across the peninsula. I turn my glasses up the coast to see if I can see them, but they are too far away. I can only see brown hills and bursting shells, a sea dead calm and a perfect day. The work of the Creator and the destroying hand of man in close intimacy. A seaplane swoops from the pale blue of the sky and settles like a beautiful bird on the dark blue of the sea alongside a great battleship, while hellish destructive shells deal out death and injury to God's creatures on shore. This is war, and I am watching as from a box at the theater. 10.20 a.m. Imbros is peaceful and beautiful, Gallipoli beautiful and awful. We have moved closer in to the beach, and they are trying to hit us from the shore. Two shells have just dropped near us, 20 yards away. The din is ear-splitting, especially from Queen Bess. I can hear the crack-crack of the rifles on shore, which reminds me of Bulford. I shall be glad when we land. This boat is getting on my nerves. We are just off the Horse of Troy, as we call the River Clyde. Are we going to land at V Beach? I can see no sign of life there. Nothing but columns of earth thrown into the air, and bits of the houses of Sedel Bar flying around, and always those crouching figures behind the sand dunes. Only the Royal Scots left on board. Perhaps they are going to land and make good. I get near Millward to see if he has any orders. He goes up to the bridge to take a signal. 11.30 a.m. We are going out to sea again. A tug comes alongside with wounded, and they are carefully hoisted on board by slings. They are the first wounded that I have ever seen in my life, and I look over the side with curiosity and study their faces. They are mostly Lancashire Fusiliers from W Beach. Some look pale and stern. Some are groaning now and again, while others are smoking and joking with the crew of the tug. I talked to one of the more slightly wounded, and he tells me that it was fun when, once they got ashore, but they copped it from machine guns and getting out of the boats into the shallow water, where they found venomous barbed wire was thickly laid. He laid out four John Turks and then copped it through the thigh, and three hours later was picked up by sailors. And then, any chance of Blighty, sir? And I said, I'm afraid not. It will be Malta or Alex, and back here again to which he replied, Yes, I want to get back to the regiment. 12 noon. We are going closer in again, and the Royal Scots are leaving. The quartermaster, Lieutenant Steele, remains behind with ration parties. He is very impatient and wants to get off. A curious man. 
tells me he doesn't think he will come off Gallipoli alive. 2.15 p.m. I have a dismal lunch, just like the breakfast. I can see French troops pouring out of small boats now onto the Asiatic side and forming up in platoons and marching in open order inland while shrapnel bursts overhead. During lunch I find that we went out to sea but are nearing the land now. Oh, when shall I get off this ship, I wonder? Millward tells me that the delay occurred because at first we were to land at V Beach, but that it has become so hot there that landing today is impossible. He says that I shall land at 4 p.m. I hear a cheer, a real British one. Is that a charge? My imagination has conjured up a mass of yelling and maddened men rushing forward helter-skelter. What I see is crouching figures, some almost bent double, others jog-trotting over the grass with bright sun-rays flashing on their bayonets. Now and again a figure falls and lies still, very still in a crumpled heap, while all the time the crack-crack of musketry and the pop-popping of machine-guns never ceases. That is what a charge looks like. I chat to Millward, and he tells me that the Navy are doing their job well, and he will be surprised if a single Turk is alive for three miles inshore by nightfall, but he expresses surprise that we have only the 29th and the Australians. As he figures it, we want six divisions and the job over in a month. This depresses me. I have orders to leave, and I must get ready. 4 p.m. I give orders to my servant and to the corporal and private of the advanced supply section who are to accompany me to get kit ready. I am to land at once on W Beach with seven days rations and water and a quantity of small arms ammunition for my brigade. I superintend the loading of the supplies from the forward hold to the lighter which is moored alongside, my corporal on the lighter checking it and doing his job just as methodically as he used to at Bulford. While at work, a few shells drop into the sea quite near, throwing up water spouts as high as the funnel of the ship. Two small boats are made fast to the lighter, and my servant and I get into the lighter down the rope ladder. Beastly things, rope ladders. We sit down on the boxes and wait. We wait a devil of a time while others join us, among whom are the 88th Field Ambulance and the Padre. Suddenly Padre gets a message that he is not to go, and we find that he was trying to smuggle himself ashore. At last up comes a small pinnace with a very baby of a midshipman at the wheel, and a lot of orders are sung out in a shrill voice to men old enough to be his father. We slowly steam for shore. Passing across the bows of the implacable, we nearly have our heads blown off by the blast of her forward guns, and the funny thing is I can hardly see a man on board. Pinnaces, tugs, destroyers, are rushing in and out of the fleet of transports and warships. A tug passes close to us on its way to the Dongola, the ship I have just left, loaded with wounded, all slight cases, and they give us a cheer and shout, Best of luck, boys! We wave back. We approach close into W Beach, where lighters are moored to more lighters beached high on the sand, and then the snotty, making a sweep with his pinnace, swings us round. He gives the order to cast adrift, and then shouts at a baby voice, I can't do any more for you. You must get ashore the best you can. We fortunately manage with difficulty to grab a rope from one of the moored lighters and make fast while the two boats are rowed ashore. There we stick. I dare not leave these seven days' rations and water for four thousand men, and I shout to seamen on shore to try to push us in and so beach us. The bombardment begins to ease off somewhat, the sun begins to sink behind Imbros, and gradually it turns bitterly cold. I sit and shiver, munching the unexpired portion of my day's ration. I want a coat badly, but by this time my kid is on shore with my servant. We appear to have been forgotten altogether. On the cliffs in front of us, Tommies are limping back wounded. One comes perilously near the edge of the cliff, stumbling and swaying like a drunken man. We shout loudly to him as time after time he all but falls over the edge. Two Royal Army Medical Corps grabbed him eventually and let him safely down. I have a smoke and view the scenes on shore. Gradually the beach is becoming filled with medical stores and supplies. It is gruesome seeing dozens of dead lying about in all attitudes. It becomes eerie as it gets darker. At this beach at dawn this morning there landed the Lancashire Fusiliers. 
They were waited for until their boats were beached, when, as the troops stepped out of the boats, they were fired on by the Turks, who subjected them to heavy machine-gun fire from two cliffs on either side of the beach. The slaughter was terrible. On the right-hand side of the beach the troops had a check, and terrible fighting took place. Finally, one by one the machine-guns were pulled from their positions in the cliff, and the sections working them killed in hand-to-hand -hand struggles. On the left side of the beach the troops found no barbed wire, and so were able to get on shore, and to the cry of, Lads, follow me, from an officer, they swarmed up a fifty-foot steep cliff, clearing the upper ridge of Turks, but losing heavily. They fought their way inland, and after a while were able to enfilade the Turks holding up our men on the right of the beach, until at last, by six a.m., the whole beach was won, and John Turk was driven five hundred yards or more inshore. Midshipmen and naval lieutenants were in charge of the pinnaces towing strings of boats, and as they approached the shore, fired for all they were worth with machine guns mounted forward, protected by shields. Then, swinging around, they cast the boats adrift. Each boat had a few sailors who rowed for shore like mad, and many in so doing lost their lives, shot in the back. To row an open boat, unprotected, into murderous machine gun and rifle fire, requires pluck backed by a discipline which only the British Navy can supply. Some of the sailors grabbed rifles from dead and wounded soldiers and fought as infantrymen. I can see many such dead naval heroes before my eyes now, lying still on the bloody sand. I am sitting on the boxes now, and ping goes something past my head, and then ping, ping, with a long ringing sound, follows one after the other. The crackle of musketry begins again, and faster and faster the bullets come. At last I know what bullets are like. The feeling at first is weird. We get behind the pile of boxes, and bullets hit bully beef and biscuit boxes, or pass harmlessly overhead. At last, boats come alongside, and we unload the boxes into them, and I go ashore with the first batch, and there I meet 86th and 87th supply officers, who landed two hours earlier. My servant meets me and asks, where shall I sleep? What a question! What does he expect me to answer? Room 44, first floor? I say, oh, shove my kit down there, pointing to some lying figures on the sand. Five minutes after, he comes up and with a scared voice says, Them is all stiff corpses, sir. You can't sleep there. I reply, oh, damn it. Go and sit down on my kit till I come back. I start to work to get the stores higher up the cliff. Oh, the sand. It is devilish heavy going, walking up and down with my feet sinking in almost ankle deep. It is quite dark now, and I stumble at frequent intervals over the dead. Parties are removing them, not for burial, but higher up the beach, out of the way of the working parties. I run into the brigade quartermaster sergeant and ask him, How's the brigadier? He replies, Killed, sir. I can't speak for a moment. And the brigade major? Killed also, sir. That finishes me. It is my first experience of the real horrors of war losing those who had become friends whom one respected. And I had worked in their headquarters in England every day for two months, knew them almost intimately, and looked forward with pleasure to going through the campaign on their staff. How did it happen, Leslie? I asked. The general was shot in the stomach while in the pinnace, before he could step onto the hopper alongside the river Clyde, and died shortly after. The brigade major got it walking along the hopper, the River Clyde was to have been brigade headquarters, and the brigade was to have taken V Beach that day. So far, V Beach was still Turkish. Their machine guns kept our men at bay. I wonder what it is like on the River Clyde at present, and whether those few men are still crouching behind that sand dune. Way comes up and says it is going to be a devil of a job getting those stores ashore, and that he can't get enough men. I have a few seamen, Cooper, Whitburn, and my servant, so put them on to it, and I myself help. Thus we struggle on, over the sand, and up to the grass on the slope of the cliff. Phew! It is work, and I am getting dead tired. We work till eleven o'clock, and then Foley and I have a rest behind a pile of boxes on the sand. Bullets steadily ping overhead. 
and now and again a man gives a little sigh of pain and falls helplessly to the sand. The strange part is that I do not feel sick at the sight of the dead and wounded. I think it is because of the excitement, and because I am dead tired. I get a bit cold sitting still and can't find my coat, so I huddle against Foley behind the boxes. A philosophical naval officer sits alongside, smoking a huge pipe. Crack, crack, crack goes the desultory fire of the rifles. The ships cease firing. It is awfully quiet and uncanny. Suddenly the musketry and rifle fire breaks out with a burst, which develop into a steady roar. The beach becomes alive with people once more. All seems confusion. The naval officer goes on steadily smoking, and we sit still, wondering how things are going to develop. The fleet is silent, but I can just see the outline of the warships, with a few lights showing. Then I hear an officer shouting angrily, Now then, fall in, you men. Who are you? Well, fall in. Get a rifle. Find one, then, and damn quick. Then another officer shouts, All but Royal Army Medical Corps. Fall in. Who are you? Fall in. Into file. Right turn. Quick march. About a dozen or two march off into the night up the cliff. Officers, servants, Army Service Corps, Seamen, Royal Naval Division, every man who was not either Royal Army Medical Corps or working on the dozen or so lighters that had been beached. I pause a bit. I feel a worm skulking behind these boxes while these events are happening. I express my feelings to Foley, and he says he feels the same. I say, we must do something, and he replies, let's get rifles, and off we go searching for rifles, but can find none in the dark. I lose my temper, why, heaven only knows. I see some men falling in, and I go up to them and say, Fall in, you men. Why aren't you falling in? Although I know they are, and I find an officer in charge and feel an ass. They move up to man the third-line trench just running along the edge of the cliff. All the beach parties have moved up to this trench. I have lost Foley, and so I follow up with no rifle and no revolver and shivering with cold. But I feel much better, although I am still in a temper extraordinary this i am annoyed with everybody i see nerves i suppose then a petty officer comes along and shouts now then you men where the is the dash ammunition and in the darkness i discern some seamen carrying boxes of small arms ammunition i go to the first pair carrying a box between them and take one side of the box from one of the seamen and immediately feel delighted with myself the sailor and everybody i have got a definite job up we pant, halfway up the cliff. I find Foley on the same job. A voice shouts, Have you got the ammunition, Foley? It is O'Hara's voice, our deputy assistant quartermaster general, and he comes running down to us. Suddenly the fleet open fire, and the infernal din begins all over again. The flashes lighting up the beach, silhouetting men on shore and the ships lying off, and all the time the song of bullets. Red hell and a Sunday night, and this is war at last. I never thought I should ever get as near it as this when I was a civilian. O'Hara says, Who's that? to me. And I answer my name, and he says, Righto, give us a hand with this little lot, lad. He bends down, and he and a sailor lift a box. Foley and I lift another, and six seamen, I find they are off the implacable, lift the others, and off we pant up the cliff over that third-line trench, lined with men of the beach parties with fixed bayonets. It's a devil of a walk to the second line, and it reminds me of hurrying to the railroad station with a heavy portmanteau to catch a train. Foley and I constantly change hands. The seamen, too, find it heavy going. We arrive at the second line and run into the adjutant of the Lancashire Fusiliers, calmly walking up and down his trench with a stick. We halt, open the boxes and hang the strings of ammunition around our necks and over our shoulders. I am almost weighed down with a load. We have a rest, taking cover in the trench now and again as bullets come rather thicker than usual. The firing is frightful, now a roar of musketry and now desultory firing, while the ship's guns boom away in the same spasmodic way. O'Hara then says, come along, follow me, and we go headed by the adjutant of the Lancashire Fusiliers to show us the way, and on over the grass and gorse into the blackness beyond. We are lucky, for it is a quiet moment, and we have only to go three or four hundred yards. But just as we approach the first line, out bursts a spell of machine-gun and rifle fire, rapid, 
and I fall headlong into what I think is space, but which proves to be our front-line trench. I fall clean on top of a Tommy who is the opposite of polite, for my ammunition slings have tapped his nose painfully. I apologize, and, feeling a bit done, lie down in the mud like a frog, the coolness of the mud soon reviving me. We pass the ammunition along, each man keeping two or three slings. O'Hara wanders along the trench, having to keep his head low, for it is none too deep, and bullets are pretty free overhead, while I remain and chat to the Tommy, another Lancashire Fusilier, who is shivering with teeth chattering and wet through, for it is raining. A Tommy on the other side of me is fast asleep and snoring loudly. The one awake describes to me the landing of the previous early morning, the machine-gun fire and the venomous barbed wire with the sea just lapping over it and the exciting bayonet work that followed. I am enjoying myself now, for I am in the front-line trench with a regiment which has just added a few more laurels to its glorious collection. It is curious, but no shells are coming from the Turks, and bullets are such gentlemanly little things that they do not worry me. It is funny, but everybody up here appears very cool and confident, while on the beach they are all inclined to be jumpy. O'Hara comes back with the two sailors. Foley has disappeared, and the other four sailors also have gone. We push along to the end of the trench, and the firing having died down somewhat, we climb out into the open and wend our way back. We seem to miss our bearing and go wandering off a devil of a way, when another burst of firing from a few machine guns forces us to dive promptly into a hole which by providence we find in our path. The two sailors have disappeared somewhere. We find two men crouching in the hole, and on asking who they are, find they are Lancashire Fusiliers, separated from their regiment. I can hear the swish of the machine gun bullets sweeping nearer and nearer, further and further from me, and then nearer as the guns are traversed. We are evidently lying in a hole which was dug to begin a trench, but which was abandoned. It is practically only a ditch, the shape of a small right angle. O'Hara and I fall one side, and the two Lancashire Fusiliers the other, and we crouch for three-quarters of an hour. If we kneel, our heads are above the parapet. After a while, O'Hara says to me, I am awfully sorry for getting you in this fix, Gillam, and I reply automatically, just as one might in ordinary life, not at all a pleasure, sir. Really, though, I don't like it much, but I am much happier here than I would be on the beach. The firing dies down again. The ship's guns are still banging away steadily. O'Hara disappears somewhere. I follow where I think he has gone, but I hear his voice after a minute talking to an officer, and I therefore lie down. But for a while I can't make out the situation. Firing starts again, and I can almost feel the flight of some bullets, and I lie flat. It dawns on me that I am lying in front of a trench. I wriggle like a snake over the heap of earth in front of me, into the trench behind, and find it not nearly so deep as the one I have just left, nor so roomy. The firing gets so hot that I try to wiggle in beside the form of a man which is perfectly still. An extra burst of firing sends me struggling for room into the trench, and the man whom I thought was dead moves, which sends a shiver down my spine. I apologize, and he makes room for me. A little later the firing dies down again. Two figures run past our trench shouting, All correct, sir! And an officer shouts, All correct! They are runners sent up from the beach. I can hear O'Hara talking to some officer the other side of a traverse. Then he calls me, and joining him, I follow him down toward the masts of the ships that we can just see silhouetted against the brightening sky. Suddenly an advanced sentry cries, Alt! Who are you? Friend! Who are you? Friend! 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 shouts O'Hara. Hands up! Advance one! And for some stupid reason I think he means advance one pace, which I solemnly do. O'Hara catches me a blow in the tummy, and nearly wins me, saying, Stand still, you dash fool! And I stand stock still, gasping for breath, with my hands above my head, while he walks slowly forward with hands up, and I can just see the sentry covering him with his rifle the while. I can hear them talking, and after a few sentences O'Hara calls me, and I follow, still with my hands up, until I reach the sentry. I think this frightened me more than all the events of this night. We continue our way. 
It is not so dark as it was, and it has ceased raining. Then a horrid thing happens. I fall headlong over a dead Turk, with face staring up into the sky and glazed eyes wide open. He wears a blue uniform, and I think he must have been a sailor from Sed El Bar Fort. Ugh! I almost touched his face with mine. Shortly after this mishap, we arrive at the third line trench, crowded with troops of all kinds, made up from the parties on the beaches, and get challenged again by some engineers. Safely passing these, we stumble down the slope to the beach. O'Hara sends me off to look for the stores, and I last see him going back once more with a rifle and bayonet. I run into Foley, who I find has had an adventurous time. Having had the ammunition taken off him, he tried to find us, but turned the wrong way up the trench. He got out into the open after a bit and wandered, apparently, just behind our front line towards V Beach, well the other side of W. The rifle fire was so hot there that he crawled like a caterpillar back to the second line and from there doubled back to the beach, steering himself by the mast lights of the ships. We see that the stores are okay and then run into Carver, who has just landed. Afterwards I find my friend Major Gibbon of the Howitzer Battery busy getting his guns ashore. Foley and I then go back to the boxes and we lie down like dogs, falling to sleep at once on the soft, comfortable sand. Dawn breaks over the hills of Asia. End of section 3。section 4 of Gallipoli Diary。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Sue Anderson。Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum Section 4 April 26th to April 28th Monday, April 26th I wake about 7 and find myself nestling up close against Foley, who is still asleep. I wake him, and he promptly falls asleep again, murmuring something about that dash machine gun. The beach quickly becomes alive with men, all working for dear life, and we get to our feet, go down to the water's edge and bathe our faces, and start to finish the work of making a small supply depot which we left last night. My servant comes to tell me that breakfast is ready, and we go up the cliff and join Way and Carver at a repast of biscuits, jam, bacon, and tea. But the tea tastes strong of sea water. All water had been carried with us in tins, and we had struck a bad batch, for most of them leaked. And then our day's work begins in all seriousness. By night, O'Hara wishes us to have a proper supply depot working. The quartermasters coming with fatigue parties, presenting their B-55s, and rations to the full are promptly issued and accounted for in our books. At frequent intervals, the fleet bombard, but we are quite used to the roar of guns now. I am covered and coated with clay mud and have no time to clean myself properly. We have to take cover continually from snipers, unknown enemies who fire at us from Lord knows where. One open part of the beach is especially dangerous, and I cross that part about six times during a day. Not a very wide space, but I feel each time I go across that I am taking a long journey. The dead are still lying about, and as there is no time to bury them, we pass to and fro by their bodies unheedingly. In addition to these snipers who pick off one of our number now and again, we have spent bullets flying in all directions, for our firing line is but a few hundred yards away. The Turk, however, does not appear to have a proper firing line. He only seems to have advanced posts strongly held, and must have retreated well inshore. It is a blessing for us that no shells come along, only these spent bullets and the deadly shots from the unseen snipers. Heavy firing sounds, however, from V Beach, a rattle of musketry and a roar of the battleships and torpedo boat destroyers lying at the mouth. Colonel Beaton and Major Stridinger are getting a proper system of supply and transport working. We become venturesome in the late afternoon, and many of us, quite two to three hundred, go up on the highland on the right and left of the beach and make a tour of the lately captured trenches. Turkish dead are lying about in grotesque attitudes. The trenches are full of equipment, 
and I noticed particularly bundles of remarkably clean linen and many loaves of bread, one loaf sticking out of a dead Turk's pocket. Several of the dead are dressed in navy blue uniform with brass buttons, but most are in khaki with gray overcoats and cloth hats. Suddenly a whistle blows and several cry, Get off the skyline! and we all run helter-skelter for the safety of the beach. When darkness arrives, we have a proper supply depot working, and strings of pack mules are hard at work carrying stores. Guns, ammunition, and men are everywhere. The engineers have run out a pier already. Everyone is in the best of spirits, for we have tasted a brilliant victory, and organizing brains are still at work in preparation for further ventures. I go to sleep behind boxes with the sound of heavy rifle fire disturbing the night. Tuesday, April 27th. I am ordered to make a small advance depot just behind the firing line, using pack mules under Colonel Patterson of the Zion Mule Corps. The drivers are Syrian refugees from Syria, and curiously enough speak Russian as their common language. While up there, but a very short walk from the beach, I sit down on the layer's seat of one of the 18-pounders of one of the batteries in position just behind our line. The battery is not dug in at all. I look through a telescopic sight, but can only see a lovely view of grass, barley, gorse, and flowers, hillocks, nullahs, and the great hill of Achibaba in the background, looking like Polyphemus in Dido and Aeneas with an ugly head and arms outstretched from the straits to the Aegean. I ask where the Turks are, and they point to a line some two thousand yards away, marked by newly turned earth, which is just distinguishable through strong glasses. I can see no sign of life, but away up on the ridges of Achibaba, columns of earth and smoke suddenly burst from the ground, caused by the shells of our fleet. Rifle fire has died down, Hardly a shot on our front comes over, and no shells at all. On our right, shell fire continues. I hear that V Beach is taken. It was taken midday yesterday, but with heavy casualties. The Dublins, Munsters, and Hants had the job, and the Hants did magnificently. Colonel Williams, the first general staff officer, behaved most gallantly. Snipers were worrying after the village was taken, and in crossing a certain part of the village, he exposed himself by mounting a wall, and, standing there for a time, looked down, saying to men round him, You see, there are no snipers left, men. They leapt after him like cats, and were through the village in no time. Man after man had been hit on that wall that morning. I make a little depot of boxes just behind the battery, and go back to the beach and load for another journey. On arrival there, Colonel Beeden orders me to proceed to V Beach to collect all stores there and make an inventory, for at first this was to have been our beach had we been able to land on the first day. The French are to take it over now, as they are coming back from the Asiatic side, evacuating it entirely. I go down to W Beach for a fatigue party of the Royal Naval Division, and am told to apply to the Naval Landing Officer and an officer standing talking on the sands is pointed out to me as he. I go up to him and wait for an opportunity to catch his eye, for he is an admiral. He is talking to a captain, and two midshipmen are standing near. I wait fifteen minutes, maneuvering for position so that he may ask me what I want. I think I must have shown signs of impatience, for the admiral turned full round toward me, and, after looking at me in mild surprise for a few seconds, during which I felt a desire to turn round and run up the cliff, quietly turned round to the captain and continued his conversation. A minute or two passed, and he walked away with the midshipman, and the captain asked me what I wanted. I told him a fatigue party, and he pointed out a Royal Naval Division officer a hundred yards away to whom I went, at once obtained satisfaction, and to whom I should have gone at the start. I find I have made an ass of myself, and therefore administer mental kicks. With my fatigue party, my corporal, private, and servant, I march up the cliff toward V Beach. We pass the lighthouse, which has been badly knocked about, following the line of the Turkish trench, which is along the edge of the cliff, 
to the fort, which had withstood the bombardment well. At the fort we see two huge guns of very old pattern, knocked about a good deal. Then we dip down to V Beach, a much deeper and wider beach than W, and walk towards the sea. Then I see a sight which I shall never forget all my life. About two hundred bodies are laid out for burial, consisting of soldiers and sailors. I repeat, never have the Army and Navy been so dovetailed together. They lie in all postures, their faces blackened, swollen, and distorted by the sun. The bodies of seven officers lie in a row in front by themselves. I cannot but think what a fine company they would make if, by a miracle, an unseen hand could restore them to life by a touch. The rank of major and the red tabs on one of the bodies arrests my eye, and the form of the officer seems familiar. Colonel Gostling of the 88th Field Ambulance is standing near me, and he goes over to the form, bends down, and gently removes a khaki handkerchief covering the face. I then see that it is Major Costaker, our late brigade major. In his breast pocket is a cigarette case and a few letters. One is in his wife's handwriting. I had worked in his office for two months in England and was looking forward to working with him in Gallipoli. It was cruel luck that he even was not permitted to land, for I learned that he was hit in the heart on the hopper shortly after General Napier was laid low. His last words were, Oh, Lord, I am done for now. I notice also that a bullet has torn the toes of his left foot away. Probably this happened after he was dead. I hear that General Napier was hit whilst in the pinnace on his way to the River Clyde by a machine-gun bullet in the stomach. Just before he died, he said to Sinclair Thompson, our staff captain, Get on the Clyde and tell Carrington Smith to take over. A little while later he apologized for groaning. Good heavens! I can't realize it, for it was such a short while ago that we were all such a merry party at the Warwick Arms, Warwick. I report to Captain Stoney of the King's Own Scottish Borderers, who is the military liaison officer, and he hands over supplies to me. I clear the beach, make a small supply depot, and take stock, and start to issue to all and sundry as on W Beach the previous day. All day the French are arriving from the Asiatic side. No shelling. Evidently the Turks have no artillery. Davidson, a Royal Naval Division officer, tells me that he is quite used to handling the dead now. He has been told off to identify them on this beach and to take charge. I have a good look at the River Clyde. She managed to get within 200 yards of shore, and now she is linked to the beach by hoppers. Two gangways are down at either side at a gentle slope from holes halfway up her sides, and very flimsy arrangements they are. It is difficult for the troops to pass each other on them. Men poured out from these holes in the ship at a given signal early on Sunday morning, and were quickly caught by machine-gun fire, dropping like flies into the sea, a drop of twenty feet. Some of those who fell wounded from the hopper in the shallow water close in shore drowned through being borne down by the weight of their packs. Colonel Carrington Smith, who took over command of the brigade when General Napier was killed, was looking round the corner of the shelter of the bridge through glasses at the Turkish position on shore when he was caught by a bullet clean in the forehead and died instantly. Sunday night on the Clyde was hell. One or two shells, luckily small ones from Asia, burst right through the side of the ship. Doctors did splendid work for the wounded all night on board. A sigh of relief came from all on board when the signal was given next day to land and take the beach, which was taken after much hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the enemy putting up a gallant resistance, encouraged as they were by their success in preventing us from landing on this beach on Sunday. Addison of the Hants is gone. He met his end in the village of Sedel Bar. He was leading his men, firing right and left with his revolver. He met a Turk coming round the corner of a street. He pulled the trigger of his revolver. Nothing happened. He opened it, found it empty, threw it to the ground with a curse, 
went for the Turk with his fist, but was met by a well-aimed bomb, which exploded in his face, killing him instantly. It sounds horrible, but it is war these days. Perhaps I am oversensitive, but a lump comes to my throat as I write this. For just over a month ago, Addison and I used to talk about books at the Warwick Arms, Warwick, and the sight of him reading with glasses, smoking his pipe before the fire of an evening, is still fresh in my memory. It would have been hard to believe then that such a quiet, reserved soul would meet his end fighting like a raging lion in the bloody streets of Sed El Bar a few weeks later. But that has now actually happened, and similar ends will meet like brave men again and again before this war is over. A little amusing diversion is caused in the afternoon of today by a hare running across the beach, chased by French Paul Yu, and being very nearly rounded up. At 5 p.m., while making up my accounts for the day, I hear from the Asiatic side the boom of a gun, followed by a sound not unlike the tearing of linen, ending in a scream and explosion. Not very big shells, and the first so far that I have experienced on shore. I look towards Asia and see a flash in the blue haze of the landscape there, and over comes another, dropping in the sea near the Clyde. They follow quickly in succession, and each time I see the flash I duck with my three stalwart henchmen behind our little redoubt of supplies, proof only against splinters. The nearest falls but twenty yards away, and does not explode. I see through my glasses two destroyers creep up towards the enemy's shores and fire rapid broadsides. After a few of these we are left in peace. I am once or twice called up on the telephone, a telephone worked by a signaller lying on the ground, the instrument being in a portable case. It is strange, saying, Are you there? Under these conditions and with these surroundings. The signal arrangements are excellent. Calls come in constant succession from W, X, and S beaches. A wireless instrument is hard at work, run by a Douglas engine in a tent, controlled by a detachment of Australians. One of the Australians, a corporal, offers me a shakedown in his tent for the night, and lends my men some blankets for their bivouac, which they have constructed out of my little supply depot. Owen, officer commanding signals, says that I shall not get much sleep in the wireless tent, and that I had better share his tent, which is in a little orchard behind a ruined house, close handy. I have my evening meal of bully, biscuit, and jam, and, lighting my pipe, go for a stroll in the village, but I'm stopped by sentries, for snipers are still at large there, and several casualties have occurred today there through their industry. I cannot help admiring the pluck of these snipers, for their end is certain and not far off. Two mutilated bodies of our men are lying in a garden of a ruined house, but this case so far is isolated. We have seen the Turks dressing the wounds of some of our men captured by them. The Turks appear to be a strange mixture. April 28th. I awake feeling very fit and refreshed, and find a beautiful morning awaiting me. Opposite our tent is a little bivy, made of oil sheets, and supported by rope to one of the walls of the house, and a lilac tree. A head pokes out from under this bivy, with a not very tidy beard growing on its chin, and the owner loudly calls for his servant. While making his toilet, he joins in a merry banter with Owen, who is indulging in a cold douche obtained from a bucket of water. Some of the French, having invaded the sanctuary of our walled-in camp, picking several of the iris growing in the wild grass, the officer with the beard asks me to tell them to get off his lawn, which I do. I find later that he is Josiah Wedgwood, M.P., and, being interested, get into conversation with him. He is a most entertaining man and tells me that he is officer commanding armored cars, but that, as it is not possible for his cars to come on shore, he has been instructed to use his intelligence and make himself useful, which he was trying to do with a painful effort. Finding that I was a supply officer, he begs for some tobacco, saying that he would be my friend for life if I could get him some, which I managed to do, for yesterday I issued tobacco and cigarettes with our rations, and had some over. 
I go down to my depot for a wash, shave, and breakfast. Biscuit and bacon do not go well together. While washing, shells begin to arrive, bursting on the crest of the hill at the back of the beach. One or two come near to the beach, and a splinter flies toward us, hitting the boxes behind which we all crowd. The nearest so far, so I preserve the splinter. French troops are now in large numbers on the beach, and I meet my friend the Russian officer who was on the Arcadian. I see General Damod and his staff. A French officer takes some snaps for me with my camera, as he knows more about photography than I do, including one of a French machine gun company, who had then two guns in position screened by branches of lilac at the entrance to the village. He made fun of them, telling them it would have been just as much sense if they had placed a rusty sewing machine, which happened to be lying near, in position instead. Looking rather foolish, the gunners pack up and go off somewhere. I am wanted on the telephone and hear O'Hara talking at the other end. He says I am to hand over the remaining supplies to the Royal Naval Division Beach Party and come back to W Beach with the senior supply officer who is coming over. Senior supply officer arrives shortly after. I hand over to the senior officer of the Royal Naval Division, a fine old boy with a crown and a star up, who tells me he landed at W Beach on Sunday morning at 6 and had joined in the scrapping himself. We go on the River Clyde, and from there I take photographs of the beach and one of the mounds of earth that had proved shelter for those men whom I had seen from the Dongola, crouching for cover on Sunday morning. We get on to a trawler from the River Clyde, which takes us round to W Beach, and I enjoy the brief sea trip, and it is very interesting viewing the scenes on shore from the sea. Off W Beach we get on to a pinnace which takes us alongside a very good pier, considering the short time the engineers have had to construct one. On shore, I find the King's own Scottish borderers arriving from Y Beach, where they have had a rough handling. Y Beach appears to have been evacuated. I find a lot of officers I know have gone, including Coe, the colonel, a very fine type of man. He really should never have come out, for he was in indifferent health. He was shot in the arm, which had to be amputated, and he died shortly afterwards. Our depot has grown, for more supplies have come ashore. Our colonel and a few more of the train officers have arrived. We have quite a good lunch. I find Phillips, our officer commanding company, has gone inland with some pack mules. He comes back later with rather depressing news. I hear that a battle has been started, but I do not pay much attention, for I am quite accustomed now to the sound of rifle fire, and the roar of the ship's guns. The battle develops in the afternoon to a general attack on our part. We are well in shore now, I should say two and a half miles. Anyway, no bullets are flying about the beach now. All snipers have been rounded up, one of the worst offenders, a huge fellow, falling dead from a tree yesterday. 5.30 p.m. Brigade supply officers are ordered to find out the location of their units. Horses can be had on application from division headquarters. I ask to be allowed to proceed on foot, and am granted permission, but they rather wonder why I ask. The honest reason is because I am nervous, and I prefer to be nervous on foot than a nervous rider on horseback over a difficult country. I make a beeline inshore, and after a quick walk of fifteen minutes or so, become intensely interested in what I see. Shells are passing over my head from the fleet, but the rifle fire appears to have died down. Wounded are straggling back in twos and threes, and bearers carrying the more serious cases with great fatigue to themselves. To carry a man two and a half miles over rough ground on a stretcher is hard work. Nearing the line I pass police forming battle posts, and these, together with the badges of the wounded men which are sewn on their tunics, returning to the beaches, helps me to steer my course. Now and again I am warned not to go near where snipers are said to be, and perpetually I trip over thin black wires, which serve for the nonce for signalers' cables. Passing a cluster of farm buildings, I arrive at last at a scene of great activity, and feel relieved that I am once more amongst men. A trench is being dug with forced energy. Orderlies are passing to and fro, 
signalers at work laying cables, doctors dressing wounded, and bearers carrying them to the rear. I discover that we have had a setback. I learn that we were heavily outnumbered, but that at 5 p.m. the Turks had retreated hastily to almost beyond Krithia, which lies in flames on the high land in front of me towards the left, and that actually the Lancashires had been through the village. Walking along the line I find the 86th Brigade, and from them learn where Headquarters 88th are. On my way there I pass Captain Parker and Major Lee of the Hants. Major Lee asks me excitedly if they are getting on with the digging of the trench, and then asks me to get some water up to some of his battalion on his right by the French, which I promised to do this night. Walking further along, I cross a white road of some kind of paving, and then at last reach my headquarters. I see Thompson, who looks very ill and tired, but appears very cool and quiet. I shall never forget his smile when he saw me, saying, Hello, Gillum, in a quiet voice. I see Panton, busy at dressing wounded, for alongside headquarters is an advanced dressing station. On my right I notice French troops hard at work continuing the digging of the line to the edge of the Dardanelles. I find out what is wanted in the way of food and water and where it is to be dumped and start off back to the beach. It is twilight and rapidly getting dark, and it is difficult to find my way back to the right beach, namely W. I remember with a shudder those silent clumps of bushes and trees and wonder if snipers are still alert. I steer my way back by the masts of the ships, the heads of which I can just see, and I walk as the crow flies over every obstacle I find. I had learnt at brigade headquarters that the white road ran between Krithia and Sed El Bar, and mentally I made a note of the way I should take rations on my return journey, namely to Sed El Bar from W Beach via V Beach and thence up the white road. I see three figures ahead limping, and, as I had not seen a soul for fifteen minutes and it is getting dark now, I finger my revolver, wondering if they are some of our most trying enemies, the snipers. But that thought is only born from nerves, for they are limping and must be wounded. On overtaking them I find that one is an officer, Cox of the Essex, one of those who had played the priest of the parish on the Dongola the night before the landing. He is the only one limping from a bullet wound in his calf. He is supported by his arms resting around the shoulders of two men, one his servant, unwounded, and the other a man wounded through the arm. Cox tells me that he took cover in a nulla when hit and remained there all day. Twice the French advanced over him and twice they retreated, leaving him between the enemy's lines. A third time British and French advanced, and he was rescued and helped back. I wish him further luck in this war, for luck had befallen him, he an infantryman, and a bullet wound in his leg. I like him rather specially, and feel glad that he is to be out of it for a while. It is now quite dark, and I have missed my bearings and see a few small lights ahead and make for them, and am very soon pulled up short by the challenge of a sentry. I discover it is signals of divisional headquarters, and am directed to headquarters, where I am interviewed by a general staff officer, who asks me the position of troops. I tell him, French on the right, and then 88th, 86th, and 87th. I learn that I am on Hill 138, the future name of divisional headquarters. I am directed back to W Beach, and then endeavor to find O'Hara. After fifteen minutes I find him and report what I had done, and am told that he had learnt that a dump of rations, ammunition, and water is to be made at Pink Farm. Learning that Pink Farm is the collection of buildings that I had struck earlier in the afternoon, I point out that this farm will be too far to the left for my brigade, and that I found a convenient site for the 88th dump, on the right side of the Sedel Bar Krithia Road, but I am told that I must have made a mistake. This disturbs me somewhat, as I feel that I am right. He tells me to come along with him up to Pink Farm, as pack mules with rations, ammunition, and water had started for this dump. We overtake some of them. Further on we meet Carver coming back on horseback, and he reports where 87th Brigade Headquarters is. I now see that the reason why they have decided on Pink Farm for a dump 
is because Way had come back first and reported where his brigade was, and that, through Carver and I not having turned up, they decided on Pink Farm as a divisional dump for all the brigades. As a matter of fact, Pink Farm will suit 87th as well as 86th, for it lies between the two, and rations, etc., from the one dump can be manhandled to the two brigades. But for the 88th, the dump is right out of it. We meet Phillips, our 88th transport officer and officer commanding number 4 company, a good soldier, Ford, quartermaster of the Essex, and Grogan, transport officer of the King's Own Scottish Borderers, a delightful chap. And passing them, we arrive at Pink Farm, where I tell my tale to Colonel Beeden and Major Stridinger. It is now raining hard, and I have no coat. It is hard work getting through the clayey mud. They apparently do not consider my statement that this dump is of no use whatever to the 88th, for a bush that I can just see a hundred yards away is pointed out, the moon then being up above the clouds, and I am ordered to go two hundred yards beyond there, where I will find Thompson in 88th Brigade headquarters, and to arrange with him for fatigue parties to come back and carry up water. They say they have just been talking to Thompson. This puzzles me, and I start off for that bush. I hate bushes just now. I pass it and come to a brook full of the loudest croaking frogs I have ever heard. Without much exaggeration, they made as much row as a dozen people would, all talking together loudly. Then I pace what I think is two hundred yards in front of that bush and come to nothing at all. Remembering that in the dark one hardly ever walks in a straight line, I alter my course and, walking a few yards, see the rays of an electric torch shining, towards which I walk quickly. It is immediately switched out as I approach, and now, feeling cautious, I shout, Are you British? But, receiving no answer, I shout once more, and am glad to receive an answer of, Aye, aye. I go up to them and find that it is our front line, and inquire where Brigade Headquarters is. A little light to my right, but behind, rather, is pointed out, to which I go. There I find Thompson in a trench, and give him the message as instructed. The light of a torch shining on his face shows me a look of annoyance, expressive of his thoughts that I am a fool. He politely tells me that he wants rations taken to the spot that he had pointed out in the afternoon. I find that I am at 86th Brigade Headquarters, and that Thompson is but visiting there for a conference. Having a difficulty in finding my way to Pink Farm, I make for the front line once more, whence the direction is pointed out to Pink Farm, for I can only see a hundred yards ahead, and all bushes look alike. I hear the noise of croaking frogs and make for it. It comes from the brook that I had passed, and from there I go towards what I think is Pink Farm, but find that it is a collection of the pack mules under Phillips, and I unload my feelings in horribly bad language. Then Phillips gives me a packet of cigarettes, which I am entirely without. I am wet through now, to the skin, and dog-tired. My pocket is full of iron ration biscuits, and between puffs of my cigarettes I munch on them. Not a sound of a shot, not a flash of a gun. Old John Turk has had a nasty knock, and is over a thousand yards away. Nothing but the sound of the hiss of the gently falling rain. I follow the farmer's track up to Pink Farm and tell my troubles to Colonel Beeden. Colonel Williams, who had distinguished himself at Sed El Bar, is there without a coat and soaked to the skin as I am. I am instructed to take the remaining mules back to W Beach, link any which I pass that are on the way up onto my convoy, and also pick up any which are starting off from W Beach, make one convoy, take stock, and make note of it, and take the whole through said El Bar up to the spot Thompson had pointed out to me in the afternoon. I think of the tale of the odd job man who has been given every imaginable job in the world by his old lady mistress, and who asked her if her house was built on clay, as he would very much like to make bricks in his spare time. I go back to Phillips. The convoy is turned round and off we trek. I at the head, Phillips in the rear. I meet Davy on the way up with a convoy of his, 
and accordingly instruct him to join on to my convoy, he says, Look here, Gillam, old boy, you're fagged out and are making a mess of things. Go back to bed, old boy. I know all about it, and we have to take these mules to Pink Farm. I wish Pink Farm elsewhere, express my feelings to him in forcible language, and finally convince him under protest. However, we are soon friends again, and his convoy links up in rear of mine. We hear three reports of a rifle ring out on our right, a sniper still undiscovered at work. We arrive at W Beach, arresting the start of another convoy, which in turn also becomes part of ours, and I go to find O'Hara. Having found him, I told him my tale of woe. He says he will come with me to the 88th Brigade, and after taking stock and tacking a water cart onto the rear of the column, we trek off to Hill 138. Stopping there, O'Hara has a chat with the assistant provost marshal, who has been to the 88th headquarters and assures us that we are on the right track. On through the ruined village of Sedel Bar we go, down through a poplar grove enclosing a Turkish cemetery, where we overtake the commanding royal artillery riding alone with an orderly. We are on the white road that I noticed in the afternoon, and the commanding royal artillery takes the lead, as he states that a part of the road further up is rumored to be mined. Krithia lies ahead on our left in flames, a wonderful sight. It has stopped raining. We pass several brooks, and from them comes the clamoring noise of loudly croaking bullfrogs. We pass one after the other four white pillars of stone, about a hundred feet in height. On my right I can dimly see the waters of the Dardanelles. Dawn is just developing. The commanding Royal Artillery raises his hand, and we stop. He rides cautiously forward with his orderly, and after a minute returns and orders us to follow him. He turns sharply to the left, makes a wide circuit, we following, and comes out on the white road once more further up. He then leaves us and disappears. We continue for three hundred yards when I come to the conclusion that we are very near our destination. Tell O'Hara so, and the command is given, Halt! O'Hara and I walk on up the road. Not a sound is heard no shells, no rifle fire whatsoever. I can see no one about. I look to my right where brigade headquarters should be, and find nothing but some shallow dugouts. We go off to the right amongst bushes and trip over a few poor dead Tommies. We come back to the road. O'Hara thinks I am wrong. Good Lord, supposing that I am wrong after all this. We walk up the road further and suddenly come to a sentry standing in a trench on our right. I look to the left and see another trench and a sentry a little way on, on guard. The road goes on into darkness. I am smoking a cigarette and am ordered preemptorily by the sentry on my right to put it out. We question him and find that we have arrived at our front line. Every man of four is on guard. The other three sound asleep in the bottom of the trench. The sentry tells us that the Turkish line is a good way ahead and that he has seen or heard nothing from there since he has been on guard. He is shivering with cold, though muffled in his coat, but for all that looks a fine type of fellow. But he is Puka, and twenty-ninth as well, finest troops in the world bar none, the Finnish type of a disciplined British Tommy. Oh, for six more divisions of this quality, Achi Baba would have been ours this day. He directs us to brigade headquarters, Following his direction, we turn back down the road and come back to the shallow dugouts. During our absence, Thomas of the Essex and a naval officer, smoking a huge pipe and muffled to his ears in his white muffler and blue overcoat, had arrived. They tell us the dugouts are the 88th Brigade headquarters. We inquire for Thompson and the rest and are told that they have gone to 86th to confer. One by one, the little patient mules are unloaded and proceed down the road to wait and the boxes, rations, ammunition, and water are spread singly amongst the thick gorse off the road, so as not to be seen by the enemy in the morning. While this goes on, I talk to the naval officer, and learn from him that he is an observing officer for the ship's guns. He appears a very cool customer. He tells me that he is a very unlucky man to talk to, that an officer yesterday was wounded while talking to him, and another killed last night under the same circumstances. I wish him good night and good luck, and go back to the mules and help to hasten their unloading by helping myself. 
Colonel Patterson, officer commanding Mule Corps, keeps on urging upon us the importance of not losing the ropes, as when lost they are difficult to replace. The last mule being unloaded, we search for the water cart, but it is nowhere to be found. But tins of water are up now, and we hear that a well has been found, the water pure and not poisoned, as we had feared, and so we start to trek back. A short way back, and O'Hara shouts, Halt! Then he says to me, Gillum, what's that dash mine we've heard so much about? I answer, Great Scott! Somebody behind us gives a muffled cough, and a Tommy, one of the armed escort, steps forward, and in a Tommy's polite manner says, Begging your pardon, sir, but we are standing on it. O'Hara shouts, Walk! March! and we move at a good four miles an hour until we arrive at the white pillars and the friendly sound of the croaking frogs. We realize at any rate that we are safe from landmines. Evidently this mine is a false alarm. Permission to smoke is given, and the Syrian boys exchange ration cigarettes and chatter to each other in Russian. Up to now they have been almost entirely silent. We pass many French troops sleeping in little hastily made camps, and we pass some zouaves, looking picturesque in the early morning light in their quaint oriental uniforms. And so, through the silent cemetery and poplar trees, through said El Bar, now a large French camp, back past Hill 138, and home to W Beach, I give O'Hara a few of my iron ration biscuits, and almost stagger to my supply depot, for I am hardly able to walk any further and lie down on my valise, that my servant has thoughtfully laid out for me, beside the senior supply officer and Colonel Beedon, falling off to sleep with the satisfaction that tomorrow, at any rate, the 88th will have their rations. End of section 4 Section 5 of Gallipoli Diary this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 5, April 29th to May 3rd, 1915. April 29th. I wake at 8, but am given permission to sleep all the morning. I have breakfast, getting fed up with biscuit. My servant rigs me up a bivvy, and I roll up and go fast to sleep. Lord, what a gorgeous sleep it was! I slept till one, and then had lunch, and after a shave and a wash. I did little all day but watch the fleet firing, and the transports unloading everything imaginable necessary for an army. We have now rigged up a nice little mess with some ration boxes and a tarpaulin, and have quite a nice dinner at night, with a boiled ham, bully beef rissoles, and biscuit pancakes. Our chef is some chef. A naval officer at night, after dinner, is continually shouting, Any more for the Arcadian? Where General Headquarters is. Reminds me of Any more for the Skylark at Brighton. It is pleasant going to sleep at night with the sound of the swish of waves breaking on the shore in one's ears. The fleet guns roar away consistently all day. April 30th. Today we have some shells on the beach, but not very terrible ones. Many of them go foot in the ground without exploding. If this is all the artillery they can put up against us, Lord help them. They must be having hell from the fleet. Go up to brigade headquarters via said El Bar this morning with a rifle and dressed as a Tommy. All go up dressed like that now, for snipers are still about. On past the white pillars to brigade headquarters, we pass the bodies, still unburied of Turks and British, fallen heroes lying broken amidst wild flowers. I call and see Major Gibbon at his observation post, but from there can see nothing of the enemy. Before me is a simple, lovely summer scene, yet amidst the nullas and the olive groves, the flowers and barley, death lurks alert to claim his toll. It is a long walk back to W Beach via Sedel Bar. Snipers are still at large, which is remarkable, 
and we are warned not to walk across country, though to do so would be much quicker. I pass two snipers as we arrive back at the White Pillars, prisoners in the hands of the French. One prisoner is limping badly from a wound in the foot. The French appear to have made themselves very much at home in said El Bar. I pass an officer's mess and lunch is on. I am surprised at the delicacies on the table, including many bottles of white wine. We are still on bare rations, and bully and biscuits at that. But they appear to have bread, probably from tenedos and probably for officers' messes only, and they seem all very bright, as if it was a huge joke. As we are about to enter, said El Bar, a French sentry stops us and warns us not to go through the village, as two men have just been sniped. We pass at the back of V Beach. The view from here of the fleet is magnificent. Occasionally one sees a whiff of yellow smoke shoot from the side of a ship, and a few seconds after a deafening report follows. It takes some getting used to. We pass a company of Senegalese manning a trench dug at the back of V Beach. They lie in it, peering over the top, looking inland intently, as if they expect the enemy, who is more than three miles away, to rush down on them at any moment. I pass General Damod at the headquarters at the back of V Beach, and stop to chat with a French officer who was on the Arcadian with me, and also a French naval officer who was on the Southland. The naval officer inspects my rifle with interest, saying it is the first time that he has handled one of the short patterns. He tells me that he saw the fight from the Andania on Sunday morning, and says that he thinks that it will stand out as the most magnificent fight of the war. May 1st. A few shells, but none very terrible, come over. One, however, in our depot. Beautiful weather. Heavy rifle fire heard at night. Now and again a Turkish shell lands over from Achi. The rifle fire last night was Turkish. Nothing happened. Probably wind up on their part. Letters arrive. While sitting on a box reading, a shell comes beastly near, but bursts in a not very frightening manner twenty yards away. But I and the few near me fall flat to the ground. I have been advised to do this by an officer who is an expert in shelling, and he tells me that by so doing, though a shell may burst ten yards from you, one should be safe. My servant rolls over and over, shouting, Oh! and I rush to him, asking him if he was hit, but find that a stone has caught him on the forehead, and but for a nasty bruise he was none the worse. This afternoon I have a bathe off W Beach. Crowds are bathing. What a contrast to this time last week! Only a week ago we landed, and now W Beach is like a seaside resort, as far as the bathing is concerned. I felt in a holiday mood, and with that delightful, refreshed feeling that one has after a dip, I strolled along the sand up to the depot for a cup of tea. But the scream of a shell overhead from Achi, which fell in the water beyond the bathers, brought my holiday mood to an abrupt end. The mouth of the Dardanelles and the sea at the end of the isthmus is full of warships, from battleships to small destroyers and their necessary small craft, transports, hospital ships, trawlers, and lighters. Engineers, French and English, are working feverishly at the building of piers and finishing those already begun. Stores are being unloaded, and marquees for their storage are being erected. The scene here is extraordinarily interesting. I have never seen such a motley gathering in my life. The beach is crowded with figures, all working for dear life. The sea is dotted with lighters, out of which are being poured all kinds of military stores, wood, sandbags, wire netting, galvanized iron, cooping, and the like. All these things are being conveyed to the piers and from there put ashore. On the shore itself, parties are at work, erecting tents and marquees, and other parties are hard at work making dugouts, plying picks and shovels with a will. Here they are erecting the signal station, a contraption of beams and sandbags. 
outside wires are being laid and so the work of the beach parties goes busily forward yet to my untutored gaze the scene is wonderful the whole beach is a hopeless mix-up of french and english with a good sprinkling of naval men presenting a kaleidoscopic effect with the afternoon sun shining upon it such as i have never seen before it is of course quite an orderly mob really but this is only recognized when one watches the work of one group at a time here is the real business of a military landing on a hostile shore everybody knowing what to do and how to do it and so the work goes on without a hitch at seven p m i start off with a long convoy of pack mules with rations for brigade headquarters via the Sed El Bar Krithia Road. At present it is impossible to use vehicles, for the first line is served by but two roads, which are nothing but farmers' tracks. An armed escort of the Essex Regiment accompanies us. The padre of the 88th Brigade, who is just joining, comes along with me, intending to join the Worcesters in the trenches. Just entering said El Bar, we are halted by a French officer, and almost immediately my head feels as if it is blown off by four spouts of flame stabbing the darkness just a few yards away, followed almost instantaneously by four deafening reports. A French 75 battery is in action, and that means business. Almost immediately after number 4 gun had fired, number one fired then number two number three and number four again and so on shell after shell following each other in rapid succession into the night towards achi baba the gunners crouching like cats by their guns were lit up fitfully by each flash disappearing again in the pause of a fraction of a second between each round an officer in a dugout behind with telephone glued to his ear shouts incessantly directions as to range elevation and depression to an officer who is standing nonchalantly smoking a cigarette behind the battery who in turn shouts orders to the guns the guns reminded me of two couple of hounds held in leash at a coursing meeting barking with eagerness to be let loose our little pack mules are greatly concerned at first but become surprisingly docile as the firing goes on a sharp order is given by the French officer standing behind the weapons. The gunners relax their tense attitudes and begin attending to parts of the guns. The officer who had first stopped us most charmingly and politely apologizes in English for delaying us, and our convoy proceeds on its track. I chat to the padre, find he is fifty-five years of age, and before the war a peace-loving rector what circumstances to find oneself in after fifty-five years of peaceful life i record him in my mind as a very gallant old gentleman we pass through the french camp down through the trees to the poplar grove cemetery which always now fills me with a curious awe so ghostly do the graves look in the moonlight lying peacefully amidst the poplar trees it is a most beautiful sight with the glimmering water of the dardanelles beyond ahead on our right the reflection of the bright beam of the chanak searchlight swinging round from east to west across the narrows can be seen in the sky searching for any of our ships should they make a dart up the straits past my friends the loudly croaking bullfrogs past the stately white pillars on up the white road that leads to krithia and towards our dumping ground brigade headquarters the little mules pad carefully and surely along led by the syrian mule drivers who chatter confidentially to each other in russian for they now are at home in their new life and delight in the thought that they are doing their bit in the great cause we arrive at our destination and lo and behold no one is there phillips and i confer i decide to go on with smith quartermaster of the hants to find headquarters we take an orderly each from the armed guard i take an essex man we follow the white road and arriving at the front line trenches are pulled up short by the alt who are you supply officer advance to be recognized we advance 
Smith asks where battalion headquarters are, and learns they are a hundred yards to our left. We find a hundred yards along, a part of the trench dug back a bit to serve as battalion headquarters. The trenches are deeper now. One can stand up in safety, but only just. Smith asks for Captain Reed, the adjutant. He steps out to us. We express surprise at the quietness of things. There is absolutely no firing on our front, but we can hear desultory firing on our right from the French line. Reed offers us cigarettes and lights one himself. I remark to him that it is unwise to light a cigarette standing in the open, to which he replies that the enemy are a long way away. He directs me to brigade headquarters further along the line. I wish him good night, and, with my orderly, proceed cautiously in the direction he had pointed, for it is now pitch dark. I am challenged again and again, and find myself after a bit among the Royal Scots, and one of their officers kindly lends me an orderly, who takes me to brigade headquarters, dug in a dry brook, some two hundred yards behind the front line. Thompson is asleep, and it is with regret that I have to wake him. He tells me to dump rations in the same place as the last night's. I start to go back, steer my way by the front line once more, and in the dark miss the direction, and find myself about to walk across a track which runs through our front line towards the enemy's, and an alert sentry bringing me to the halt with a sharp challenge, I find my mistake. I then leave myself in my orderly's hands, who takes the lead and guides me back to the brigade dump, when I find that Phillips had met Quartermaster Sergeant Leslie and had nearly finished the unloading of the pack mules. I really believe that if I had not been challenged and had passed through our lines towards the enemies, my orderly, one of the doesn't reason why breed, would have calmly followed me. Someone taps me on the shoulder, and a Tommy asks me, Where's your rifle, mate? I reply that I haven't one. He then says, Ain't you one of the ants? And, wonderingly, I reply that I am the supply officer. And the man brings himself erect with a sharp click, begging my pardon. The reason of his mistake then dawned on me. I have on a private's tunic. Our goods delivered, we trek back, and on arrival at Sedel Bar, the sound of heavy rifle fire breaks out, but by the sound of it from our own rifles. I wonder what is happening, and think ourselves fortunate that we had finished our job before this activity started. I am in rear of the column, walking with my orderly about fifty yards behind the last mule, when I have a bad nerve shock. I have had many during the past week, but this one takes the biscuit. Out of a hole in the side of a broken-down house there leaps a French soldier. He shouts something to me in French, and points a rifle with gleaming bayonet fixed at my chest. In days long gone past, it has sometimes happened that one of my young sisters, or a brother with a warped sense of humor, would leap round from the corner of the landing in our early home, just as I might be passing along, and shout, Boo! I used to go hot and cold with fright, and appeared to cause intense amusement by my state of nerves. When this boy sentry, who by his looks could not have been more than nineteen, jumps out from his hole in the wall, my heart seemed to stand still, until it feels that it is never going to start its job again, and then, with a bound, it carries on its job at about ten times its normal speed. My mouth feels like dry blotting paper, and all I say is, oh, hell, at the same time throwing my hands well over my head. My orderly, who appears most unconcerned, comes to my rescue, and says with a cockney accent, anglais, and our gallant ally brings his rifle to the order and allows us to pass. Previous to this incident I had been chatting to my orderly about his life in the army in peace days, but now walk on in silence until we have overtaken the convoy, finding the mules halted. Suddenly the French battery that we had passed earlier in the evening opens a terrible fire. I go along to its position and find that half our convoy had passed earlier, 
but that the battery being suddenly called into action the rear half of our column had been ordered to stop in the excitement two of the mules get adrift and with good instinct trot off to their own lines ignoring the cries in russian from their drivers and the angry bark of the little seventy-fives a halt of ten minutes and again with polite apologies the pleasant french gunner officers wishing us bonsoir allow us to proceed home to bed and a good night's rest may second a taube flies over and drops one bomb on our new aerodrome to the left of hill one thirty eight one of our machines which is up swings round heading straight for it and quickly drives it back a couple of aircraft guns from one of the ships put in some good practice little white puffs of shrapnel bursting perilously near a few wounded come in from a little show last night and amongst them are wounded turkish prisoners we are issuing stores now from one depot for the whole division and to all others who come way and carver are running it i simply hold a watching brief for my brigade but give a hand when i can in helping the business to run smoothly foley is up the coast a short way at x beach running his own depot for the eighty seventh brigade and wires constantly come in from him indenting on us for stores he has not in stock it is just like a business store and we are running short of supplies but a supply ship has come in to replenish our stock and form a large reserve depot our depot is the hotbed of rumors and news and we feel the pulse of the division through the news that the quartermasters and ration parties bring bad news has arrived this morning captain reed to whom i was talking last night has been killed and major lee his commanding officer with him i inquire as to what time it happened and learn that it was at eleven o'clock i was talking to him at ten it appears that shortly after i had left him word was passed down the trench for commanding officers and adjutants to go to the end of the trench to meet the staff major lee accompanied by captain reed immediately went and met two officers dressed in khaki with staff tabs one of these officers fires a revolver in major lee's face killing him instantly while the other murders captain reed in their turn they were quickly bayoneted by lee's and reed's orderlies the line is attacked by some two hundred turks who are met in the open by our men and quickly retire getting hell from the french seventy fives in doing so the two officers dressed in our staff uniform proved to be germans and their action was an attempt to break our line i also hear that godfrey fawcett colonel of the essex has been killed this upsets me far more than danger and i have the nightmare question running in my head sometimes now when talking to my friends or seniors whom i knew so well in england i wonder if i shall see you alive again a few snipers have been caught and they present a weird and uncanny appearance they wear uniforms of green cloth to which in some cases are attached or sewn sprigs of gorse bush and small branches of trees their rifles hands and faces are painted green and they can be passed unnoticed at but a few yards distance most of them have been found in holes and dugouts underneath clusters of bushes with two or three boxes of ammunition and enough bread and water to ration them a fortnight this morning the fleet and the few guns which are on shore are bombarding the turkish positions heavily and the slopes of achi baba are alive with bursting shrapnel and spouts of earth and smoke shooting skywards but through it all achi baba looks calm dignified and formidable like a great giant saying thus far and no further verily it looks the fortress gate of the peninsula and we are but on the threshold or rather on the footpath leading to the threshold turkish artillery replies but feebly with shrapnel but the shooting appears good i hear the crackle of rifle fire and learn that we are again attacking good luck to the twenty ninth afternoon guns of the fleet and shore batteries steadily boom away 
rifle fire has died down wounded are beginning to steadily come in and as fast as possible are evacuated onto hospital ships i go up to headquarters and find site for dump for rations retired somewhat i passed many wounded and stretcher bearers coming back i saw colonel williams our new brigadier calmly walking about in the most exposed positions a regiment of Gurkhas are on the right of our line, and those in support have dug themselves each a little dugout, just room enough for a man to lie in, rolled up. These little dugouts are in regular lines, and each one, being occupied with a little Gurkha, makes a most quaint scene. I take snaps of one or two to their intense delight. They look very workmanlike in their shirts, wide hats, and shorts. It is now dusk, and we hear that we advanced, but soon after had to return to our former positions. We are now badly outnumbered. The enemy have lately received many reinforcements, and are receiving them daily. We want several more divisions to carry this business through. We have dinner, and I go to bed rather depressed. Heavy rifle fire bursts out at night, and in the middle of the night our adjutant has to get up and organize a convoy of pack mules to take up ammunition. May 3rd. It is a perfect morning, but it is getting very hot. I ride up about 10 a.m. with the company sergeant major to as far as the furthest of the white pillars, and there we tether our horses to a tree and walk the rest of the way up the white road. All is absolutely quiet on the front. Not a shell, not a rifle shot. All firing from the fleet has ceased, and the gunners on shore are busy cleaning their guns and digging gun pits and dugouts. It is quiet and peaceful. At the front line I cannot see any signs of the enemy. I chat with Major Barlow of the Essex, who was at Warwick with me. He is now officer commanding Essex. It is strange being without the roar of the guns once more. The fleet has been treated to rather a hot reception and finds it advisable to lie a little further down the entrance to the straits, which it accordingly does. The mouth of the straits looks glorious. The intense blue of the sea, with the warships and transports, with their motley collection of lighters, picket boats, etc., all stand out strongly against the steely blue of the sky. Further off, the lovely Isle of Imbro shimmers like a perfect gem set in a sapphire sea, one can just make out the lovely violet tints of her glorious veils, tempered by the pearly gray mists that lightly swathe her mountain crests, as she stands out sharp against the sky. A beautiful sight, and not easily forgotten. Looking landward, the trees are all bursting into leaf. The country is wrapped about in a cloak of flowers and flowering grasses, with Achi Baba as a grim and rugged sentry its sides sloping away to the sea on either hand. Truly a grim and forbidding sentinel, but one which most certainly has to be passed if we are to do any good at all. Today an enterprising Greek landed in a small sailing vessel with a cargo of oranges, chocolate, and cigarettes, and in a very short time was quite sold out. We shall be having a Pierrot troop on the beach next, at night, as the moon rises to the full, the picture is perfect. The coast of Asia, that land of mystery and romance, with the plains of Troy in the background, immortalized forever by the sweet singers of ancient Greece. One can almost picture those godlike heroes of the past, halting in those titanic fights, which their shades perhaps wage nightly in the old battlefields of Troy, halting to gaze in wonder and amazement, on the strange spectacle unfolded before them, modern war, that is, and all its attendant horrors. Hector, Achilles, and Agamemnon, in their golden harness, their old enmities forgotten, must surely gaze in astonishment on the warlike deeds and methods of another age than theirs. The soft, shimmering sea merges into liquid silver, where in the dim distance the little wavelets lap around the silent, sleeping isles. There is Tenedos, standing like a sugar loaf in a silver bowl, silent as the night itself, and filled with mystery. Further off, 
Imbros, that queen of the isles, sleeps like a goddess wrapped about in a garment of violet and silver, all unheeding apparently of war's alarms. Surely on such a night as this the mythology of the ancients becomes a living thing, and it does not tax the intellect much to imagine Diana, queen and huntress, surrounded by her attendant maidens, pursuing the quarry through the violet veils of the isles. Again, one can almost hear the splashing of Leander as he swims the Hellespont to keep his tryst with a lovely hero. Most of those living on the beach have dugouts now, but I still live in a little house made of biscuit boxes. The Royal Scots came into action the first time last night. The Munsters were taken by surprise and had their trench rushed, and the Royal Scots were given the job to retake it, and cleared the trench of the enemy with two platoons at the point of the bayonet in twenty minutes. Greek civilian labor has now been landed, and we use them for unloading the lighters. A Turkish spy could with ease pass himself off as a Greek laborer of one of the gangs. Personally, I think we are making a mistake in employing them. Carver tells me that the other day he noticed one sitting halfway down the cliff in full view of Yenisher, waving to and fro a fly whisk with a metal band fastened round the handle which clasped the ends of the horsehair. He feels confident that, by the way he was waving the whisk, with the rays of the sun reflecting from the metal band, he was signaling by code to the Turkish observation post on Asia. I think it was quite possible for him to do so, for a bright piece of metal, reflecting the strong rays of the sun in the clear atmosphere of this part of the world, can be seen a long way off, and I should say quite easily as far as Yenis share is from W. Beach. To a casual passer-by, the Greek would appear to be waving flies away from his face with a whisk. Flies are daily becoming numerous here. One of the Greek foremen, who spoke English, assured me that it was only a matter of weeks now before Greece would come in on our side, and that he looked forward to the day when he would take his place in the ranks. It is strange how very silent everything is today. Not a gun nor a rifle shot. And we stroll about the beach, chatting with the naval officers. Afternoon. I hear that there was an armistice declared for the purpose of burying the dead on both sides. It lasted about two hours, during which both Turks and our men sat on their respective parapets, watching each other with interest, while parties were out in front, mixing freely with each other, clearing away their own dead. It was an extraordinary situation. One of the Turks picked up two of our live bombs which had fallen short and had failed to explode, and was making back to his trench with them, when his officers, spotting him, called him back and made him hand the bombs back to our men, and apparently gave him a good cursing in strong Turkish. A short time after, both sides are back in their trenches, and if a head should appear over the parapet of either side, it is in danger of being promptly blown off. At dinner I expressed the thought that I wished Turkey would throw over the Germans and become our allies. Our Tommies and theirs were so near this morning, and by God they would fight well side by side. I say that Turkey is the most valuable asset to have on either side. If she were our ally, the Dardanelles would be open to the Allies, and the Central Empires would be utterly defeated in a year. As an enemy, she will cause the war to drag on Lord knows how long, providing we are unsuccessful in forcing the straits. I am howled down, and am told that Achi Baba will be ours in a month's time, and once ours, Turkey is finished. But, strolling up to the top of the cliff after dinner, I take a long look at Achi. Ours in a month? I wonder... I turn, depressed and pessimistic, into my house of biscuit boxes, and bless the man who invented sleep. End of section 5
Section 6 of Gallipoli Diary. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 6, May 4th to 13th, 1915. May 4th, 5th, and 6th nothing much to record have been very busy these last few days forming a supply depot of my own for the eighty eighth brigade i go up to brigade each day riding as far as the white pillars but go bang across country now and not through said el bar our line is quite deep and well dug in now firing going on steadily at night quite heavy rifle fire but it is mostly turkish i learn that at night he gets the wind up and blazes away at nothing. One or two parties have made sorties, but our machine guns have made short work of them. The division is like one big family party. We all know each other so well now, and one can go through the trying vicissitudes of war with greater vigor, if with men who have become intimate friends. The horrible part is losing friends, much worse, I think, than having to go oneself. Good friends leave such a large gap, Tommy seemed pretty cheerful at night on the beach. After dinner, we sit outside our biscuit box houses and have coffee. Not a word. I got some coffee by exchanging jam with a Frenchman the other day, strictly against rules. And looking out to sea, enjoy some excellent cigars of the commanding officers. Any more for the Arcadian is constantly shouted out by a naval officer on the beach calling those who live at general headquarters who are billeted on the Arcadian to the pinnace. I often wish I could say yes one night and go on board and have a good bath and a whiskey and soda. Tommies play on mouth organs and sing Tommy's tunes. At Lemnos, Tommy was marching round the decks of the transport singing, Who's your lady friend? A few days after, he goes through one of the most sanguinary fights of the war. A week after, he is on the beach with a mouth organ, making a horrible execution of A Little Grey Home in the West. A unique creation, the British Tommy. If he ever does think of death or getting wounded, he always thinks it will be his pal, and not he who will get hit, and goes on with his mouth organ, washing his shirt, or writing to his latest girl at the last town he was billeted in. Those with girls are the cheeriest. May 7th. Today we are bombarding Turkish positions heavily, and the village of Krithia preparatory to advancing our lines to the slopes of Achi Baba, in the hope of my brigade taking the hill. In the morning I issue at my dump, and after lunch ride with Carver and Sergeant Evans to find our respective brigades. We ride up the west coast across grass and gorse, and arriving at a gully encounter shell fire which is now getting more frequent. We leave our horses with an orderly at this gully and proceed on foot, skirting the edge of the coast. Shells are bursting furiously over Krithia, which is again on fire. We reach a very deep and beautiful gully, which appears to run inland some long way, and we climb down its slopes to the shore. There we find an advanced dressing station, to which wounded are continually being brought by stretcher-bearers, or helped along by Royal Army Medical Corps men. Several of the wounded are Royal Army Medical Corps also. I inquire at a tent, which is a signal station, of the signal officer in charge, as to the location of 88th Brigade headquarters, and learn that they are inland. We chat a while to this officer, who appears strangely familiar to me, and at last I place him. I find that I dined with him four years ago at Edgebaston, and his name is Mowat, a Birmingham territorial, in business on his own, which through the war has gone to the winds. He tells me he has been here for four days, and is often troubled by snipers. They had caught one four days previously in a dugout, which, facing the gully, allowed his head and shoulders to appear giving sufficient room for him to take aim through a screen made by a bush growing in front. The entrance to his dugout was from the cliff side facing the sea, along a passage ten yards in length. He gave himself up, 
though he had food and water for some days more. As we talk, two wounded limp down the gully through the water, for the bottom of the gully is in parts a foot deep in water, and I question them as to how they were wounded. They reply, either spent bullets or snipers, and that they were hit about a mile further up the gully. We go back, climbing up the cliff, and walk along the cliff's edge to where we had left our horses. A detachment of New Zealanders, I should say about a thousand, are moving slowly, in several single files across the gorse, to take their place on the left of our line, to relieve some Gurkhas, and I have a good opportunity of studying them at close quarters. I am struck by the wonderful physique of the men, all of them in splendid condition. I am rather surprised to see them, for I thought that they were up country with the Australians. I leave Carver at this point, and Sergeant Evans and I cut across country and, trotting up the track which is now called the West Quithia Road, reach Pink Farm. We go beyond there, find headquarters in a trench, and learn that rations are to be dumped at Pink Farm. We are warned that we should not be riding about there, as we might draw shell fire. Crithia is getting it terribly hot from our shells, and is well on fire now. We learn that the French have had a check, and that we, in consequence, have been unable to advance. We come back and have a delightful canter all the way back to W Beach. I have a meal, and... Then with Williams, at dusk, escort rations, this time in limber wagons as well as on pack mules, up the West Crithia Road to Pink Farm, where I find Leslie waiting, and we come back on a limber, I squatting on the rear half and Williams in front. Quite an enjoyable ride. Star shells are now in use, and they go up at odd intervals, poising in the air for a second and then sailing gracefully to earth illuminating the immediate vicinity. It was fairly quiet all night, just an odd shell or two fired by our fleet at intervals. May 8th. Before breakfast this morning, I am ordered to take 200 rations up to some Lancashire Fusiliers, territorials, who have found themselves in our part of the line. Arriving at Pink Farm, shrapnel begins to come over, and I get the mules under cover of the farm as best I can, and go on to headquarters. I continue to walk along the road, and then cut across the open country to the trench where the brigade are. They are sitting in the trench having breakfast, and tell me that the Lancashire Fusiliers have now gone to the beach. Feston, of the Border Regiment, is now our brigade major, and he asks me to take a message to the field company of engineers attached to the brigade, just behind Pink Farm off the road. As we talk, Shrapnel bursts over Pink Farm and to its left, probably trying to get at a battery which is in position there. I take my leave, and on getting back to Pink Farm, I find that one of the Syrian mule drivers has been hit in the stomach by a shrapnel bullet. He is lying on the ground behind the walls of the farm, groaning, and on seeing me, cries piteously to me in Russian. I send over to an Indian field ambulance close by, and in a few minutes two native orderlies come running over noiselessly with a stretcher. They stoop down and, with the tenderness of women, lift the wounded boy onto the stretcher and carry him away. We trek back, and on the way I deliver the message to the field company. For transport, we now have little army transport two-wheeled carts, known in the Indian Army as ammunition transport, drawn by two little Indian mules, these are in camp near the lighthouse between W Beach and V Beach. Delightful place this, and most interesting. The orderliness of everything is astonishing. The quaint little tents, oblong with sloping sides, are arranged in neat rows. The inhabitants are surely the most cleanly people on earth. Here I see groups of them, stripped except for a loincloth, busy washing their shining, dusky bodies. After this, little brass jars are produced, from which oil is poured over them and rubbed in. Others, having finished this, are industriously combing their long black locks and bushy beards. Others, again, are making chapati, a species of pancake, in broad, shallow metal bowls. I taste one and find it excellent. 
Other groups of these dark warriors are sitting outside their little tents, smoking hookahs. All the men we meet salute punctiliously. Nearby are the white officers' tents, quite luxurious affairs. The whole place is delightful and looks almost like a riverside picnic, only everything is very orderly. As to the carts before mentioned, these are most ingenious. They are little two-wheeled affairs with a pole, like the old-fashioned curricle. Each is drawn by two small mules, not larger than ponies. Wonderful little fellows they are. Bred in northern India, Kashmir, and Tibet, I believe. Lord, how they work! They can pull almost anything. And they are so sure-footed and the little cart so evenly balanced that they can go about anywhere. It is a very interesting sight to see a convoy of these carts on the move, with their dusky, turbaned drivers sitting crouched up like monkeys on them, chanting some weird oriental ballad as they go, to the accompaniment of jingling harness. They are well looked after, too, these little mules. The drivers have had the care of them for years, perhaps, and their training is perfect. They look as fat as butter, and their coats shine like satin, very different from the hulking, ugly brutes that we have brought, American. They appear to be quite docile, and it is not necessary to have eyes in the back of your head when walking through their lines. I hear today that Major Barlow, to whom I was talking a few days ago in the trenches, has been badly wounded. One airplane has been very busy going out and coming back after short trips over the enemy's positions, followed by little puffs of bursting shrapnel when over their lines. The weather is perfect. Swiftsure and Queen Bess are now up the coast, off the gully, and are giving the left slope of Achi Baba and Krithia something to write home about. Torpedo destroyers are also joining in, and later the shore batteries take up the tune, and a bombardment similar to yesterday's starts, preparatory to another battle. French 75s are barking away incessantly, and the bombardment is increasing in ferocity. New Zealanders are on the extreme left, then the 87th Brigade, next the 88th and 86th, or what is left of it, with the new Territorial Lancashire Fusiliers. Next come Australians, up on the hill by the White House, and on the extreme right, down to the edge of the Straits, the French. The line forms the shape of a shallow basin, the extremes resting on ground on either side of the peninsula. Through glasses at six o'clock I can see little figures running here and there on the high ground to the extreme right beyond the White House, now taking cover, now running forward, now disappearing on the other side. Ugly black shells rain amongst them and make a sickening sight. Turkish artillery appears to have increased considerably. Their shells rain all along our line, but none come on the beaches. All their artillery seems concentrated on our trenches. Again and again I see shells fall right in the middle of men who seem to be running. It is difficult to discern whether they are Turks or our men. I watch till the sight sickens me, and then I come away and arrange the rations to go up tonight, seeing the boxes roped up onto the pack mules or loaded onto the army transport carts. Two shells come near the beach, bursting with a black explosion in the air. Rifle fire goes on all night, but artillery dies down to fitful shelling. I hear that the net result of today's work is a gain of 500 yards, but that we have had great casualties. May 10th. Another most perfect day. All day yesterday wounded were being evacuated as fast as possible. I now have to feed a brigade of Australians as well as my own brigade. I go up in the morning to their positions and for the first time get amongst them at close quarters. They have honeycombed the land near the white pillars with dugouts and have their headquarters at the White House on the hill. I see Captain Milne, their supply officer, and arrange matters with him. Our veterinarian Hislop and Sergeant Evans ride today with me and we call at our brigade headquarters, now moved some few hundred yards behind their former position of a week ago dug in a dry nook surrounded by trees, in a spot similar to a park of some large house in England. Their mess is simply a table of earth dug out by digging a square trench 
in which they sit, the center of the square being the table. There I find Colonel Williams Thompson and our new brigade major. I find that Feston was wounded yesterday while standing up in the trench in which I was talking to him the day before. Troops have found little springs and an ancient well, and so there is now a plentiful supply of water, and beautiful water too. In addition to Australians and the Punjabis encamped by the White Pillars, there are now Lancashire Fusiliers and Manchesters, the whole making one large camp of dugouts and trenches in orderly rows. It is fortunate that there is very little rain, otherwise the place would be a quagmire in five minutes. The Punjabis have built walls of mud and stone shell-proof shelters, and are much handier at making themselves comfortable than our white troops. In the Battle of the Eighth, the Australians showed marvelous dash and individual pluck, not a straggler among them. Many deeds of great heroism were performed, and if a man gets an honor in their ranks, it will be one worth having. It is difficult to pick up exactly our front-line trench, and the quartermaster of the Worcesters the other day, finding a trench containing Munsters, inquired as to the whereabouts of his regiment, and was told that they were on in front. He walked on, and, finding nothing, came back. He was told that if he walked much further, he wouldn't arf get Worcesters. He was walking bang into the enemy's lines. Two aeroplanes are up today, circling energetically around the slopes of Achi Baba. Our batteries are busy, steadily plugging shells into the enemy's lines. An aeroplane is up, and the Turks are trying to pot it. Aeroplane sails up and down Turkish lines unconcerned. The curious thing about being under shell fire is that when a shell comes near you, you duck down and take cover, and immediately after resume your conversation. This morning, at the White Pillars, I said to the Australian officer, What is your strength? He said, Look out! Down we bobbed, a sound like tearing linen, ending in a shriek and a bang. Up we jump, and he calmly continues the conversation. Met Duff, my honorable artillery company pal again. So funny seeing him. Both of us ride together. Last time we rode together was at Goring, side by side, in B-sub A battery. Never thought we should be officers riding side by side on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Have a delightful bathe off W Beach today. The water crowded with bathers, French and English. By far the best bathing I have ever had in my life. May 11th. Rather cloudy today, and much cooler. Rode up to Brigade Headquarters with Hislop, to the same place as yesterday. Saw Australian Supply Officer. As I was talking to him, a few shells came over our way, not singly, but by twos and threes. I have got used to the sound of them passing through the air now, and know by the sound whether they are coming my way or not. Again, as yesterday, the Australian officer gave me the warning, look out, and we dive for a dugout. The Australians get awfully amused when they see people doing these dives out of the way of shells, and it certainly does look humorous. My brigade is moving back to the reserve trenches for a rest, and they need it. The reserve trenches are those by the White Pillars, occupied at present by the Lancashires and the Manchesters, territorials. I meet General Damod and his staff, including the officer that I knew on the Arcadian. They are all riding. He stops me, asking if I have seen General Parrish, the Australian general. I express regret that I have not, at which he appears annoyed. One of his staff asks me to point out 29th Division headquarters, and I direct him to Hill 138 in rear of us. I point out the Australian camp to the general, who goes off then to inquire for General Parrish. I leave Hislop, who has another job on, and start to ride back across country, having a few jumps over the new rest trenches. I am overtaken by an officer who is the adjutant of one of the Lancashire Fusiliers' territorial battalions, the sixth, I think. Lord Rochdale is in command. He tells me that they have been in Egypt training for a long time, and cursing their luck at being seemingly sidetracked, with not much opportunity of seeing any active service. Suddenly they were wired for, and in twenty-four hours left Egypt for here. On arrival they marched straight up to the trenches, 
and at 5.30 p.m. the next day went into action and lost heavily. As I was being told all this, I heard a most weird noise, as if the whole of the sky were being rent in two, ending in a deafening explosion, and looking over my shoulder in surprise, I see, twenty-five yards to my left, over a little mound, a spout of smoke and earth and stones flung into the air. I say to my companion, I think we had better trot, which we do. It is strange, but my old horse did not seem to worry much when the shell burst. It must have been a six-inch, and it is the first big one that I have had near me so far, and may it be the last. Its sound is unlike that of any shell I have heard up to now, and far noisier in its flight. I think that if they chuck these sort about on the beach, I shall be jumpy in a very short time. I only hope the beaches are out of range, or will be before very long. Evidently they have a new gun. At times I feel very optimistic, looking forward confidently to our trip over Achi Baba. At other times, Achi Baba looks so forbidding that I feel we shall all spend the rest of our lives hanging on to this tiny bit of land. I can canter to Brigade Headquarters from the beach in fifteen minutes and walk from there to the front line in another fifteen, and that gives an idea of how far we are on. I ride over to the aerodrome. We are fortunate in finding such a perfect one and over to V Beach, which the French have got into a much more ship-shape order than ours. I count seven battleships and seven destroyers up the entrance as far as Morto Bay, and the packet of woodbines is still off the Asiatic coast, and touches up Yenisher and Kumkali with ten-inch shells. From the high ground overlooking V Beach, the fleet at the entrance makes an imposing spectacle waiting for the army to open the gates of the straits before they dash through to the Marmora. The Goliath and Prince George fire odd shots now and again at Chanak. Late in the afternoon we get a few light shells over on W Beach, and a few men are slightly hit. In a little gully between W Beach and X Beach, preparations are being made to start a field bakery, and we are promised real bread in a few days. One of our mares has given birth to a foal. My mare, much to the mother's annoyance, is much interested. Our train is in camp now on the high ground on the left of W Beach, looking inland, and have made very good lines. All the men have built little shelters out of wagon covers, sail claws, and tarpaulins, in rows opposite their horse lines, the whole looking like a well-ordered gypsy encampment. I made myself very unpopular there today by saying, You won't arf cop it in a day or so when John Turk finds you out. Saw General Hunter Weston making a tour of the beaches today. He appeared in very good spirits. Our trenches in the front line are now getting quite deep, and sand bagged parapets are being rapidly built. The Gurkhas do not like trench warfare at all, and cause much anxiety to their white officers by continually popping their heads over to have a look round. The Turkish line has crept much nearer to ours since the last battle, and they are also rapidly digging in. A party of Gurkhas were ordered out to capture a machine gun in an emplacement on an advanced knoll in front of the Turkish right and our left. The gun was captured, and one little Gurkha brought back a Turk's head, and it was difficult to make him part with it. Heavy firing broke out at eleven o'clock tonight and lasted an hour or two. May 12th. It is raining hard this morning and very cold as well. I visit the Senegalese camp at V Beach. They are physically very well-built men, well up to the average of six feet in height. They are as black as coal with shiny faces like niggers on Brighton Beach and very amusing in their manners. At the last battle they charged magnificently with horrible yelling, frightening the poor Turk out of his wits. They are equipped with wide, square-bladed knives about fourteen inches long. Wireless news is now typed and published nearly every day. Today we hear that the Lusitania has been sunk and that Greece and Italy are likely to come in. 
An extract from a Turkish paper says that we have been pushed into the sea, and almost in the same paragraph that the foolish British will persist in attacking. We have quite a comfortable little house now at our supply depot on the beach, made out of boxes with a sailcloth overhead. Hardly any firing today. Shore batteries remarkably quiet, but fleet firing intermittently. Afternoon. Go to brigade headquarters in the afternoon and find the rest camp at the White Pillars an absolute quagmire of mud, many of the dugouts being half full of water. Two sixty-pounder guns are now in position on the cliff to the west of W Beach, and this afternoon I go up to have a look at them firing. Their target is at a range of 9,600 yards, well up on the left shoulder of Achi Baba, and an aeroplane is up observing for them. The flame of the explosion shoots out some feet from the muzzle, and from the breech also, and makes a terrific roar, which echoes all round the ships lying off. The sound plane ducks and drakes from one ship to another. One can see with the naked eye the shell hitting its target on Achi Baba. Our fleet gets busy again, and later the batteries on shore join in, and a bombardment starts. At 6.45 p.m. the Gurkhas come into action on the left, and quite a big battle develops. We can just see the men through glasses. Crowds from the beach flock up to the high ground to have a look, getting into direct line with the 60-pounders, much to the gunner officer's annoyance, and police finally are posted to keep them out of the way. A shell exploding with a black burst over our heads, but very high, causes the watching crowd to scatter in a somewhat amusing fashion. Gregory and I move forward to a trench in front and look at the battle through glasses. All I can see now is a host of bursting shells on the left and intermittent shelling on the right and center. Suddenly another of these black devils of shells bursts over our heads and covers me with small hot cinders which sting. We go back to dinner whilst the battle is still going on. May 13th. At two o'clock this morning I was awakened by a most curious noise. It sounded like thousands of men off V Beach crying and shouting loudly. Shortly after I see searchlights, about eight of them, flashing from the battleships at the entrance to the straits. The noise goes on for about half an hour and then suddenly ceases. I stand for a few minutes puzzling what it is, and watching the searchlights still wielding their beams of light around, and then turn in again. At 6 a.m. I am told that the Goliath has been torpedoed and sunk. A Turkish destroyer came down the straits and got her clean amidships, and she sank in half an hour. I hear that half the crew is lost. The destroyer, if seen at all, disappeared in the darkness. Poor old Goliath! and it was only the other day that I was watching her in action. We now move our depot upon the high land on the left of W Beach and further inshore, and divide it into four, one for divisional troops and one for each brigade. While on this job at 7 a.m., I hear the sound of bagpipes coming nearer and nearer. It is the first time that I have heard bagpipes since I was on the south land with the king's own Scottish borderers. Sure enough, it is the king's own Scottish borderers, all that are left of them, some three hundred strong out of the strength of eleven hundred that they landed with from the Southland. They come swinging down to the beach with one officer at their head, and to see them marching well behind the inspiring skirl of bagpipes almost brings tears to my eyes. Three hundred left out of a crack Scottish battalion average service of each man five years. I ride up to brigade again this morning and find all very quiet on the front. I hear that we were successful in yesterday's and in last night's battle, and that the Gurkhas have taken a large important bluff on our extreme left on the other side of the gully. I bathe in the afternoon and, while enjoying the pleasure of doing side strokes with the sea having a slight swell on, I hear that terrible rending noise of a six-inch shell, similar to those that dropped near me the other morning, which bursts with a bang on the back of the beach. My bathing is promptly brought to an end. 
and I go back to my bivy. I feel safer there somehow, but why I should I cannot explain. But all who have been under shell-fire will bear me out in the statement that even if one is in a tent, one feels more confident under shell-fire than if in the bare open, with the exception, of course, of when one is caught under it, going to some definite place or finishing some urgent definite work. Then one's mind is concentrated on getting to that place or finishing that job. But sitting down on the beach, hearing the heavens being torn asunder by an unseen hand, as it were, the noise of the tearing developing into a mighty hiss and shriek, ending in a great explosion which shakes the earth under your feet and echoes far away into the distance, followed by the whine of flying pieces of hot metal, sometimes very near your head, is a most disconcerting and unnerving position in which to find oneself. For the benefit of those who have been so fortunate as to never have heard a shell burst in anger, a slight description of it may prove interesting. The first thing one hears is a noise like the rending of linen, or perhaps the rush of steam describes it better. This gets louder and louder, and then, as the projectile nears the end of its journey, one hears a whine, half-whistle, half-scream, and then the explosion. If it is very near, there is an acrid smell in the air. One's feelings are difficult to describe. You duck your head instinctively. You feel absolutely helpless, wondering where the thing will burst, and as you hear the explosion, a quick wave of feeling sweeps over you as you murmur, Thank heaven, not this time. Unfortunately, they have got the range of our beach accurately now, and are beginning to do real damage. The little shells that we had earlier did not frighten us much, but these beastly things make us all jumpy. Several men have been hit today, and about a dozen horses and half a dozen mules killed. All are taking cover as best they can. If one hits this bivouac where I am now writing, this diary comes to an untimely end. I wish our airplanes could find this gun. It appears so close up to us, and if it takes into its head to fling these beastly things about all day long, this beach will be untenable. A damned fool near me has just said, If they go on much longer, they will hurt somebody. I chuck a book at his head. In France they do get a chance of rest behind the scenes now and again, but here it is one constant look out, and down we bob. After a bout of shelling, one imagines shells coming. For instance, when an airplane sails over, people duck their heads, as it sounds just like a shell. And then also there are so many ships in harbor that one is constantly hearing the noise of escaping steam, sounding just like a shell. One of our men has just had the side of his boot torn away. Fortunately, however, only the skin of his foot was grazed and bruised. Fifty horses have now been killed, and three men killed and a few wounded. Had to go on duty at depot at head of beach. Shelling stopped. Finished duty 645. Shell immediately came, and I fell flat behind some hay. After that a few more came over and then stopped. End of section 6 Section 7 of Gallipoli Diary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum, Section 7, May 14th to 23rd, 1915. May 14th. Big guns started searching the beach with large, high-explosive shells at four for two hours. Everyone had to take cover. Airplane reconnaissance cannot locate gun, which is a damn nuisance. They come with a terrific scream and burst with a deafening explosion most upsetting to one's nerves. We all take cover behind the cliff. Not a soul can be seen on the beaches. All animals are removed to down under the cliff. Casualties? 
twenty-three mules and three men wounded. One piece of shell fell at my feet, and I picked it up, only to drop it quickly, as it was so hot. After being under fire of such awful shells, one laughs at mild shrapnel. Getting very hot, but perfect weather, saw Laird for a few minutes and had a chat with him. Not much time for riding today. Go up to Laird's bivvy and have a long talk with him over old times. He landed on that first Sunday on S Beach, and, though in the engineers, had the experience of taking part in three bayonet charges. He was in a neat little dugout when I went up, and was busy looking for a scorpion. I helped him look for it, and it seemed so strange that after all these years we should meet on the Gallipoli Peninsula, and, before sitting down to talk of old times, should be looking for a scorpion that had got into his dugout. Scorpions and snakes about three feet long are becoming more numerous here, but I believe they are harmless, except in self-defense. May 15th. All was quiet on the front last night, but today there has been one long artillery duel. I go up to brigade headquarters this afternoon and go round by the road through said El Bar this time, because I don't like them shells. Run as you may, you can't get away from them. On the way I passed Ashmead Bartlett, riding with a naval officer. The latter came and had tea with us later, and said that he was on the implacable, and Ashmead Bartlett was bivying there as well. He is a correspondent for several papers. Several battleships which were moored at the entrance move off at nightfall now, after that feat by the Turkish destroyer which sank the Goliath. There is to be a general attack tomorrow night, Sunday. Some of the Tommies do not like attacking at night. They say, let us get them in the open by day. The knocking out of a sniper by some of the South Wales borderers was described to me today by one of their officers. Two officers were standing up in their trench by a machine gun, one holding a periscope, when a bullet went through the sleeve of his coat, wounding the officer to whom he was talking. The first officer spotted a sniper bob down immediately after. He then got down in the trench beside the man working the machine gun and pointed out to him the bush behind which the sniper had crouched. The machine gun was laid on to it. Then the man on the machine gun and the officer took cover, the man holding his hand up to the machine gun ready to pop off. The officer then cautiously raised the periscope over the trench and looked carefully at the lower mirror. He saw in the mirror a head slowly appear above the bush eight hundred yards away, then a rifle lifted. He said to the machine gun man, fire, pop, pop, and the sniper rolled over dead on his side beside the bush. 5.30. Two Taubes have just come overhead flying at a great height. Anti-aircraft guns are firing, and there is some good shooting, but the Taubes have turned and are going back to the Turkish lines. One of our aeroplanes has gone up. A beautiful clear day, and one can see in detail the Asiatic side and the Isle of Imbros. No heavy shells today so far on this beach. Invitations to lunch and dinner, etc., go on every day here, and it is regular custom for men in the firing line to invite men from the base, only four miles back, to a meal and vice versa. This campaign is quite unique in many ways. May 16th. Perfect day again. Saw Brigade headquarters, and here they are moving further to the left, up in the firing line, about half a mile beyond Pink Farm. Here that our wounded and French and Australian have been arriving in great numbers in Cairo and Alexandria. The British are now being sent to Malta. Here that 20,000 Turkish wounded have arrived at Smyrna and 12,000 at Constantinople, put in divisional orders to cheer us up. Fancy a civilized nation sending round statistics of the result of their slaughter to cheer and exhort. Yet it cheered me. Strange how quickly one becomes bloodthirsty and savage. Fighting proceeding on our right by French. No general attack being made today. Idea being to strengthen line, push forward steadily by sapping, and then, when in a strong position with three or four lines of supports, to make a rush. 
This will probably happen in a few days now. Big Gun has not been knocked out after all, for we had a dozen of the best over today, but I was up in front and so missed it. Gurkhas on left have pushed forward well up to left of Krithia, still a few snipers behind our lines on left of Krithia. We had divine service this morning behind 88th Brigade lines. A service under such circumstances is most impressive, every soul there being within easy distance of a horrible death. It is a lovely morning, and as the soldiers sing the hymns with lusty voices, an accompaniment is provided by the screaming of shells overhead. But the singing continues unabated. Here one hears the same dear old tunes of our childhood, but under what different circumstances. At home, the breeze softly whispering in the trees outside the ancient church, with the shaded light glimmering through the stained glass, and men and women mingling their voices in praise to God. And then out here, the breeze murmurs as at home, the birds are singing and the sun is shining, but over the congregation, the bare-headed rows of khaki figures, even while they sing the same old hymns as of old, the angel of death hovers with naked sword, then the benediction in level tones from the padre, and the service is ended. Surely the most impressive I have witnessed, for here, in a double sense, one stands face to face with one's maker. May 18th. Our brigade has now moved up about three-quarters of a mile in front of Pink Farm, and I go up this morning to find them. I ride up to and leave my horse at Pink Farm, and walk the rest of the way down past a ruined house on over a small nullah, along the road past a battery, up to a white house called Church Farm, where I think it is about time to halt and inquire the way. A few Tommies encamped in this house tell me brigade headquarters is two hundred yards further on in the trenches, and I walk on. I notice a Tommy walking in the same direction with a biscuit tin on his shoulder, which he has rubbed over with mud to prevent the sun glittering on it. I continue on in the direction indicated and hear a few pings past my head, but thinking they are the usual spent bullets, take no notice. Suddenly something zips past my head, making a row like a huge bee flying at high speed, the noise being unlike the usual ping of a bullet passing harmlessly overhead. I conclude that I am being deliberately fired at by a sniper, and so bend double and, steering a zigzag course, jog-trot across the remaining fifty yards to a nice deep trench. On arrival, I inquire where brigade headquarters is, and am directed to a communication trench, which I go along and find myself at length in a square dugout with no roof, in which are General Williams busy at work with a spade, Thompson, Farmer, and Reeve. Concluding my business, and being instructed that the little ruined house in front of Pink Farm is to be the dump for rations, I say good-bye. Thompson says, Now, Gillum, run like a bunny but those bullets being a bit free at present over the trenches, I follow my own route back and walk along the hindmost trench, which I am told leads to a nulla which goes back in the direction of Pink Farm. I pass Worcesters and Royal Scots in the trenches, and finally the trench dips down to a wide open space under cover, with a small brook running its course, out of which two nullas run. This, I am told, has been officially named Clapham Junction. Unfortunately, a few shrapnel then burst immediately over Clapham Junction, and I therefore go to look for a waiting room, refreshment room, or booking office in which I can take cover until the rain has stopped. I find a refreshment room in the shape of an advanced dressing station, and two officers there very kindly give me breakfast. After breakfast, I walk along the nulla, which I learn is now to be called Krithia Nulla, back towards the rear, and when the sound of bullets pinging away overhead ceases, I step out onto a newly made road, which is still under construction by the engineers, and then come across the Manchesters again, in a newly dug trench forming reserve lines. Walking back to Pink Farm, I mount my mare and canter back to the beach. 
Last night the Turks made a raid on the part of the line held by the Lancashire Fusiliers, endeavoring to capture a machine gun, but very soon gave up the idea. They lost heavily and left six prisoners behind. Supply depot for my brigade alone now working smoothly. We draw rations for the whole division, men and horses, at six o'clock each morning by the general service wagons. This takes two hours, during which the rations are carted from the main supply depot, some three hundred yards inland from our depots at the back of W Beach, and sorted out to each of the three brigade depots and the divisional artillery depot. Breakfast at eight, and at nine thirty I go to my depot again and issue the rations to my units, meeting the quartermasters who have arrived with their transport. Receipts for the rations are then given to me by the quartermasters, who cart them away to their own lines, where their first-line transport is encamped only a distance of three to five hundred yards away on the other side of the beach. At night they are taken up to the various ration dumps, and from there taken the rest of the way to the trenches, either by hand or on pack mules. At the forward ration dumps the work of redistribution is carried on under a continual flight of spent and over bullets, and standing there one is in constant danger of stopping one. Up to now several casualties have been caused, but mostly slight wounds. After five minutes one becomes quite used to the singing of the bullets, which sound quite harmless. It is only when an extra burst of fire breaks out that it is necessary to get into a trench or behind some sheltering cover. I ride up in the afternoon to brigade headquarters, who have now dug themselves into a dry water course just in front of Pink Farm. I see General Williams and Thompson. Afterwards I walk up to the trenches where the Worcesters are, up beyond Church Farm and across that open space. At Church Farm I am told that at this side of the building I am out of aiming distance from a rifle and can only be hit by an over, but that at the other side of the building I come under range, and that it is not wise to loiter in that neighborhood. I therefore get across the three hundred yards of open space as quickly as possible, and vaulting into the safety of the trench I inquire where battalion headquarters is, and following the direction given, pass along nice deep trenches with sandbag parapets. Trench warfare in dead earnest has now begun, and for the first time I realize what it is like. An underground world, yet not an underground, for one can see grass, flowers, and trees growing, but only close to. Walking from Church Farm to the trenches, I see nothing but lovely country leading up to frowning Achi Baba, and nearby, in front, rows and rows of thrown-up earth. No sign of animal life of any kind. Yet, once in the trenches, I found myself in a world alive with energy. Men cleaning rifles, writing letters, washing clothes, making dugouts, laying cables. I pass dugouts, little rooms of earth dug out of the side of the trench. Some are cookhouses, some officers' bedrooms, some messes, and some orderly rooms with tables and chairs. All this world has been created underground and unseen by the enemy, only a few hundred yards away, in the space of a few weeks. And this is trench warfare, materialized by spade and shovel, by hundreds of strong arms night and day. I come at last to headquarters Worcester Battalion, and am directed to the mess, a nice dugout roofed in by timber. Major Lang is sitting at a table reading letters from home. I ask for letters for Captain Bush, am told they have been sent down to the beach by an orderly, am offered a drink, talk about the heat, which is getting tiresome now, and hear that soon we are to be served out with pith helmets. I say good-bye and start back. I am in a maze and have to be directed back to the trench that I jumped into. I vault out and, zigzagging, jog-trot, for I am told to go quickly back to Church Farm, and hear two bullets singing their faint song far away over my head. I come to a nulla where I find horses and mules in dug-in stables in charge of Robert's brigade transport officer. 
just in front of the little ruined house in front of our brigade headquarters and arriving there hear that thompson has gone back to hill 138 with the brigadier i go back to pink farm mount my mare and cantering along the west krithia road catch them up on either side of the road are now dug rest trenches organized as camps the trenches not as deep as the front trenches but sufficiently so to keep the men under cover i trot along the road through one of these camps and am soon pulled up by an m p with the sharp order no trotting please i ride with thompson to v beach and the river clyde comes in sight seen from the high ground near the lighthouse which was the turkish position on april twenty fifth i hear from him the events of that awful day how when the general and costaker were hit he was ordered to go back to the clyde and to take reeve how he was on one end of the hopper lying down and reeve the other and had to attract his attention and call to him to follow then they had to get back over dead bodies and the wounded under a hail of bullets which zipped overhead or crashed against the hopper and sides of the clyde with a loud bang he described the scenes on board the clyde and the cries of wounded the arrival of messages on steam pinnaces signalers at work semaphoring to battleships and transports and there lay the river clyde now a haven of rest with a solid pier built out from shore and alongside it using its hulk as a harbor v beach now a model of an orderly advanced base under the organizing talent of the french looked a different place to the v beach that i saw last we search for costaker's grave without success two huge graves are on the right of the beach looking seawards the graves of those soldiers and sailors whose bodies i saw laid out for burial on april twenty seventh wired round with fine crosses erected on each i ride back with him through the village past the camp of the amusing senegalese and along the new road that leads to clapham junction on either side rest camps have developed composed of lines of trenches and dugouts sheltered in trees and bushes i see several batteries of seventy fives and one is in action down a slope through trees and over little nullahs covered with growing gorse bush over meadowland past the site of our old brigade headquarters till when within sight of our new headquarters we come into uninterrupted view of achi baba and thompson then says we had better trot on arrival tea is ready and a new cake has arrived it had taken three weeks to come out and yet tasted quite fresh we have tea in the open at the bottom of the dry brook and afterwards i take my departure on return to w beach over comes a big shell and immediately all work is stopped and one and all general and private make for cover drivers rush to their lines and untie their mules and horses and trot canter and gallop to the safety of the shore at the foot of the cliffs right and left of the beach we wait beneath the friendly sheltering cliffs and hear the swishing shrieks as the shells hurtle through the air bursting on the beach and on the higher ground then as one shriek does not end with the crash of an explosion and its noise continues we look at each other with a certain amount of apprehension until with a fearful rendering it sweeps down on to us helplessly taking cover on the steep sides of the cliff and crashes with a deafening roar almost at our feet as it seems but really fifty yards away immediately there is a rush to more sheltered ground halfway up the cliff and three forms are seen lying helplessly in the road one is my staff sergeant with a scalp wound and badly shaken and two are dead mangled beyond description thank the lord my staff's wound is not serious well he is for blighty now and good luck to him we find the animals mules and horses have been strafed rather badly the lines that they are on are in very exposed positions as far as shell fire is concerned and it was not possible to get many away and in consequence the casualties among the poor helpless creatures were serious hislop our veterinarian 
dispatched all that he could on their last journey with one pull on his revolver pressed to their foreheads as a pause came in the shelling so he rushed out from his dugout and finished off those that were wounded beyond cure going about the horrid task coolly and methodically at intervals being forced to rush for cover to save his own skin but ever ready when chance offered to go back to his merciful task though we have been on this peninsula but a few weeks the veterinary services are efficient beyond praise and the cases of all animal patients suffering from the smallest ailments to the most serious of wounds are dealt with by the veterinary officers with the same care as the medical corps bestows on human patients looking back on the episodes that occur when the beach is subjected to shell fire with the fear of getting hit oneself removed temporarily the humor of them enters into our thoughts and conversations what so-and-so looked like when he slid down the cliffs did you see colonel dash dive behind those boxes or the royal engineer general competing in a fifty-yard sprint with his batman if it were possible to record on a cinema film these scenes that are instantaneously caused by the arrival of big shells without recording the bursting of a shell or the occurrence of casualties then a film could be produced which would rival in knockabout comedy any film of charlie chaplin's the french have been fighting this afternoon and the seventy-fives banging away for all they are worth a very big battle has been going on on the right perhaps this is why we have been given a taste of shelling may nineteenth i hear that general demotte has gone home which we all regret he was very gallant and brave and was continually with his troops in the trenches big gun not very active today thank heaven a couple came over however while gregory and i were walking down to the beach we both dived flat on the ground behind a small arms ammunition box really no protection at all but any cover is better than none i got behind gregory when we fell flat as his tummy being nice and large made extra cover for me i admit i considered only myself at the moment and not gregory and the temptation of taking shelter behind his massive form was one that on the instant i could not resist i told him this and he got very annoyed with me w beach has now been officially named lancashire landing after the lancashire fusiliers who took the beach on the twenty fifth of last month the gurkhas in their last scrap of a few days ago took an important bluff on the left of krithia overlooking the sea and this bluff has now been called gurkha bluff just heard that one of our submarines has been up the sea of marmora not coming back for twenty-one days it was given up for lost but reported back safe and sound to-day having sunk two turkish destroyers and three turkish transports commander awarded the victoria cross airplanes very active now tried to get a flight to-day but failed they go back to tenedos each night and come sailing over the sea back here after breakfast it is too dangerous for the machines to remain on at the aerodrome here on account of shell fire may twentieth brilliant weather once more it gets frightfully hot now in the middle of the day after lunch had a delightful bathe and then went to brigade headquarters in center of position all quiet there but french made ground today on right french now doing excellent work at gaba tepe australians heavily attacked last night by turks in great force supported by artillery including nine point two gun attack under personal command of von sanders australians hold their own the enemy losing heavily leaving heaps of dead on the field they come on in the german massed formation yelling allah and are literally mown down i prophesy that dardanelles will be open by june thirtieth if not before hear that they now have a coalition government at home we now have issued to us regularly in print one sheet containing wireless news and local news the sheet is called the peninsula press at times it endeavors to become amusing at the expense of the turk but it falls rather flat may twenty third this afternoon i walk over with jennings phillips williams and way to find major costaker's grave 
as there is some doubt as to where he has been buried. We had difficulty in passing through said El Bar, as the French are very strict about others than French passing through, but an Australian military policeman came to our rescue and passed us through. The French have the advantage in having said El Bar, for amongst the ruined houses are several untouched by shell-fire, in which they are enabled to make very comfortable quarters. But the best quarters of all are in the large fort which looks over the straits. The other fort that I have referred to stands back from the beach, on the right-hand side looking seawards. We have our photographs taken, sitting on the muzzle of one of the big Turkish guns at this latter fort. Also, to the huge delight of the Senegalese, we take some photographs of their camp, and one of them insists on my being in the group. We meet with no success in finding Major Costaker's grave, and I can only conclude that he is buried in one of the two large graves down on the beach, marked Gallant Dead of the Dublins and Munsters and others. On the way back we sit for a while in front of Hill 138 and have a long look at the beautiful country lying between us and Achibaba. Through glasses we notice some precipitous slopes in front of Achibaba and wonder how long the day will be before our troops will be storming them. Not a sign of the enemy can be seen. Just now and then little white puffs of shrapnel, now from our guns over their lines and now from theirs over ours. Now and again the French 75s bark out, bang, 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 about as rapid as a machine gun. The FOO, forward observation officer, watches the enemy as a cat does a mouse. Any sign of life in an enemy trench, such as the sight of shovels appearing over the parapet and earth being thrown up, a body of Turks moving across the open between their lines, or a new communication trench that appears in course of construction, is immediately telephoned to the battery commander at the guns, and before it is possible to count sixty seconds, half a dozen shells burst near or on the target. No target appears too small or too insignificant for them, and ammunition is plentiful. A great pile of shells in boxes is tidily stacked against the walls of said El Bar Fort, and the stack steadily grows. We are not in the same fortunate position with our ammunition. On April 27th, when I was at V Beach, I saw a 75 battery being hauled up from the shore. I was standing amongst some French soldiers, and one standing next to me turned to me and pointed to the guns, saying, Soixante cans, bon, eh? He looked upon them with pleasure and almost awe. Then I did not appreciate their immense worth, but now I do. We strolled back in the evening, had a peaceful dinner, and at night, but for fitful bursts of rifle fire, all was quiet. Mowat, my friend of Birmingham days, looks in to have a chat, but his conversation is rather depressing to us all. If his theories are right, then we are stuck here in front of Achi till the end of the war, or driven into the sea. A listener to one of his arguments puts forth the theory that, if we had effected a landing at the Bolaire lines, the peninsula, being cut off from Turkey and Europe, would automatically have fallen into our hands. But that theory is immediately exploded by the knowledge of the fact that, at present, Chanak, on the Asiatic side, is the main source of supply, via Medos on the peninsula, separated, as they are, from each other by, under a mile of water of the straits, easily crossed by regular ferries. From Chanak we believe that the enemy receives nearly all his ammunition, stores, supplies, and reinforcements, which are ferried to Medos and transported from there by pack mules to their army on the hill. We have seen convoys of pack mules now and again on the slopes of Achibaba, but they seldom show themselves for fear of the heavy shells from the guns of the fleet, but they must swarm over each night. Mowat says that if an army of ours landed at the lines of Buller, it would be flanked on either side by Turkish armies, one on the peninsula and one on the mainland. Both these armies would be kept in the field by plentiful and safe sources of supply, 
and our army would quickly find itself in an ever-tightening vice, rendering it in short time impotent. He argues that once it had been decided to land on the peninsula, we landed at the right place, but that the success of taking the hill might have fallen to our armies if the Australians had landed where the 29th landed, namely at Hellas, on the tip of the peninsula, and if the 29th had landed up the coast behind Achi, where the Australians had landed, the twenty-ninth, being a more tried and disciplined machine, would have conquered its way to Medos, forming a line of steel behind the small Turkish army. We are told its strength was about thirty thousand men on April twenty-fifth, and this Turkish army, being cut off in rear, would have fallen a victim to the oncoming, gallant, and all-conquering Australians and New Zealanders. The fall of Constantinople would not have been far off, the straits would have been open to the allied fleets another theory is that a landing could then have been effected at alexandretta north of syria and a march from there could have been made by a strong and overwhelming army of french and british to the gates of baghdad and that after the fall of baghdad we should have been able to link up with the russian army then there would follow a sweep through asia minor to the coast of the marmora and shores of the Dardanelles. The fleet would dash up the narrows to the Golden Horn, and, as the Arabs say, Turkey mafish. Moet appears to have studied the question logically, but it is the staff's job to think these things out, and ours to do our job in our humble way. However, he depresses us, and I shall have to go and have a chat to those naval optimists again. Sed El Bar is a mass of ruins now, but however ruined a village may be, one can always picture to a certain extent what it was like in its lifetime. Sed El Bar must have been a very charming place before the bombardment, with its ancient 15th century houses, orchards, and gardens. The fort, evidently 15th or 16th century, is a very picturesque and massive building, having spacious chambers with the roofs going up in a dome shape, more egg-shaped though than dome, made of solid masonry, four or five feet thick. The walls also are just as thick, but the guns of the Queen Elizabeth simply smashed through them like butter. It is wonderful how the country in our possession to date has changed. Roads are being made everywhere. Pipes lead from wells to troughs. Piers run out from beaches. Sides of cliffs have little dugouts, and little houses and terraces, with names given them, such as Sea View and Lancashire Terrace, such names being officially recognized. Also, camps and horse lines are everywhere. Big Gun has been shelling V Beach today. Y Beach is now known as Gurkha Beach. End of Section 7 Section 8 of Gallipoli Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 8, May 24th to June 1st, 1915. May 24th. Perfect day after ten, very heavy rain earlier. My job to draw supplies from main supply depot for division. Rotten job, which starts at six. Brigade not moved. Here that Italy has definitely come in. This closes a channel of supplies into Austria and Germany, and is bound to tell in a few months. Japanese bombshells experimented with in Australian trenches at Gaba Tepe. They are fired by a trench mortar and have a range of 400 yards. They have a small propeller to keep them straight and explode with great violence, blowing trench to bits. The first one tried fell beautifully in a Turkish trench at 200 yards range and exploded with great violence. Turks started kicking up a fearful row, and about 50 rushed out like a lot of hornets. Machine gun turned on them and scotched the lot. Great request now on our part for Japanese bombshells. 
News now arrives that two submarines from Germany have got into the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar, and that they are making for this part of the world as hard as they can go. Most of the fleet and transports in consequence move off at nightfall for Lemnos Harbor, off the village of Mudros, where our transports concentrated before the landing. Looking out to sea from the beach, the feeling of loneliness engendered by the departure of the shipping is curious. Yesterday I looked seawards, and the ocean was dotted with warships, transports, etc. Pinnaces darted to and fro. All was hurry and bustle, during which one had a comfortable feeling that at our backs were our naval comrades, ready to help at a moment's notice. Now less than half the shipping lies off the coast than did a week ago, and a feeling of loneliness, almost of fear, comes over me. Hindu as well as Sudanese laborers now working on the beach. All the time they are carrying anything on a cart, with six pushing, one of them, evidently in authority, walks alongside, laughing and gesticulating, singing something in a Gregorian chant, to which the others answer by singing three words in a monotone. This goes on all the time and causes much amusement to the Tommies, who of course imitate, whereupon the coolies laugh and sing all the louder. We have now built a bivouac of boxes on the cliff edge, the right side of the beach looking towards the sea, and from there we obtain a fine view of the scenes on the beach and the road below at the foot of the cliff, which is gradually being widened, built up, and extended round to X Beach. May 25th. Woke up in our new bivy this morning. It is very nice up here, overlooking Imbros. From my bed I can see the swift shore fire a shot into the water. I get up at once, and, looking through my glasses, see her fire another, this time between the Agamemnon, which is moored close by, and herself. Torpedo destroyer comes dashing up, and immediately makes big circles round the two ships. A tiny little pinnace slips out with only four sailors on it, and rushes round and round the swift shore like a little pup defending its mother. A bugle sounds several times, and men in white swarm out from all kinds of places and stand to stations on the decks. A submarine has been sighted right among our shipping. It had darted like an evil fish between the Swiftsure and the Agamemnon, and the Swiftsure had kept it off. At one o'clock, news arrives that the HMS Triumph has been torpedoed off the Australian landing at Gabatepe, and it is a terrible shock to us all, coming as it has so soon after the sinking of the Goliath. A good many lives were saved, nearly all the crew. No doubt it was hit by the same submarine that attempted to finish off the Swiftsure and Agamemnon this morning. We are all naturally anxious at further developments. A Turkish battery is shelling the aerodrome on the east side of W Beach. Some very good practice is made, and one machine is damaged. This afternoon the same thing starts, and one shell pitches into the sea. If they move their gun five degrees right, they have the range of our bivy nicely. May 26th. It is another perfect day, and it is absolutely ideal at our bivy on the cliffs overlooking the southwest tip of the peninsula. The sea is perfect, yet while admiring the view we hear the old familiar whistle of a shell, and one comes right over us, plunk, into the sea. Another soon follows and we have to go beneath the cliffs, and our aspect of the peaceful view is immediately changed. Shelling lasts half an hour, and after lunch we can come back. Go up to Brigade Headquarters this morning, and find that South Lancashire Division have been merged with the 29th Division. Laird, quite fit and chirpy as usual, in a topping little dugout nearby. Reinforcements arrive today, and I show them the way up. One chap asks if there is a chance of his getting into the firing line. I answer that he will be in the firing line in half an hour. And, poor chap, he looks queerly at me. He will get used to it, though, in a day. He asked the question as if to show that he was longing, after months of training and waiting, to get there, but had rather a shock when he found it was so near. Flies, ordinary house flies, are beginning to be awful pests here, simply myriads of them. People in England do not know what a fly pest is. They make a continual hum as they fly round. There are so many of them. 
One of our officers named Jennings gets very annoyed with them, and when trying to get asleep in his dugout of an afternoon, has a few minutes' indulgence in hate, not against Germany, but against the flies, murmuring to himself, got strafe the flies over and over again. Ritchie, my old honorable artillery company pal of the Goring days, who was on the Arcadian, turns up at Supply Depot and invites me to dinner in the near future. It does not seem so very long ago that we were having a pigeon pie dinner in our barn at Stoke-on-Thames when we were both gunners in the honorable artillery corps. Late in the afternoon, shells come whistling over our bivouac once more, well overhead, and burst in the sea near to supply ships. About fifteen come over, and the transports weigh anchor and clear out of the way, taking up moorings again behind the Majestic, which is lying about a thousand yards off the center of W Beach. Evidently, the Turks are being spotted, for at Yenishir, where no doubt they have many observation posts which are in telephonic communication with Chanak, further up the straits, which is in turn in telephonic communication with Turkish headquarters on Achi, what more ideal conditions for laying their guns could be wished for? It is fortunate for us that their artillery and ammunition are scarce. With a full complement of artillery against us that the Germans would provide to an army of the same strength as that of the Turks, I think that we should, as things have developed now, pack up and be off within one week, and not even the dear little 75s could save us. The field bakery is in working order now, in a little gully further up the coast, and we are having most excellent bread each day. Not a full ration, about 40%, being made up by the biscuits. It consists of three bakery detachments of six bakery sections each, a total of 24 ovens, and is capable of making bread for 60,000 men. The ovens are made of curved metal. The troughs are in a large marquee where all the mixing of the flour and ferments is done. The bread supplied on the whole is good, but of course under the conditions in which the men are working it is difficult to turn out bread of the quality that one expects in London. Baking goes on practically the whole of the 24 hours. The whole bakery is under cover and cannot be seen in any way by the Turk, though the gully in which it has been placed can be shelled should the Turk become aware of its presence. I dine with Ritchie at 7.30 p.m. in his dugout under our cliff between our position and the bakery. Five other officers are there. Amongst them is Major Huskisson, a charming jippy Army Service Corps man who is in charge of the main supply depot here, and also a man who was in the River Clyde at the landing and who saw Colonel Carrington Smith killed. Ritchie is officer commanding a labor corps, camped on the side of the cliff around his dugout. We play bridge after dinner, and I actually have a whiskey. First game of bridge I have had since we landed, and it is weird playing in such surroundings. Outside, a perfect moonlight night. Elsewhere I have mentioned the Isle of Imbros by night, but really it is next to impossible to describe the beauty of these Greek islands unless one is a poet or a painter. To my mind, Imbros is the most beautiful of any of the isles in reach of the peninsula. But tonight, as it seemed, she surpassed herself in beauty. The sea lies like a sheet of liquid silver under the rays of the moon. There, like a precious gem, lies Imbros, sleeping on the face of the waters. Her deep valleys and gorges running down to the sea are aswim with purple shadows and her rugged mountain crests stand out violet and clear-cut against the star-spangled velvet of the skies. Her feet are wrapped about as with a snowy drapery woven of the little foaming crests of lazy wavelets lapping around her. From behind her the feathery night clouds appear to swathe themselves about her, and her mountain peaks seem like a coronet set upon the dusky brow of some beautiful goddess of the night. All is silent and she sleeps peacefully upon the waters, awaiting the coming of the fiery god of the morning, who, dashing across the sky in his chariot of flame, will awaken her with a burning kiss, driving the purple shadows from her valleys and filling them with a swimming golden glory which shall make her seem 
even more lovely by day than by night. Truly is she a goddess upon the waters, a rival almost of Aphrodite herself. As I go back to bed, walking back along the foot of the cliff, rifle fire is rattling away on our left. I climb up to our bivvy, being challenged several times, and turn into bed. May 27th. Woke at 6.30 this morning, feeling very refreshed, and find it is a beautiful morning. The view is perfect from our biscuit box bivvy. I am just drowsily thinking about getting up, when a gun from HMS Majestic fires. This is followed immediately by the report of an explosion, and Carver says, Good Lord, she is torpedoed. We rush out and see the green, smooth wake of a torpedo in a straight line, horizontal with our bivvy, starting from a point immediately in front of us. HMS Majestic is about 800 yards to our left, immediately in front of W Beach, and I see her, massive and strong, bristling with guns and crowded with men in white, slowly tilting over with a list to her port side. Men are doubling on deck to their places in perfect order, with no shouting or panic. Then, evidently, the order, every man for himself, is given, for I see a figure leap into the water, making a big splash, then another and another. It is like jumping off the side of a house, until the sea around is dotted by bobbing heads of men swimming. Slowly she tilts over, and men clamber onto the side above the torpedo nets, which are out. As many as possible get away from the nets, for they make a trap. By this time, after only four minutes, she is surrounded by destroyers, trawlers, pinnaces, and small boats, and with perfectly wonderful and amazing efficiency, they systematically pick up the struggling figures in the water. One after another, men continue to leap, while the big ship lists, yet there are some, amongst whom are several officers, who stand on the side calmly waiting, and some still on the platform above the torpedo nets. My glasses are glued on these men. I see them plainly in every detail, and almost the expression on their faces, as they stand on this platform, with their hands behind them, holding on to the side of the ship. I see an officer in the center looking anxiously to the right and the left, shouting directions. A man at the end manages to clamber to his left and slides painfully over pipe stays and the usual fittings on the side of a battleship, falling with an awkward thud in the water, and another and another follow him. Then, after six minutes, she begins to list quicker and quicker, and the remaining men on the torpedo net platform still hang on. The nets curl up into themselves. These men are now horizontal to the ship, for she is now well on her side. The nets fling themselves into the air with a horrid curl, and disappear from view with these brave officers and men underneath. Can they dive and get free? The emerald green of the keel plates appears, and in two minutes she turns turtle, her bows remaining highest and her stern beneath water. As she turns, men run, slip, and slide into the water, and at the finish, eight minutes after, her bows are showing and about fifty feet of the bottom of the ship above water at an angle. Finally, one man is left on the green slippery keel, and he, evidently not being able to swim, calmly takes his jacket off, sits down, and, if you please, takes off his boots, and walking slowly into the water, plunges in, having the good fortune to grab a life buoy and is hauled to a tug. The submarine has been spotted, and torpedo destroyers give chase, circling round and round, but all signs of her have disappeared. The destroyers, six in all, make bigger and bigger sweeps when the sound of firing is heard out at sea, and about four miles to the east of Imbros I can see a big French battleship going hell for leather towards the island. She is firing astern, and immediately all six destroyers put out to sea as fast as they can steam. The French ship then fires an extra big shell astern, which explodes with great violence in the water. The destroyers coming up, she gives up firing and makes off to safety. 
later no news as yet of the submarine and we await with a little anxiety further developments the survivors coming ashore were looked after by the tommies given new clothes breakfast and rum and seemed none the worse for their adventure one said this is the third dash time i have been sunk and i'm getting a bit fed up one quickly becomes a philosopher and fatalist on this peninsula and the fact that we are all atonic to each other keeps our spirits up i hear that most of the crew are saved including the admiral and the captain about forty have lost their lives and i am sure amongst this number are those unfortunate brave men who stood calmly waiting for almost certain and immediate death or the bare chance of continuing to live longer on that trap of a torpedo net platform i stroll down to the beach and talk to naval officers about the loss but they appear as optimistic as ever tell me she was an old boat of not much value nowadays built as long ago as eighteen ninety four and that when once achibaba is taken the fleet will get to work and make a dash up the straits the scene is just the same this beautiful evening but instead of a dignified strong battleship in our midst there remains her green boughs like the head of an enormous whale peeping out of the water seven a m taub flies over drops bomb two men killed may twenty eighth go up to brigade headquarters this morning delightful canter along west krithia road I pass many camps, or rather lines of trenches, on either side of the road, serving as camps. Just at this time of year, crickets are very numerous. It is difficult to spot them, but they make a sound with their chirping not unlike the concerted song of a host of sparrows. I notice it more particularly at Pink Farm in the early morning, and sometimes at night on the cliffs by the sea. I find that brigade headquarters have moved forward a little to the left, and have dug nice quarters into the side of a small hill. They were flooded out of their previous headquarters by a cloudburst, a curious phenomenon. We did not feel it at all on the beaches, and yet a few miles inland they experienced a veritable flood. 5 p.m. I ride to Morto Bay, across country, through the white pillars, and have a ripping bathe. It is a beautiful spot, just up the straits, three miles from the shores of Asia, flanked on its left by high ground, on which is de Tott's battery, and on its right by the high wooded ground behind Sedel Bar. Perfect bathing, all sand, and gently sloping until one wades out of one's depth. Plenty of French troops bathing as well. All this side of the peninsula is in the hands of the French. As we are bathing, one shell comes over from Achi and bursts near the white pillars. 7 p.m. Arriving back at W Beach, I can see about half a dozen destroyers bombarding a few villages on Imbros for all they are worth. Lord, are we at war with Greece now? May 29th. A beautiful day, but there are no battleships lying off, and but one or two supply ships. The absence of shipping makes a great contrast to the busy scenes amongst the fleet and transports of a week ago and their absence has a depressing effect on us all. Several destroyers are patrolling up and down the coast, and from Asia to Imbros. All is quiet on the front, but reinforcements steadily arrive, and a continued steady stream of ordnance stores and supplies is unloaded from the supply ships into lighters, which are then towed by small tugs to the piers, alongside which they are made fast. There the stores are taken over by Royal Engineers, ordnance or supply officers who with groups of laborers unload them from the lighters on to the piers greek labor then handles the stores along the piers to the beach where they are dumped on the sand then officers with clerks check the stores with the figures stated on their vouchers and greeks load them onto wagons and mule carts which then drive off up the newly made steep roads of the beach to the royal engineers park just halfway up the beach, to the ordnance depot on the cliff to the right of the beach looking inland, or to the rapidly growing main supply depot, which will soon make a splendid target for the Turkish gunners, on the high ground at the back of the beach. 
At times we find that the main supply depot is unable to satisfy all our indents, and in consequence we have to go down onto the beach and draw from the piles of supplies which have accumulated there faster than it has been found possible to cart them away. But never on any occasion do we find that our indents have to be refused from both the main supply depot and the beach. For the Army Supply Corps out here, where there are difficulties that have never been experienced before in previous campaigns, such as transporting by sea from Southampton or Alexandria over a sea rapidly becoming infested with submarines, unloading into lighters offshore in a rough sea, with the lighters bumping and tossing roughly against the ship's sides, towing the lighters alongside flimsy piers, always under a constant work of construction or repair, and finally the arduous work of manhandling from the lighters to the beach, carting from the beach to the main depot, and thence to trenches, guns, and camps, with a daily ration of Turkish shells to dodge, are organizing the feeding of the men in the trenches, the man at the gun, and we behind, punctiliously as our troops are fed in France. Whatever unforeseen difficulty arises, breakfast and the succeeding daily meals are always ready at the scheduled hours for general and private, officers, chargers, and mules. One hitch, and our army here may have to go on half rations, or no food at all. An army moves on its stomach. True, we are not moving, but if our stomachs are not regularly and wisely fed, we shall rapidly have to move, and then in the opposite way to our objective. The Army Service Corps officer who was at dinner at Ritchie's the other night is with me on the beach, and as I walk with him to the main supply depot, he contrasts the circumstances here with those in France under which the Army Service Corps works. Pointing to the pier and stacks of supplies on the beach, he says, There you have your Havre and base. The wagons, limbers, and mule carts are, he tells me, the equivalent of the railway supply pack trains running every day from Havre to the various railheads behind the lines. We arrive at the main supply depot, and he says, We are now at one of these railheads, but hardly ever does a railhead in France get shelled, and never one of them regularly and continually as this one will be when these stacks of biscuits grow a bit higher. Pointing to our divisional depot of four little dumps, one for each of our groups, just 300 yards away from us, he says, There is your refilling point, usually two miles or more from a railhead, and then seldom under shell fire. In our case, we are actually behind railhead. An officer on duty at the main supply depot who has been up to Anzac, as the landing of the Australians up the coast is now called, joins in our conversation, and tells us that actually on the beach at Anzac, spent bullets continually fly over from the enemy trenches, adding, fancy spent bullets flying around the depot at Havre. I ride up to brigade headquarters in the afternoon and have tea, and am called on to supply them with the latest beach rumors, which I glean each morning from our dump and from our naval officers on shore. Coming back, just in front of Pink Farm, I stop at the mess of the Royal Scots, who are in a trench camp. Their mess is very well dug in, and I am surprised how comfortable it has been made. They are very hospitable, and have an overflowing larder of unheard-of luxuries in this land of bare necessity. Old Steele, the quartermaster, is there, and presses Turkish delight onto me. As we sit talking, shrapnel whizzes over and bursts behind us, fifty yards to our left, trying to get L battery. I hear the account of the part the Royal Scots had taken in the last little scrap, and am told that one of their sergeants, who was a man of good position in Edinburgh in civil life, was found dead, lying with a semicircle of five dead Turks around him, their heads smashed in with the butt end of his rifle. He must have come of a fighting stock, yet never anticipated he would end his life on the battlefield. May 30th. I am on duty at 6 a.m. at the main supply depot, drawing the day's supplies to our divisional dump. Each of the four supply officers takes it in turn, 
so that the duty falls on me once in four days. It is a lovely fresh morning, and after signing for the supplies, I light a cigarette and stroll back to my bivvy, feeling ready for breakfast. I meet Millward on the way, who now lives in a tent near the depot. He was our naval landing officer on the Dongola on April 25th, and is now one of the naval landing officers on the beach. He tells me that he is about to go back to join his original ship, somewhere in the North Sea, that he does not want to go a bit, and this side of the war is far more interesting. He also says that the piers are going to be constructed so as to be proof against the bad weather that will come in the winter. Ships will be sunk to form breakwaters. The winter? I exclaim. Heavens, we shall be in Constantinople long before then. Achi will be ours by June 30th, and then we have them at our mercy. Millward says it is wise, however, to be ready for a winter. Winter? Lord, what a long time ahead it seems. This afternoon I ride with Carver, Woodbridge, Foley, and Tull, with orderlies to Morto Bay, and on the way have a delightful cross-country canter. I have difficulty, though, in making my mare jump trenches. She jumped hurdles at Warwick Racecourse like a bird. Had a delightful bathe while the French Senegalese were doing likewise. Absolutely cold black figures, laughing and playing like children. No firing from Asiatic side. Their guns evidently silenced by us. Only three miles across, most beautiful view, with mountains and plains of Troy in the background. This place will make a fine watering place after the war for some enterprising capitalist. In the background, beautiful wooded country, with the stately white pillars standing up, the whole place this side of the pillars a large French camp. I like the French. They are charming. What a difference this place is now to what it was in those first few days, when we had to toil up at night through the Turkish cemetery, past the croaking frogs, with fears of snipers. May 31st. A perfect day. I ride up with Foley to my brigade in the morning, and there meet Captain Wood, the adjutant of the Essex, and dear old Ruby Revel of the same regiment. The mess room at brigade headquarters, though dug in the side of a small hill, is like a country summer house, and this morning it is very hard to realize that we are at war. Crickets are chirping in the bushes, and pretty little chaffinches with bright-colored feathers hop about amongst the trees. I look through a powerful telescope at the Turkish trenches, and it seems almost as though I could throw a stone at them. The precipitous slopes of Achi Baba appear in vivid detail, as for the Turkish first line, I feel that if I put my foot out, I shall tread on its parapet. Yet I see not a sign of life, and all is perfectly quiet. I think that a big attack is coming off in a few days now, and great preparations appear to be going on. Many reinforcements have arrived, and we are almost up to full strength again. In fact, several of those who were slightly wounded on the first day have actually returned, fit and sound to the firing line. Riding back, Foley and I call at his brigade headquarters and see Major Lucas, the brigade major, and later Brigadier General Marshall comes in. Their headquarters, situated some 300 yards behind Pink Farm, but to the right, looking towards Achi, is built in an even more beautiful spot than the headquarters of the 88th. In fact, it can only be described as a most beautiful natural garden, and the quarters are composed simply of summer houses nestling under trees with flowers and meadow grass growing in beautiful confusion all around. Bullets just fall short of this spot, and shells do not drop near, for it is away from any target. I call it the Royal Naval Division Armored Car Camp afterwards, just halfway back between Pink Farm and the beach, off the West Crithia Road, to look up a friend that I hear is with them but learn that he has not yet landed. Four armored cars are dug into what look like deep horse stalls of earth, beautiful Rolls-Royce cars, and I hear that they are to go into action in the battle which is thought to be coming off in a few days. 2 p.m. This afternoon it is so hot that I strip to the waist and ride on the cliff. A few transports are in, minesweepers in pairs, with little sails aft, 
are on duty at the entrance, cruising slowly and methodically to and fro, joined to each other by a sunken torpedo net, and woe unto a submarine that should run into that net. It will quickly meet with an untimely end, its base will hear no more news of it, and its destruction will be kept secret by the Navy. Destroyers are on patrol right out to sea. One battleship can just be seen away towards Lemnos. Work on the beach goes on steadily. Engineers are hard at work constructing a new pier, which will serve as a breakwater as well. Stones for this purpose are being quarried from the side of the cliff. A light railway is in course of construction round the beach and along the road at the foot of this cliff and up to the depot. June 1st, 1130. Road to headquarters, leaving my mare at Pink Farm, where I meet General Doran, our new brigadier with whom I walk to headquarters. Coming back along West Quithia Road, met Matthias, brigade veterinarian. Two shells whistle over us. Matthias says, Here comes a shell, to which I reply, It's come and gone, dear boy, as they burst plunk in the middle of the road that we have to pass along. We make a detour and ride back over country. Four officers, just come from England, arrive and have lunch with us. 3 p.m. Ride with Foley to Mordo Bay for a bathe. Bay full of French and Senegalese bathing. As we sat undressing, one big burly fellow came up to Foley and said, Speak English, how do you do? And held out his hands. Foley was so taken aback that he shook hands. He then turned to me and, showing his teeth, said, Tobacco. Being rather afraid that he was going to bite me, I quickly took out my pouch and gave him a handful. Then a sergeant, also a nigger, came running up and ordered him off, using most fearful language apparently, and away he went, running like mad. They are fine-looking men. Moro Bay looking very beautiful. I can imagine this a fine watering place after the war, with promenade, gardens, hotels, golf links, etc., Achibaba looked a beautiful bronze color, with patches of green. The Dardanelles show a deep blue color, gradually blending into the purple of the Asiatic side, with its background of mountains. At the entrance, little minesweepers are on duty. The beach is full of naked black and white figures bathing, and the country in the background is dotted with French camps. The firing line in the distance and our guns popping off at intervals and enemy shells now and again whistling overhead. Such is the environment in which we have our bathe. Foley suggests riding back through Sed El Bar, which we do, and we are fortunate in doing so, as eight shells, beautifully placed, exploded just over the road that we otherwise should have taken, and at about the time that we should have been passing along it. 10.30 p.m. Bit of the Turkish attack going on. Heavy rifle fire. 75's very angry and beating all known records of rapid fire. Their song sings me to sleep. I am not afraid of shells when I am sleeping. End of section 8、Section 9 of Gallipoli Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 9. June 2nd to 14th, 1915. June 2nd. After issue, go down on beach to our train office, which is now dug in the side of the cliff. It has twice been moved, each time further and further round the cliff on the right of the beach looking seawards. When shelling is on, our train office soon becomes full of passing officers, reminding me of a crowded pavilion at a cricket match when rain stops the play. Just as the pavilion empties as the rain stops, so does our train office when the shelling stops. Then, all the morning, there calls a continual stream of officers, royal engineers, ordnance, supply, artillery, and regimental, presenting their representative indents for transport, which the adjutant has difficulty with, in mathematically fitting in the detailing of transport to satisfy their demands with available wagons. 
it is a job that requires tact and organization officers also call who come just to pass the time of day and exchange rumors or beach gossip as we call it the circulation of rumors is the best entertainment that we have and though ninety-five per cent of them are estranged from truth by a large margin yet life would be doubly as dull as it is without them they are always listened to with great interest though before they are heard listeners know they are going to be miles off the target of truth and if a man who has achieved a reputation for carrying with him the latest and most interesting beach gossip fails any morning in producing any he causes really keen disappointment this morning we hear that the turks are starved have no clothes are almost at the last gasp for ammunition and only require one more hard knock before they retreat precipitously to lines which they have prepared well beyond the slopes on the other side of achi baba the navy then tells us that once achi baba is in our hands we command the narrows chanak fort will be shelled to a pile of bricks and stones the fleet will make a dash up the straits into the marmora and will arrive before constantinople in three days after a heavy bombardment of this city the goal of our ambitions we will attack the turkish army now starved and demoralized beyond recovery they will be beaten and will make unconditional surrender the peninsula will be ours the dardanelles will be open russia and the allies will link hands and the war will end six months after in glorious victory for our cause and confusion to our enemies we drink in minor rumors day by day that are given as irrefutable evidence in support of these prophecies we are buoyed up in hope and spirits thereby and ourselves spread the rumors to those of our friends who still remain pessimistic i go up to the main supply depot and there having by now been given a reputation for carrying good and juicy rumors i cheer them up by the news that achi will be ours by june thirtieth smart one of the officers there who was in the retreat from mons makes me a bet and the stake is a nice ruler that he has on his desk i promptly book the bet i go up to brigade and have tea and supply them with the latest rumors june third it is very windy today and is blowing nearly a gale and wind on the tip of this peninsula is an unpleasant element to be up against in consequence the beach is smothered with dust and clouds of it fly in all directions covering everybody and everything while issuing shells burst on the crest of the high ground at the back of the beach steadily all the time and nearer inland puffs of shrapnel are visible they cannot reach us here with shrapnel thank goodness shrapnel is so comprehensive a lucky shell comes to within ten yards of our depot, kills a man, a passer-by, outright, wounds a sailor, and slightly wounds my butcher in the knee. I ride up to brigade with Phillips. General Doran shows us map of our objective, and carefully marks thereon where rations are to be dumped tomorrow night, for tomorrow is to be the day of an attack upon our part to take Achi. If successful, then, the beginning of the end of the show will be in sight. No news from outside world, and a great scarcity of papers. Reading a paper about a month old is now a great luxury. In the evening, Williams and Phillips and myself borrow a boat from a military liaison officer and have a short row round. It makes splendid exercise, and the scenes on shore are very interesting. Why did not we think of it before? When they shell the beach, all we have to do is get into a boat and row out to sea, and then watch the fun. Surely a submarine would not trouble to torpedo us, and it would be a shell with our name and address on that would hit us. We pass a submarine, British, marked B-9, a very small one. An officer is in the conning tower and says good evening to us. We chat, and he invites us on board. Two sailors hold our little boat while we clumsily climb onto the submarine's slippery back. We climb down a perpendicular iron ladder. 
through a hole not much larger than a coal chute to a cellar under a street. Inside we find only one chamber, awfully cramped and small. At one end of this sleep the men, and at the other two officers. The chamber provides quarters for men and officers alike, and engine room, ward room, and ante room all in one, like Dan Lino's one-roomed house. In Dan Lino's words, if you want to go into the drawing room, you stay where you are. I am shown the working of the engines, and try to look wisely at the intricate host of levers and brass things, but really can understand nothing at all of what the officer is talking about. I am shown how a torpedo is fired. You pull a thing out, and she shoots. Phillips appears to know all about it, though, but he doesn't really. I look through the periscope, turn the lens round, and suddenly, before my eyes, I see V Beach and Sed El Bar in vivid detail. What joy it must be to spot a Hun battleship and see her effectively hit. The officer then invites us to sit down and call for drinks. I gasp. We never heard of such things on shore. An attentive army batman, smiling benevolently, brings along about half a dozen bottles and glasses, the officer apologizes for not having much choice. Is he pulling our legs? What perfectly charming beings these naval fellows are. I choose sherry. Williams gets chatty about the Middlesex yeomanry. The Middlesex yeomanry always comes into Williams' conversation when he gets chatty, but I can't connect this regiment with submarines at the moment. I have two glasses, and we rise to go. Our perfectly delightful host expresses regret that we must go, and invites us again in the near future. Up the perpendicular iron steps we climb. Phillips, leading, puts his heavy boot in my face. It seems a long way up those steps. Up in the cool air, with the breeze blowing in my face, the deck of the submarine seems much narrower than when we first came on board. I look at the little boat, gently heaving in the water alongside, and take one cautious step onto one of its seats, and with one foot in the boat and one on the submarine, I turn to thank my host again. The little boat falls with the swell of the sea, and I promptly sit down very hard into her. All aboard, we row back merrily. Here the two shells have arrived on the beach during our absence. Shells? Pooh, that's nothing. We don't worry about shells now. I swear I had only two sherries, but I am very empty inside, and the cool air, after a stuffy atmosphere, yes, even a padre might feel like that. June 4th. I awake and rise early. Today is the battle, and tonight we shall be probably feeding our troops in or beyond Crithia. Today will probably be a great day for our arms. I get my issuing over early and ride up to brigade headquarters and see Usher, asking him if he has any further instructions. All the arrangements are complete, and I hope that I shall have to take the rations up to or beyond Crithia, for then we shall have tasted complete victory. I see General Doran, who is hard at work, Two officers of the Egyptian army arrive and talk a while with me. I learn that they have landed only this morning. They are dressed very smartly. Polished Sam Brown, revolver, smart tunic, and breeches and boots. But I think they are making a mistake. They look like the pictures of a military tailor's advertisement. Most officers of the infantry dress like the men to lessen the chances of an enemy sniper getting them. I get back to W Beach at 10.30 a.m. and see the Implacable and Albion coming slowly in with destroyers and submarines all around each ship, jealously guarding them from submarines' attacks. A French battleship, I think the St. Louis, is off V Beach. Destroyers are on the patrol as usual, searching for the dreaded submarine enemy. Three hospital ships are now in. 11 a.m. The French 75s start the music, bursting out into a roar of anger. Shortly after, all our shore batteries join in, and the 60-pounders make our ears feel as if they would burst until we get used to it. The bombardment increases. 
the battleships and destroyers now join in with all their guns. The noise is infernal after the quiet that we have been used to. I go up to the high ground at the back of W Beach, lie down in a trench, and watch the show through strong glasses. Only a few are with me in the trench. Next to me is Bettelheimer, our liaison officer. He speaks Turkish like a native and is a very charming and decent old boy. Tremendous shelling now going on, and it seems to grow more and more intense. Hundreds of shells bursting along the Turkish positions. Turkish artillery replies furiously, mostly with shrapnel, all along our trenches. No shells come on the beaches. Hundreds of white puffs of shrapnel burst all along the line, and fountain-like spurts of black and yellow smoke, followed by columns of earth, are thrown into the air, ending in a fog of drifting smoke and dust. 12 noon. The bombardment slackens and almost dies away suddenly, and I hear a faint cheer, but searching the line carefully with my glasses can see no signs of life. After a short pause, the bombardment bursts again, even more intensely, and then slackens, and our guns increase the range. I can see three armored cars on the right of our center, which before I had not noticed, one behind the other, each one a short distance to the right of the one in front, moving slowly along the flat ground on either side of the Sedel Bar Road and they actually pass over our front line and creep up to the Turkish front, driving backwards. They halt, and I see the spurts of flame coming from their armored turrets as their machine guns open fire. After about ten minutes, I see the car furthest behind move back to our line, now driving forwards, and after a while the remaining two follow. Our shells burst thickly, smothering the Turkish first and second lines and all the way up the slopes of Achi Baba. I see our men in the center leap from the trenches, and the sun glistens on their bayonets. I see them run on in wave after wave, some falling and remaining lying on the grass like sacks of potatoes. I can see nothing on the left. Now I see the French on the hill on the right of our line, and the hill is covered with dark figures rushing forward. The din and roar continues, and I am called away to my dump. 2 p.m. Rumor hath it that we have taken the first two lines of trenches. The armored cars return to their dugout garage, one with one man wounded inside. 4.30 p.m. Prisoners come marching down the beach under escort. Big hardy chaps in ill-fitting khaki clothes and many with cloth helmets on their heads, looking rather like the paper hats I used to make when a kid. 6 p.m. I go up to see the quartermasters, to pass on instructions that rations tonight will be dumped at the same place as last, namely at the ruined house in front of Pink Farm. And so we cannot have advanced much. I meet a wounded Royal Naval Division officer, and he tells me that the French have been forced to give way on the right, and that his division immediately on their left, having advanced, are, in consequence, rather hung between the devil and the deep sea. I stop and look through Butler's strong telescope, and see in front of Crithia before a green patch, which we on the beach call the cricket pitch, little figures digging in hard at a new line. 9 p.m. Rifle fire still intense and shore batteries going at it all out. The battleships have gone home to bed. Achi Baba looks more formidable than ever. 11 p.m. Steady rifle fire going on. We have advanced some 500 yards in center and are holding the ground won. The French have not advanced. I learn that when our bombardment suddenly stopped shortly after noon and when our infantry raised a cheer, the enemy stood right up on the fire steps of their parapets, preparing to meet their charge. Our infantry did not leave their trenches. Instead, our machine guns got on to the Turks, waiting exposed, and bagged many by their fire. June 5th, 6 a.m. Steady rifle firing still continues, having gone on all night. Noon. Road of French submarine with Phillips, Williamson, and Foley and, after pulling round, looking interested, are invited on board. 
Phillips has one foot on the slippery back of the submarine and one foot on the boat rocking in the sea when a dog comes rushing along the deck of the submarine barking furiously. Pained expression on Phillips' face, a study. Dog held back by a French sailor. Most interesting on board the submarine. Engines and mechanical gear a marvelous piece of work. Very interesting looking through the periscope. Two charming officers, having lunch in a dear little cabin, talked to us. Submarine four times as big as the British one that we went aboard two days ago. Hear that Prosser and Wyman, friends of mine in the Hampshires, have been hit and are on hospital ships. Damned fine chaps. Hear later that Bush of Worcesters, another friend and a splendid fellow, has gone, blown to bits by a shell while leading a charge yesterday. Fine man. He had been wounded and had been awarded the military cross at the landing. Also, the two Jippy officers who reported at brigade headquarters when I was there yesterday have gone, killed while leading their new companies. This happens after every battle. One makes friends, such fine friends, and one is always suddenly losing them, leaving such gaps as sometimes makes one wish that one could follow them but it is against tradition of the service to be morbid about it, and so we carry on, knowing that those who have gone west would, if they were still with us, be cheery, brave, cool, and efficient at their respective jobs. 4 p.m. Go up to Brigade Headquarters with O'Hara. Leave the horses at Pink Farm and walk to Headquarters. Find them all up at an observation post, just behind the firing line, which has moved forward after yesterday's battle. The commanding Royal Engineers, 29th Division, joins us, a most unconcerned individual. He goes on up across country. O'Hara waits a bit to give some instructions and then goes on, and I follow. After a bit across the country, with a few overs flying about, overs are bullets which have missed their target, but which are still traveling at a high velocity, we dip down into a gully and follow its winding path for about ten minutes to the observation post, where commanding Royal Engineers and the rest of the staff have already arrived, bullets fairly whizzing overhead. Usher tells me to step closer to the side, which I promptly do, on account of a few bullets which are on the descent. Very interesting there. Telephone and signalers busy, and orderlies arriving and departing. A few shells scream overhead. We all have tea and chat. Thompson looks rather ill and worried. All the time we are having tea, there is a constant ping of bullets over the dugout. Look through observation hole and have a perfect view of yesterday's battlefield. The Worcesters advanced and are holding their position. They are exposed to enfilading fire as well as frontal fire from the Turks, but are digging in to protect themselves. They are very near Krithia, digging on that green patch of land which we call the cricket pitch. Krithia looks very formidable the closer one gets to it. Turkish trenches are very deep, with good dugouts for sleeping and very deep, wide communication trenches. Hence we hardly ever see a Turk. Their firing line and sleeping dugouts are actually boarded. 11.30 p.m. As I turn into bed, there is firing all along the line. Turkish counter-attack going on. Our casualties yesterday very heavy, but Turks colossal. The Gobin fired over to us today with not much damage. Shells did not reach the beach. I hear that Colonel Williams, or General as I have up to now been calling him, on account of his having acted as Brigadier of the 88th, up to the arrival of General Doran, was wounded in yesterday's battle. On General Doran's arrival, he went to the 2nd Hampshires, his regiment, and took command. When the moment for the infantry attack arrived, they leapt over and, in an incredibly short space of time, had taken their first objective. Colonel Williams, with his adjutant, then followed over to make his headquarters in the newly won trench. On inspecting it and making arrangements for the attack on the second objective, he came back to his old headquarters to telephone the result, an orderly accompanying him. Halfway back, a Turk leapt up from behind a bush, ten yards away from him, and fired his rifle. 
the bullet instantly killing Colonel Williams' orderly. Colonel Williams drew his revolver, took deliberate aim, and the Turk, also taking deliberate aim, leveled his rifle at the same time. For a second an old-time duel might have been taking place in the middle of an historic battleground which was lately no man's land. Both fire. The Turk falls dead, and Colonel Williams is wounded in the left arm. That Turk was a brave man, but I think Colonel Williams is a braver. June 6th, 7 a.m. Shells come over on east side of the beach from a four-gun Turkish battery, and big stuff, too, about six inch. 7.30 a.m. More arrive in middle of our camp on the west side of the battery. We take cover under a cliff. I, wanting to get down to train office, go up a cliff and just about to descend the steps when the shriek of one is heard, by which I could tell it is close to me. I fall flat into a hole on one side of the cliff, and it passes over the cliff and bursts on the beach, killing gunner sergeant major. Ugh, how they shriek! Heavy firing continued on left all night. We lost a trench, but regained it. A Turkish padre is a prisoner on the beach today. He looks rather a dear old chap with quite a benevolent expression. 6 p.m. I go up to brigade with Carver in the afternoon, leaving our horses at Pink Farm. My old mare knows Pink Farm well now. When I dismounted today and let go the reins, she walked over to the tree that I always tie her to, under cover of the farm, quite on her own. At headquarters, bullets are zipping over more frequently than I have ever known them to do before. Waiting to see General Doran, who should I see strolling calmly across the country but my friend Dent of the Innes Killens? The last time we had met was at a gramophone dance at some common friend's home in Edgebaston. We have a chat about those days and ask each other for news of the partners we used to dance with. All the time, ping, ping, bullets fly about. But as he does not seem to mind, I take my cue from him and try not to mind either. Besides, it would be rather nice to get a cushy one in the arm. 11 p.m. We are being shelled by a battery from Kumkali. This is the first time we have been shelled at night. They did not reach our side of the beach, and as Phillips says, he can read the mind of the Turkish gunner. He is always saying this, and I have great confidence in him, and that we are off the target. I go to sleep without anxiety. June 7th. Heavy gun with high explosive kicking up a devil of a row all day, but not reaching the beach, bursting in the valley on the way to brigade headquarters. Plenty of artillery dueling all day. Asiatic battery fires on transports and hits one several times, setting her alight, and she now has a heavy list on. French crew rush to boats and clear off quick. British torpedo destroyer goes alongside, puts crew on board the transport, and they put out the fire. All transports move further out to sea, and Turkish battery shuts up. I have to feed the prisoners, and a party of them come up to our depot under a guard to draw rations. Transport is provided by two general service wagons. There are ten of them in the party, and one of their non-commissioned officers. They fall in in two ranks, and wherever I move, they follow me with their eyes, I then motion to their non-commissioned officer to load up a certain number of boxes. He gives an order in Turkish, and they load up in remarkably quick time. They are then fallen in by their non-commissioned officer, and one of them, who is rather dilatory, is pushed into his place by the others. Marching in front of their general service wagons, they go back to their barbed wire enclosure. They appear most anxious to do the right thing. Many of them were raggedly clothed, with their boots almost out at heel. No shelling during night. June 8th. Hardly any Turkish shelling this morning. Went up to brigade headquarters. While there, Usher, the brigade major, shows me the wires that were received and sent to and from the brigade headquarters during the battle of June 4th, and they make interesting reading, telling a grim story in short, pithy, matter-of-fact sentences. Troops now consolidating line and making it firm. The Lancashire Fusiliers successfully took a trench last night and straightened the line somewhat, Askold popping off on the Asiatic side to silence Turkish batteries. My friend Dent of the Innes Killens 
hit last night by a spent bullet in the gully. But I think not seriously. Grogan, of the King's Own Scottish Borderers, a delightful chap, was killed by a shell on June 4th. Such a splendid fellow. My mare, looking very fit now, gets quite frisky when I ride out to the front every morning, and is getting better at jumping across trenches. June 9th blowing a great gale down the peninsula, and the dust is perfectly awful. I have never experienced such a wind, and yet an aeroplane goes up, but for a bit is absolutely stationary, and soon has to land. Turks in a very strong position on the left. Country lends itself naturally to defenses. Ride up to line with Phillips and Way. Coming back, Way's horse landed out at my mare, kicking me in the shin, making a nasty place. My leg is now bandaged, and I limp rather badly. Very little firing today. Asiatic battery woke us up at 5.30 a.m. and tried to bombard transports, all shells falling into the sea. Rode out to sea and went on board submarine B-10 with Phillips and saw North. Actually had a drink. Also, they have a gramophone, and it was absolutely gorgeous listening to familiar music, carrying us back to our past peaceful existence once more. As we go up on deck to take our leave, a torpedo boat circles round us, a signaler wagging to us. The signal is taken by one of the crew of the submarine, transmitted to the commander, and reads, Anything we can do for you? He replies, No thanks. Any news? and the torpedo boat destroyer signals back some news that has just come through of progress made by our force in Mesopotamia on the road to Baghdad. We are told that daily torpedo boat destroyers come along and offer to do little jobs for the officers on board of the submarine, and sometimes send over delicacies such as roast, fowl, hot, etc. June 10th, 5.30 a.m. Shells popping off at shipping again and one hits the beach. Also, the Turks in front get very busy for four hours bombarding our position. I believe that they really think that they are going to push us into the sea. 5.30 p.m. I walk along the road at the foot of the cliff towards X Beach. The road is now a good one, and the transport is making continual traffic up and down. It is very convenient for transport can move not only under cover from the enemy, but in safety to a certain extent, for up to now but few shells drop over the cliff onto this road. I know a place, however, from which they can shell this road and the slope of the cliff, and that is on their extreme right, overlooking the sea. From there they can look along parts of the road and side of the cliff, which is in view of their trenches, though other parts by the coast, jutting out a little for small distances, are under perfect cover, and, in fact, quite safe. Passing the Greek labor camp, I continue my walk to X Beach, which is about half as wide as W, and a quarter as deep. Instead of the ground sloping up gently at the back, as is the case at W Beach, it rises at a steep angle to the top of the cliffs. Unlike W Beach, it comes constantly under shrapnel shell fire, but receives very few heavy shells, and is far more under cover than is W. The road to Gully Beach, at the foot of the cliffs of X Beach, is not finished yet, and is in a very rough state. Just before I reach Gully Beach, I come upon brigade headquarters, dug in at the side and foot of the cliff. The battalions are dug in, in as much regimental order as possible, along the sides of the cliff, which are higher here than further down the peninsula, and more under cover. Shells now and again burst, shrapnel chiefly, on the top of the cliff, and a few come over and fall with a big splash into the sea, but none burst on the slopes of the cliff. I hear, though, that one man yesterday was cut in half by a shell while bathing, a horrid sight. This camp on the slopes of the cliff is now the rest camp of the division, and while two brigades are in the line, one brigade is at rest. At rest, that is, from bullets, and, if they keep under the cliff, from shells, but not at rest from digging fatigues. The road has to be made, and so have the dugouts on the side of the cliff. They get good bathing, though, 
and bathing out here beats any that I have ever struck. I talked to the only two officers left of those who were with the Worcesters in England. They appear very breezy and bright. We are hard at work building our men's bivouac, which is in the form of a funk hole. We are digging it in the side of the cliff from the top, and it will be entered by about ten steps leading down to a terrace, which will run on the outside of the house, dug into the cliff's side, under a sloping roof made with a sailcloth. It will be so situated that, should shells come our way, they will either burst on top, where our old bivouac still is, or fly over the cliff and burst in the road below or in the sea. We are modeling ours on a bivouac of some Royal Naval Division officers about fifty yards further up the cliff side. On their terrace they have all their meals, including dinner at night, which is a luxury, with the sound of the waves washing against the road below and the view of Imbros in the distance. In their dugout house at night they go to sleep with more feeling of security than I have at present. I share a tent with Phillips. Just as I am turning in, Way comes in to say that Asia has just started sending over high explosives. None reach us, but they make a devil of a row, and I fall asleep feeling rather uncomfortable. June 12th. Woke up at 5.30 a.m. by shelling. Shells from Asia nearly reaching a big transport that had come in overnight on the opposite of our bivy. Wind and flies as bad as ever, and it is getting very hot. Dust smothering everything. Turks reported to be sick of the war and rumored to be individually seeking a chance to give themselves up. But it is still a long, long way to Achi Baba. That must be taken first. Cliff on the west side up to Gully Beach, covered with troops, looking like a lot of khaki ants from a distance, all back resting. They have to keep well under cover of cliffs, as they would soon be shelled. Major Lang, Worcesters, killed in the last battle. He was the officer I saw in the trenches when I went up for Bush's letters. Bush also killed. This side of the war is the most difficult to bear. Just heard the brigade are moving back to trenches after three days' rest. June 13th. Perfect day. Wind dropped, but still a slight breeze. Have got into our new bivy on side of cliff. Went up to brigade headquarters in front of Pink Farm. All well. Here they are moving forward tomorrow three hundred yards, creeping nearer to our goal. General Doran gone back to England ill after last battle. Lieutenant Colonel Cayley, late officer commanding of the Worcesters, now acting brigadier general. Asiatic Annie popped off and dropped shells nicely on Crithia Road, on spot that I and my mare had passed five minutes before, and she sends some nasty ones. Also, she is dropping high explosives in French camp in Morto Bay. I don't think I shall bathe there for a bit. 5.30 a.m. French aeroplane falls into sea. Pilot and observer can be seen sitting on top of wing. Destroyers come to the rescue and also several motorboats. Officer picked up and aeroplane taken in tow. End of section 9. Section 10 of Gallipoli Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 10, June 15th to 26th, 1915. June 15th. Many reinforcements have arrived and troops are everywhere now, covering the Hellas Plateau up to Pink Farm with their camps, dug in in trenches called rest camps. There is not much rest for them today, for Asia as well as Achi is making them their target. As I essay to go up to brigade headquarters, I find the West Krithia being shelled. It is almost impossible to ride across country on account of the camps, and one has to keep to the roads, so I postpone my journey to later on in the day. I get laughed at for this, but
but it is the first time that I have started to go to brigade headquarters and funked it. I reply that if they would like a nice fat shell in their tummies, they can ride up the West Krithia Road now. However, they are only ragging, and any man who looks for shells is a fool. We are being shelled very badly from Asia today. They appear to have six big guns over there, somewhere opposite Morto Bay, and no doubt they have observation posts at Kumkali or Yenisher, and can see all that we are doing. We must make perfect targets. Their shells are reaching all over the peninsula now, and one fell right over our bivy, exploding in the shallow water of the sea, killing a quantity of fish. These shells from Asia are doing a lot of damage. Every time they come, men lose their lives or get wounded, while the casualties among the animals are keeping the hands of the veterinary services full. A six-inch shell came right in the supply depot this afternoon, but did not explode, yet it caused a sad casualty. It struck the leg of an Army Service Corps driver, a boy of twenty, and severed it clean from his body. He evidently did not realize it, for he made an attempt to stand up and hold back his mule, which was bolting with fright. But, of course, he immediately fell back. Shortly after, he died. They shelled us at intervals until dusk, just two or three at a time, and at intervals of half an hour or so, keeping us on tenter hooks. Phew! Give me the nice deep trenches when this goes on, where one walks about in comparative safety. There is no cover on W Beach. You hear the distant boom, and then fall and grip the bosom of Mother Earth as a frightened child does its mother. Then get up and go on with your job but not so the Army Service Corps driver. His order is to stand by his mule on W Beach, that bull's eye of a target, and I hope that many of these drivers are not forgotten when names are called to be sent in for honorable mention. Riding and driving their mules at the same time, they are prevented from hearing the horrid shriek of the onrushing shell by the loud sound that the wheels of their general service wagons make, and only when they see and hear a nerve-wracking explosion, or hear metal whizzing past their heads, making a sound like a propeller of an airplane, do they realize that they are under fire and in instant danger of being blown to bits. Yet they must not leave their mules. They must get the animals, wagons, and themselves under cover as soon as possible. As soon as possible? And that may mean ten minutes and ten minutes of hell. I have not yet seen a driver leave his mules, but I have seen several wounded, and one or two lads killed. But, c'est la guerre, it is only the Army Service Corps quietly doing its job. No glory and honor, but ask an infantryman in the line here if he would change places with an Army Service Corps driver on the beach, and he will say that he prefers to stay in his trench and take his chance when the moment for the leap over the parapet comes. But the Army Service Corps never talk much. They just do their job, and when cursed for this, that, and other trivial matters, say, Sorry, we will see if the matter can be improved. Improved? We are the finest fed army in the world. Where is the room for improvement? At dusk I go up to brigade headquarters with my staff sergeant and overtake a draft for the Hampshires on the way to join their battalions. I meet Usher, and he conducts them to their new trenches, and asks me to take Major Beckwith, who is just back, having now recovered from a wound in his leg received on April 28th, after he had earned the Distinguished Service Order, up to Brigade, which I do, and I wait and have a drink with General Cayley. There are not many bullets about. Starlights go up continually from our and the enemy's front line. It is a weary walk back, and I wish that I had ridden. Millward, naval landing officer, came to dinner last night. He was the landing officer on the Dongola, and had the job of sending us off to our doom on April 25th. Also Warburton, off a submarine. He was with Holbrook when he got the Victoria Cross. June 16th. Not very heavy shelling this morning. A few rounds near our depot at issuing time. No shells from Asia. The French have been touching them up a bit over there, and probably they are shifting their position. 
The French are hot stuff in getting on to the enemy's positions. No letters, no rumors, and life very monotonous. Large numbers of men going off sick with dysentery. In the afternoon they start shelling again up the Crithia Road, and again I postpone my visit to Brigade Headquarters until nightfall, and ride up this time. First time my mare has been to Pink Farm by night, and she does not like it at all. There are plenty of bullets by night, and but few by day. They continually flatten themselves against the ruined walls of Pink Farm. The Turk appears to enjoy sitting in his trench, cocking his rifle up, and spraying with bullets the road up which he knows transport will come. Riding back just halfway to W Beach from Pink Farm, I see a bright flash to my left on the shores of Asia, and a few seconds after hear the deep boom of Asiatic Annie, a shriek and a dull thud on W Beach. This is the first shell from Asiatic Annie sent over by night, and if we are going to get them by night, our life will be pretty poisonous. No place on this little tip of land is safe from shells now, and this afternoon the ships lying off have to clear away. To see a battleship now is a rare event, on account of the constant fear of submarines. June 17th. Coming back from issuing this morning to my bivvy on the cliff, I hear ship's horns tooting continuously, and running to the edge of the cliff I see a supply ship, which is lying immediately opposite, hoist a red flag, being the signal that submarines are about. Destroyers, minesweepers, and small pinnaces from shore put out to the transport and cruise round and round her. I see distinctly a shadow glide along on the water on the side of the ship furthest from us, looking like the shadow from a cloud in the sky, and then it disappears. Men on board are all around the ship, peering over the side. Then, suddenly, I see, bobbing about in the water, like a big fisherman's float, the red tip of a torpedo. Someone on a trawler shouts through a megaphone to the other craft, Look out for that torpedo! A small rowboat from the trawler puts out, rows up to the bobbing object in the water, fastens a rope round its nose, and rows away, towing it after them. On nearing number one pier, the pier nearest to us, a military landing officer standing on the pierhead shouts, Is the pistol head on? A reply from the boat says, Yes. And the military landing officer shouts back, Well, take the damn thing away and sink it. The oarsmen then head their boat out to sea, and after some arrangement which I cannot see through my glasses, sink the torpedo. Ordnance get to hear of this and are annoyed, for they would prize such a find as one of the latest German torpedoes. It was quite fifteen feet long, with a red-painted nose and a long, shining, bronze-colored body. Later we hear that the submarine had fired two torpedoes, and by being too close to her quarry, missed. By being too close also, she was missed by the destroyers, for they at the time were making circles round the transport at about the distance of the usual effective range of a torpedo. Shortly after, the supply ships were driven off out to sea by the Asiatic guns. Our 60-pounder guns are firing hard over to Asia. I hope they have got the range of their guns. Our bivouac, unfortunately, is in the direct line of their fire, and as each shot is fired, we can't help jumping, and our bivvy shakes its flimsy walls. Three shells from Asia pitched right into our hospital on the edge of the cliff at the left of W Beach, looking seawards, killing two orderlies and wounding six. Yet the doctors calmly went on their work of bandaging and dressing. The hospital is on a bad site, for it is only divided by a road from the little village of Marquis, forming the Ordnance Depot. At 8.30 p.m. I go up to Brigade Headquarters with an orderly, and leave the horses at Pink Farm, and walk across that 250 yards with bullets whistling more than usual, for tonight the Turks appear more energetic with rifle fire. It is an eerie sensation walking across there in the dark when many bullets are about, walking very fast, almost counting one's steps, and getting nearer and nearer to the little light on the side of the hill. Had a chat there for twenty minutes in the dugout with General Cayley and his staff, and had a drink. Rather a nice picture, 
with the candles and the cheery officers sitting round, outside the sound of bullets whistling continuously. I say good night and go out, and find my orderly crouching pretty well down in a dugout, and he says he thinks we had better hurry out, as it is a bit hot, and as he says so, ping goes a bullet between us. But the bullets do not give me the fear that those horrible high explosive shells from Asia do. A moon is getting up, and so we are able to trot back smartly. The scene on the Krithia road at night is just what I imagined in past life war to be. The wagons trekking up to the trenches, with, of course, no lights, and troops of all kinds moving up and down. In the distance, star shells shooting up and sailing gently down, illuminating the country as light as day, and as one gets nearer to the firing line, the crackle of musketry gets louder and louder, and during the final walk of three hundred yards from Pink Farm to headquarters, the song of bullets flying past one makes one very much alive. Overhead a perfect sky, and myriads of stars looking down on a great tragedy with a certain amount of comic relief. These days we wish for more comic relief than we are getting. June 18th. This morning Asia's guns have not worried us so far, but the batteries in front of Achi Baba are very active, and are worrying the troops in the valley very much. The sound of bursting shrapnel reminds me of the spit and snarls of angry cats. Our artillery is quiet. Rumor says that another enemy submarine has been accounted for, but the one that came in yesterday morning is still at large, and consequently our fleet is unable to come and help us. At two o'clock, HMS Prince George is sighted off Imbros, surrounded by twelve destroyers and preceded by seventeen minesweepers. It was a very impressive sight to see, all those destroyers and sweepers jealously guarding the great ship from submarine attack. She takes up a position opposite the Asiatic coast, well out from the mouth, and then opens fire with all big guns on the Turkish batteries on Asia in position opposite Morto Bay. We enjoy seeing the pasting that she gives them, her big guns rapidly roaring away and belching forth spurts of flame and buff-colored smoke. Everybody imagines that every Turkish gun must be knocked out. After four hours she leaves with her retinue of smaller ships. Half an hour after, one big gun on the Asiatic side opens fire onto V Beach, and simultaneously a heavy Turkish attack on our left starts, supported by a tremendous bombardment from Turkish artillery. The fight lasted all night, and ended about six in the morning. Their infantry left their trenches very half-heartedly, and our machine guns accounted for a heavy toll of enemy casualties. June 19th. We gave way at a part of our line last night, but regained the ground later in the early morning, and our line is still intact, and as we were. We lost heavily, but Turkish losses were enormous. Captain Usher, my staff captain, was killed this early morning in the trenches by shrapnel, and I feel his loss awfully. He was always so charming to me. It's the good uns that go, as Wilkie Bard says. I am sure this war is too terrible to last long. It is simply wholesale butchery, and humanity will cry out against it soon. At 11.30, an exceptionally heavy shell came over from Asia, a high explosive, and fairly shook the earth. Two minutes after, two more came, and every living soul rushed for cover. Then for three hours they pasted us. Over they came, one after the other, with terrific shrieks and deafening explosions, throwing chunks of hot, jagged-edged metal whizzing in all directions. All the mules and horses, as far as possible, were got under cover, and men rushed to their dugouts. Carver, Way, Davy, Foley, Phillips, and I were under cover of the cliff in our bivy, which cannot be called a dugout, as it is simply a wide platform cut in and built up on the side of the cliff, and in the line of fire between the 60-pounder battery, 25 yards to our west, 
and the Asiatic battery. The sixty-pounders soon opened fire, and then a duel began, and after one or two have pitched first over our bivvy into the sea, and one or two just short, we get nervy and decide to quit. Phillips and Davy made the first dash down the cliff, and the others said they would wait for the next shell. It came shrieking along, burst, and I got up and made a dart down the slope. I was down to the bottom of that cliff in thirty seconds, and found myself with the divisional ammunition column people, and all amongst boxes of high explosive. Ammunition column officers are there, but I begin to think it would have been safer up in the bivvy where the others still were, for they did not follow me. After a lull in the firing, I went up to the cliff, and halfway up they popped off again, and I was fortunate in finding a very safe dugout belonging to Major Horton, and he invited me in with Major Huskisson, Major Shorto, Poole, and Weatherall, and while shells still come over, first bursting on the beach, then in the sea, then on top of our cliff, and then on the high ground on the back of the beach, we have lunch. 7.30 p.m. I am writing this in our bivvy once more, and aeroplanes are up spotting for the 60-pounders. They have just popped off. One almost shakes the cliff when she fires. Asia has answered, but her shell has pitched on the east side of W Beach. The suspense of waiting for these shells is getting on the nerves of us all. What gets on my nerves more than the shells is the losing of the Puka, regular officers of this splendid division, who are so cheery and manly, so reassuring to one and to each other. When they are killed, the stuffing and grit are almost knocked out of you. We four supply officers have been under fire almost every day since April 25th, night and day, and a rest away from it all would be awfully welcome. Yet we pull ourselves together when we realize what the infantry have gone through and are still going through. I hate talking like this. It makes me think I am getting wind up. Fish is plentiful today, killed by Asia's shells, brought in by enterprising Greeks and sold to Tommy's. Excellent eating. June 20th. Last night one Asiatic gun fired over to our camp one high explosive shell every half an hour, but everybody was well dug in and no harm was done. I was sound asleep. This morning Turkish artillery is very active, but Asia's guns are not doing much. We are improving our bivvy, making it possible to do our work without much interruption. It is almost impossible to keep books and organize the feeding of an army with high explosive and other shells dropping around. Lord knows where next. At the supply depot, however, we are very exposed, and it is very trying to stand there issuing day's food and loading up the wagons with shells flying overhead, and therefore I am having a proper dugout made. We have had many casualties there now, and the supply and transport men have absolutely no chance to save themselves when standing in the open with high explosives bursting near. We try and treat it humorously, but it is always a relief when the job is done. This morning my staff sergeant came to me and said, The R.A. have taken shriek of a shell and a bang, during which we both looked over our shoulders. Them supplies to the gully, sir. I reply, all right, and then we both duck behind a biscuit box as another shell comes nearer. Not much use, really, getting behind a box, but it looks safer than nothing at all. As Hislop, our Canadian veterinarian, says, any hole looks good when Asia gets busy. This afternoon I walked along under the cliff to Gully Beach to see my brigade, who have now gone into reserve for a rest. On the way we pass a padre holding evening prayer and preaching a sermon. As I come back, I learn that several shrapnel had burst over the cliff, two officers, one man, and a horse being wounded. A piece had hit the heel of the boot of the padre as he was conducting the service. I spoke to several officers of the Royal Scots, who had been in the fighting two nights ago, during which the Manchester Territorials retired, evacuating two trenches, which the Royal Scots and one company of the Worcesters took back twenty minutes after. Colonel Wilson, officer commanding Royal Scots, has been awarded the Distinguished Service Order for this piece of work. 
bombs were used freely and when the royal scots had got to the foremost trench at one time turks and british both occupied the same trench the turks hastily erecting a barricade in the trench itself to protect them from the royal scots who however quickly drove them out by bombs steele assured me that the turks were using explosive bullets but i doubt this but i do think that they reverse their bullets now and again i notice that his face is pitted with little cuts and I learned that he has suffered this through being in the front line with his regiment in the battle of June 4th, and on reaching their objective, the Turkish trench in front, while hastily helping in the work of building a parapet with sandbags, was struck full in the face by a sandbag, bursting through being struck by machine-gun fire. He is acting adjutant to the regiment. I hear there is to be a French bombardment tonight, followed by an infantry attack. June 21st. 6 a.m. There is a fearful bombardment going on. Every battery on shore is concentrating its gunfire on a Turkish redoubt on the Turkish left, called the Heriko Redoubt, and also on the trenches. The Turkish batteries are replying furiously, but without effect, though Asiatic Annie is rather nasty, her shells falling around the French batteries. One cannot see the effect because of the dust that the shells are kicking up, which is blowing right down to the beach. The 60-pounders on our right, 25 yards away, are joining in with a deafening report. Only one is in this action. The echo of her voice plays ducks and drakes around the coast and the few transports about, getting fainter as the sound dies away. French battleship at mouth of straits firing heavily, destroyers continually patrolling around her. 11 a.m. The infantry attack by the French has started, and there is a report of heavy musketry all along their line. Twelve noon. I can see the French advancing under a perfect hail of shrapnel over the ridge behind de Tott's battery. They are lost to view, and now I can only see hundreds of shells bursting and hear an undertone of musketry. I can see nothing now but dust and smoke. Four p.m. On duty at depot. Fighting died down. Howitzer from Asia firing our way, but cannot reach us. Shells bursting about Hill 138. News that the French have done well and advanced quite a good way. 6 p.m. Asia fires on submarines off W Beach and nearly hits one. They clear off for half an hour and then come back. Perfect weather and fine day for flying. Aeroplanes doing good work, whirring about over Achi Baba and Asia. 7.45 p.m. The Turks are counter-attacking our right in force, but the French, with the support of the 75s, are holding the ground which they have won today, roar of guns growing louder and louder. If the French manage to hold their own, it will considerably lessen the morale of the enemy, and the hill should be taken in the near future, and our own job will be half over. 8.30 p.m. Battle still going on. On beach, Tommy's singing, There's a little gray home in the west. Sun just going down behind Imbros, making most lovely coloring. Sea dead calm, most peaceful scene looking out to sea. But when one turns one's back, one sees a great battle raging three miles inland. Extraordinary contrast. June 22nd. Very hot, but perfect day. French attack successful yesterday. They took two lines of trenches, and so have shortened and strengthened our front. Walked with Phillips and Birch, second in command of another submarine that has just arrived, to Gully Beach, overland, all quiet on front, Turkish artillery dead quiet, but French 75s now and again popping off. Sea Brigade headquarters now in rest on the side of cliffs, and also Essex Regiment. Hear that Revel of the Essex has died of wounds. Ripping young chap. Had a cheery chat with him up at Brigade Headquarters two weeks ago. The 29th Division officers are falling fast now, and we feel their loss terribly. A Taub came over this morning and dropped three bombs, but only hit one man, wounding him slightly, but killed nine horses. I thought I saw the bombs drop quite clearly, as I was watching through glasses, and it was surprising the time that they took to drop. I may have been mistaken, the Taub was about over me, but I thought I saw a pencil line, as it were, drawn against the sky. 
nasty suspense waiting for the things to reach the ground. Officer commanding of the West Lowland Territorial Engineers, killed by shell at Gully yesterday. Very fine chap. 8 p.m. A quiet day. Rumor that we are to expect asphyxiating gas dodge and that we are going to have respirators served out. Unfortunately, the prevailing wind is down the peninsula and in our faces, and we are barely four miles from the Turkish trenches. Beautiful evening, and the sun setting behind Imbros is making most exquisite coloring. June 23, 10.30 a.m. Turks very quiet. French 75s now and again firing. Very hot, fine day. Rode last night to Gully Beach with Carver, round by road on cliffs on W Coast. Beautiful moonlit night. Wagons trekking up and down, and now and again a sentry challenges with his bayonet pointed to the breasts of our horses, which we rein in, at the same time shouting, Friend! Answered by, Pass, friend, all's well. I should like to feel that it really was all well. Enemy aircraft brought down yesterday, falling in Turkish lines. French losses in recent battle, 2,000. Tonight I ride again with Carver to Gully Beach, which is now the home of the 29th Division headquarters. The steep cliffs on either side of the gully are honeycombed with dugouts, each with a little light shining, and in the declining light, with the moon hanging overhead, shining on the sea, it is a very beautiful sight. We had a topping ride back along the road on the edge of the cliff overlooking the calm sea, lit up by silver moonlight. We could see quite plainly enough to canter, and cantering by moonlight in such beautiful surroundings is a unique pleasure. June 24th. Today has been very hot and arid, very fine, and the sea dead calm, but artillery duels have been going on all day. As the French were so successful in their last battle, having captured those trenches and the Heracle Redoubt on their left, thereby straightening and shortening our line, I think there is going to be another general attack for the hill tomorrow, preceded by an exceptionally heavy bombardment. If successful, then the danger of asphyxiating gas attack for the present is over. Went up to brigade headquarters with Phillips. Beautiful moonlight and all quiet on front. Had a nice gallop back on West Crithia Road, but my mare nearly ran away with me. A bit dangerous going, as there were so many shell holes about. Pink Farm and West Crithia Road get so badly dusted with shrapnel all day and every day now that I usually go up by night or early morning to headquarters. June 25th. It is now exactly two months since we landed. Turkish artillery has been fairly active today. It has been very hot, but a beautiful day, and now a most beautiful night, with the sea dead calm. We are having some nice bathing. The fly pest is worse than ever, and is frightfully worrying. The attack is not to come off tomorrow, after all, but Sunday. Today the Lord Nelson, escorted by destroyers, went up the west coast and bombarded some target behind Achi Baba. Shortly after, a column of smoke arose behind the hill, and evidently the Lord Nelson has made good practice. She was shelled by a Turkish field battery, but only two shells burst immediately over her, and hardly did any damage. June 26th. I rose at 5.30 a.m., and getting my mare saddled, rode over to the other side of the beach and woke up Butler, the quartermaster of the Worcesters, who had promised to give me what he called a personally conducted cook's tour of the first-line trenches. We had some hot tea and biscuits and a tot of rum, and then we mounted and started off. My mare was full of the joy of life and very fresh. As we went over the crest on to the west coast road, mist was hanging low on the cliffs and at the foot of Achibaba. Above, the sky was cloudless. The words of Omar came to mind. Awake, for morning in the bowl of night, has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight. I wish the stone would put the Turks to flight. We rode to the gully and then down to the beach. There a priest was preparing an altar on biscuit boxes, and about four hundred troops were waiting to take Holy Communion. We rode up the bed of the gully, and it was the first time that I had been right up. The engineers had made a good road up, 
winding in and out between high, irregular cliffs covered with gorse, and passing little gullies running out of the main one to right and left. All up for about a mile and a half the sides are honeycombed with dugouts for troops to rest after a spell in the trenches, for battery headquarters and signal posts, etc. We passed the headquarters of the 86th Brigade, the latter being dug in in a charming spot a mile up from the beach. Thompson, my late staff captain, was seated on a terrace high up the cliff, shaving and shouted, Good morning to me. Arriving at the head of the gully, we dismount and hand over horses to a groom with instructions to him to take them across country to Pink Farm. We meet Harding, the quartermaster of the Royal Fusiliers. We climb up the right side of the gully, a most beautiful spot which would delight artists, and enter into a trench, over which bullets whiz and now and again shrapnel. Passing along the trench for some way, we turn to the left and go for quite a hundred yards along the communication trench, leading into a maze of trenches, but we are enabled to find our way by directing signboards such as to reserve trenches, to support trenches, to fire trench, and names of units marked on as well. We at last find ourselves in the reserve and have a chat with the Essex. Then we wend our way and pass along an uninhabited trench, an evidently disused communication trench, and come on what is literally the emblem of death grinning at us. We see a grinning skull with almost all the flesh rotted off it, a bundle of rags, a hand, and two lower parts of legs with boots and putties intact. Such a sight in earlier life would have filled me with horror, but I look upon such sights now as one would look upon a ruined house. We come to a dugout in the support trenches and are asked to wait as two men have just been hit by shrapnel. Two reserve heavy artillery men tell us that at the end of the next communication trench there is a naval 12-pounder gun that had opened fire that morning on what was thought to be a poisonous gas factory in a nullah in the Turkish lines, and that a Turkish battery had found our gun out and was shelling it. The two men who happened to be here had been hit. Shelling seems to have ceased, and one reserve heavy artillery man said to the other, Come on, Bill. If we are going to get it, we are going to get it. This sounded good philosophy, and so we followed them. One of them shouldered a sack of food, and the other two jars of rum. Round the corner we passed the two wounded men, one wounded in the arm and the other badly in the shoulder, but both seemed quite cheerful about it. We went along the communication trench, on and on, until I really thought that the damn trench would lead into the Turkish lines, and then it gradually got shallower and shallower, until we found ourselves in the open, but under cover of a rise, which was more or less protected from Turkish fire. Then suddenly we came on this twelve-pounder gun, and saw three gunners crouching in a dugout. The two gunners who were leading the way went off down another trench hastily, pointing the way for us to follow to the fire trenches, and we nipped over that open space in double-quick time, I taking a heap of used cartridges in my stride, and at last we found ourselves in the well-dug-out front-line fire trenches, where we found the Worcesters. We had a chat with the officers. Shortly after our arrival, shelling began again with that twelve-pounder for a target. They put salvo after salvo over at the place we had passed. It was rather interesting watching the shelling from our part of the trench, and the sergeant major seemed to be thoroughly enjoying it. We have a look at the front trenches, which are very well made, with high parapets of sandbags, iron loopholes and periscopes, and nice little dugouts for officers' messes and for men to sleep in, and kitchens, larders, stores, etc. All the time bullets whiz over or thud against the sandbags, but one feels quite safe there, although only a hundred yards away from the Turks. It is a bit dangerous going along the communication trenches by day, as in places one can be seen, and from there can see the enemy, they being so shallow. We soon got back along the beastly long communicating trench to the reserve, another one further along to the one we came, then to the support line and up out into a nullah, and following that along, we came to the open place into which several nullahs run, known as Clapham Junction, which often gets shelled pretty badly, 
and always under fire from overs. Thence on to the main Crithia road and across country to the Pink Farm, where we found our horses waiting. They were shelling the West Crithia road, and so we cut across country to the West Coast road and cantered home in fine style, arriving back to breakfast at 9.30 a.m. Not much artillery fire came from the Turks during the day, but the 75s were steadily plugging them in. End of section 10. Section 11 of Gallipoli Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 11. June 27th to July 3rd, 1915. June 27th. The attack is to take place tomorrow. I rode up to Brigade Headquarters this morning. They were shelling a bit, but not much. Today is very quiet, but we are steadily sending shells over. Asiatic Battery seems to have been withdrawn, but there is a very big gun somewhere that sends a six-inch over now and again to the neighborhood of Pink Farm, but it does not reach the beaches. In coming back from Headquarters this morning, shrapnel began to burst over Pink Farm and behind, and I made my mare do her best gallop away, and, in order to keep off the road, cut to the right across country. We got amongst a maze of disused trenches, which she absolutely refused to jump, and, to top it all, she kept getting her legs entangled in telephone wires laid along the ground, causing me to continually get off to disentangle her. She is an awful fool over these things, and those damned shells seemed to come nearer and nearer every minute. When I did get on the road, I made her gallop as she has never galloped before. June 28th. A beautiful summer morning. This morning is the morning of a battle. We are going to try to take a Turkish redoubt on our extreme left, and to push our line forward on the left so as to curl somewhat round Krithia. We call the redoubt the Boomerang Fort. HMS Talbot comes in with destroyers and minesweepers, and a monitor, the Abercrombie, I think, and they take up positions off Gully and Y beaches on the west coast. A bombardment begins at 9 a.m. as I am issuing rations, the Talbot and two or three destroyers hurling over their large shells in an enfilading fire onto the Turkish trenches and the redoubt, while all our guns on shore, with the help of the French heavies and the now invaluable little 75s, join in the concert. At 10 a.m., issuing finished, I take my glasses and walk along the cliff, taking up a position on the side of an extra piece of high ground, and sit comfortably there with my back to it. Two 60-pounders behind me are firing away at the same target at which all the guns on land and sea are concentrating their awful fire, a target of not more than 1,500 yards of the Turkish line, with a little redoubt at the back. Shells, large, small, black, yellow, and white, burst in hellish confusion and awful chaos, while Turkish batteries, raised to fury, reply, first to one battery, then another. But their fire seems controlled by a flurried brain, for the shells burst harmlessly high in the air, or, except over our first line, of which they have the range, accurately on no targets at all. Destroyers pour in broadsides, then swoop round, making a circle, and take up a new position, letting forth viperous rounds of broadside once more. A captive sausage balloon on a tramp ship sails high in the air, well out to sea, spotting for the Talbot and the destroyers. It is by far the most terrific and mighty bombardment that I have seen, and I think appears to be so because of the large amount of artillery concentrated onto so small a target. 11 a.m. The bombardment in no way seems to slacken, but I clearly see the range increased and hear the officer behind me commanding the two sixty-pounders, which are in action just near, to increase the range. I watch carefully, and, 
as the smoke and dust quickly clear away from the redoubt and Turkish front line, which had been subjected to this terrible ordeal for two solid hours, I hear a roar of musketry, mingled with the excited, rapid reports of machine guns. I actually see, in one part, a line of blue spurts of flame, a curious effect caused by the dark background of gorse and trees. And then the sun reflects on hundreds of small metal discs, and I see leap as one man from our trenches, rows and rows of khaki figures, each equipped with a small, shining disc fastened onto his back. On they run and swarm up the redoubt like packs of hounds, and strangely, though perhaps I am too far away, I see none fall. The scene has passed. I have seen a gallant charge made in the old style, in five minutes it is over and become glorious history. The bombardment continues, and the scene goes back to one of bursting flame, yellow, green, white, and black smoke, drifting away in the strong breeze to the sea. The sixty-pounders behind me steadily plunge and recover as their charges are hurled forth on their destructive journeys with an ear-splitting roar. Suddenly, over the din, I hear a familiar and fear-striking sound, it is the deep, boom, shriek of Asiatic Annie, and her sister follows quickly after, and they are endeavoring to get at the sixty-pounders just behind and silence their efforts. The sixty-pounders take no heed, but go steadily on. They are hard to hit and are well dug in. I am directly in the line of fire, and what missed them might get me, and so, after one shell bursts, damnably close, I abruptly slither down the slopes of the cliff into the arms of two smelly Greeks who have been sitting below me, shouting now and again gleefully, Turkey finished! Our camp gets a bad shelling. Two passerbys are killed, and one of our transport men is buried in his dugout, and, when dug out, is found dead. 4.30 p.m. Have been at work on supplies. The firing has died down somewhat, Wounded are arriving, and the stretcher-bearers are nearly dropping with fatigue and heat as they carry their heavy burdens along to the dressing stations on the beach. Prisoners are arriving. I count a hundred, all looking frightened out of their lives. I heard we had captured four hundred prisoners, three lines of trenches, the boomerang fort, one four-gun battery, and twelve Maxim guns. 6 p.m. We are again bombarding heavily, and I hear my brigade is attacking, but cannot see anything but smoke and dust. 8 p.m. It is now quieted down somewhat, but Asia is sending shells over to the 60-pounder battery once more. June 29th. Early I ride up to brigade headquarters. I find they have been moved forward. I ride on past Pink Farm to the little nulla beyond and there find a trench has been dug leading out from the end of the nullah which I am told leads to brigade headquarters. The trench, recently dug, is quite eight feet deep, and roomy enough for pack mules to pass along, and men in single file to pass back in the opposite direction. All the time bullets were pinging and hissing overhead. The trench finally ended in a junction of several trenches, leading in various directions to the firing line. Dug in the sides of this junction was our new brigade headquarters, on the level of the bottom of the trench, and taking advantage of a rise in the ground in front, affording perfect cover except from a direct hit. On the left was Twelve Tree Wood, the scene of a bloody fight in the early days, but now used for artillery forward observation posts. Farmer, our brigade major, was very busy, looking ill and tired. Orderlies and telegrams were constantly arriving. The signal office was working at full steam, dot dash, dot dash, incessantly being wrapped out on the buzzers. When I see the signalers at work, the scene in a London telegraph office always comes to my mind, and I contrast the circumstances under which the respective operators work. Farmer is continually being called to the telephone. Officers on similar errands to mine are waiting. It is like being in a city office waiting for an interview with one of the directors. 
not very bright news came from the royal scots they were badly cut up yesterday losing all officers except colonel wilson and a subaltern steel is dying he was a great pal of mine was very decent to me before the landing landing at the same time as myself captain tresider who arrived a month ago is dead on our left however complete victory for british arms on coming back part of the communication trench is rather exposed and a sniper was busy after me using all his five cartridges but the bullets sailed harmlessly overhead but the risk we supply officers take is not one hundred per cent of what infantry go through a battery is sending high explosive shells over from achi now but they are bursting on the east side of this beach and after firing a dozen shells they only slightly wounded a goat eleven forty five a m i was sarcastic too soon asia has just fired over an eight inch and it has passed over our bivy with a horrible shriek and exploded in the sea they would not be able to do this if our fleet were here and so we say strafe the submarines seven p m all has been quiet on the front today but two big guns from asia and one eighteen pounder battery have been worrying the french and our four seven on the hill by de tot's battery and the big french guns have been replying the effect of the asiatic big gun when it hits anybody is terrible i picked up a jagged flat piece of metal today three-fourths inch thick nine inches long and three inches wide when these shells burst on our beach these pieces of metal fly in all directions some reaching a hundred and fifty yards away the remainder of the lowland division is landing today just two more divisions and i believe we should very soon take achi baba providing we had better supplies of big gun ammunition we put in two bays today we are most fortunate in getting sea bathing as it keeps sickness down we issue eggs now and again to the troops to endeavor to keep down dysentery all ranks get a chance of plenty of bathing sooner or later asia is very busy firing on the french batteries later at dusk they fire on hospital ships but finding out their mistake desist evidently they are turkish gunners not german nine thirty p m a great gale has sprung up and our canvas sheet roof looks like coming off the dust is awful lightning is playing over the sky and makes a very fine sight curiously there is no thunder ten p m the gale is terrific now and i call out to our servants to come and hang on to our canvas roof which is anxious to sail away after strenuous effort with dust choking us and all of us swearing and then laughing we secure the roof and turn in june thirtieth one a m a shriek and a loud explosion awaken us and carver says it is a high explosive howitzer from asia it has passed over our bivy and exploded on the beach the ordinary long-range shell seems to miss our bivy on account of the angle of trajectory but when a howitzer fires the trajectory is such that it could easily get our bivy two thirty a m we are awakened by our roof blowing off and up we have to get again and fix it the gale fortunately is dying down although the wind is pretty strong when we awoke this morning we were told that they had put several shells over in the night and one in the main supply depot has unfortunately killed a man the result of the battle two days ago was good the twenty ninth division pushing forward about three quarters of a mile and krithia should soon be ours the turks counter-attacked last night in mass but very half-heartedly and lost heavily this morning four hundred turks were seen coming up in front of the french on our right but the french seventy fives got amongst them and they ran and ran for quite a mile with the french shells bursting all amongst them to a second i should say very few of those turks were left the sixty pounder on the cliff got in a few as well three sixty pounders are out of action waiting for new springs from england and they have been waiting a devil of a time the turks are wonderful fighters on the defensive with the geographical advantage all in their favor but absolutely lack dash in the attack twelve noon 
a french battleship is coming in with the usual escort of destroyers and minesweepers looking like a duck with her ducklings evidently she is going to punish asia the smell of dead bodies and horses is attracting the unwelcome attention of vultures from asia they are evil-looking birds with ugly heads and enormous wings and circle round and round overhead sometimes tommies pot at them with their rifles but get into trouble for doing so the smell of dead bodies is at times almost unbearable in the trenches and chloride of lime is thrown over them i know of no more sickly smell than chloride of lime with the smell of a dead body blended in in the fire trenches the turks will not allow our men to bury the dead unless a special armistice is arranged in consequence in the dead of night our men volunteer to creep out tie a rope round a body which may be too near them to make the atmosphere bearable and then rush back haul the body in and bury it in the trench or they will soak the body in petrol go back to their trenches and then fire into the body the white hot bullets soon setting the petrol on fire and the bodies in this dry climate quickly get cremated several barges were sunk by last night's gale and one pinnace set on fire by last night's shelling. 3 p.m. The French battleship is now firing on Asiatic batteries very heavily, and it seems impossible that anyone could live under her fire. 5 p.m. Asia starts firing light shrapnel over, which we don't mind at all, as long as they do not fire that heavy stuff which is on you before you can duck, they can pop away all night. 5.30 p.m. Asia firing heavy stuff on French lines. Now they have pitched one bang into the hospital. I, thinking every minute one will pitch into our depot, hurry up everybody, and they work with a will, taking cover when the shriek comes. Now they fall on the beach and splinters fly around us. It's damnable. The corporal at 545 reports forage finished, which is a relief, as we can get to our dugouts. On the way across to my dugout, I hear the shriek coming, and there is no place to take cover, and the suspense is a bit nerve-trying. With a terrific bang, it falls in the hospital, but the hospital is now clear of men. 6 p.m. Safe in our dugout now, and one passes over us into the sea. Now they are falling on the beach. Nearly everybody is under cover. 7 p.m. Shelling stopped, and we are allowed to have some rest. As Williams has to go to brigade headquarters, I offer to show him the way, the headquarters having moved forwards. We start off at 8.30 p.m. and ride at a good smart trot, as we are a bit nervy of Asia sending one of those horrible big shells over. But all is quiet, and we arrive at our brigade dumping ground about three-quarters of a mile in front of Pink Farm. Pink Farm is practically raised to the ground now by shell fire. We leave our horses with an orderly who ties them up under cover and takes cover himself. Stray bullets are flying over now and again, and we get down into the nullah and go along it up the communication trench. After about half a mile, we pass a Royal Army Medical Corps orderly who says, Keep your heads low, sir, as you pass that point, pointing a little further along, as there is a sniper watching there. Of course he is wrong, suffering from wind up, and what he thinks are snipers' bullets are overs passing through a gap in the side of the trench. We hurry along, heads well down, as bullets are pretty free overhead. After another half mile, we come to headquarters. The staff are just finishing dinner in their dugout, beautifully made by the engineers. The brigade major is at the telephone, and later the general gets up and talks over it. Divisional headquarters are speaking at the other end discussing some general service point, just as if two businessmen were discussing the price of some contract. After the general resumes his place at the head of the table, the brigade major on his left-hand side, next the signal officer, on his right hand the staff captain, the brigade machine gun officer, and a major of the Royal Naval Division who had recently arrived. Williams and I are seated at the other end. The dugout is lit by an acetylene lamp, and Miller, the staff waiter and chef combined, is standing, acting butler. Outside, the ping-ping of bullets goes on incessantly. Sitting there round the table, smoking and chatting, 
I could not but compare the scene to that of the after-dinner coffee and cigars at a dinner party, when the ladies have gone to the drawing-room. The conversation is also witty and bright, with no mention of war. Miller is a character of his own. He is as dignified as a real butler would be, and yet a Tommy of the old school, through and through. But instead of black cutaway coat and side whiskers, he wears khaki trousers rather hanging over his ankles, and a gray shirt open in the front, for the heat is excessive, and sleeves rolled up. He always embarrasses me, for every time I happen to look his way, he catches my eye and beams benevolently on me. I suppose it is because I look after the Tommy's tummies. Lightning now begins to play about the sky, which gets rather cloudy, and then L Battery, just to our right, barks out suddenly. That arrests my thoughts and brings me back to reality. Y Battery starts, and then the darling little Soissons cans, and bullets begin to fairly hiss over. A hell of a shindy! Our mission over, we rise to go. We salute the general, who says good night, and off down the trench, keeping our heads very low instinctively, though really it is unnecessary. Lightning is now flashing all over the sky, and what with the flashes and roar of the batteries nearby, and the pitch darkness that comes immediately after a lightning flash, the walk back along that trench, one whole mile of it, was most weird and Dantesque. Now and again bullets hit the bank on our left, but most of them are going over. We pass troops coming up, and later see a man sitting down at the side of the trench, and finding that he had been hit in the wrist, lucky devil, we take him along with us. Arriving at the nulla, we find another man who has been hit at the dump in the leg, and we send them to the dressing station behind Pink Farm. We see the transport is all right at the brigade dump, mount our horses, which have been tied up in an awful tangle, making us use some horrid language, and then forward away. Off we go back, with overs pretty free around, and Turkish shells screaming over well on our right. The lightning frightens our horses somewhat, and blinds us after each flash. It is incessant, and lights up the peninsula in detail, but no thunder follows. We hope that Asia will let us go home in safety. She does, but half an hour after we arrive home, and when everybody except night workers and guards and pickets have turned in, heavy shells come over, and at the rate of two an hour they continue all night and so our night's rest is not as good as it might be. July 1st. On duty at depot at 6 a.m. I find one shell has pitched in my supply dump during the night, leaving a jagged splinter a foot long and four inches in its widest part. Ugh, these naval shells. At 11 o'clock shelling starts again, and we have it hot and strong for an hour and a half. The transports get it as well from the hill, and one ship nearly gets holed. Moon, one of the signal officers riding up the beach, has his horse killed under him, and he himself is wounded in chest and leg. Not seriously, but he looks pale and frightened. Very few casualties, as people keep under cover pretty well. During the shelling this morning, one of the hospital marquees catches fire, but not through the shelling and is burnt to the ground. A Turkish prisoner had dropped a smoking cigarette on some muslin. The marquee contained Turkish wounded, but I think that they were all saved. Joy of joy! Allah be praised, and glory be to God! A real plum cake and chocolate just arrived from home. What joy to get your teeth into a slice! Evening. Since noon the day has been quiet, and Asia has left us alone. Over Imbros the golden sun is slowly setting, and above the clouds are a lovely orange-red. A strong wind is blowing in from the sea, which is very rough, necessitating the suspension of the landing of supplies and ammunition. Casualties in Monday's battle were 2,500, Australians and New Zealanders included. These at Anzac engaged enemy while the 29th Division attacked, in order to keep some of them away from us. They, however, made no progress their side, and were not expected to. 
Their casualties were 500. A Turkish officer who was captured said that if we had pressed forward all along the line, we should have taken the hill, as reinforcements of one division that the Turks were expecting did not arrive. They have since arrived. However, this may have been a yarn. Last night was very quiet. July 2nd. I go up to brigade headquarters before breakfast, leaving my mare in the nullah in front of Pink Farm, where the brigade staff's horses are stabled. The general's groom, now knowing my mare well, gives her breakfast, good cool water from a well which has just been found there, oats from the Argentine, and hay from Ireland. As I walk up the trench, I feel very limp and weak. Something is wrong with me. Halfway up the trench I see part of the parapet which has been knocked down by a shell recently, and from there obtain a good view of our trenches and sphinx-like Achi Baba. She is almost human, and in my imagination appears to be smiling at the vain efforts of our little, though never contemptible army, to conquer and subdue her. I shake such thoughts off. I am run down and in consequence imagine things worse than they are. Arriving at brigade headquarters, I find the general and staff up in the trenches and talk to Brock of the Gippy Army, the staff captain. He tells me all about the Sudan, how he has two months' leave and is spending it on Gallipoli. What a place to spend a holiday! He reads my thoughts and says, people in Egypt do not realize what things are really like out here. He then tells me that lately, orderlies and others have been disappearing in a curious way. A driver last night was sent up the gully with two mules to fetch a water cart. Neither driver nor mules returned. On the way back from Pink Farm, I call on the Royal Naval Division armored cars and see a friend, then to the beach. While issuing, shells burst on top of the high ground and back of the beach. Feel rotten, and so turn in for a rest. See very rough, and we are unable to land stores, etc. Rather cloudy day, cold and windy. 7 p.m. Sixty-pounders on our right start firing again. On to the hill, and Asia answers back with that seven-and-a-half inch. Shells come screaming over to our cliff, and we have to take cover again. Doctor has given me medicine, and I feel a bit better, but horribly nervy and jumpy. Brigade coming back tomorrow. My complaint is only bilious attack, and when one is like that, shells make one jump. Nearly everybody is getting jumpy, however, as we are so exposed and get no peace day or night. Several men and officers are being sent away for a rest. There is rumor that when the hill is taken, the 29th Division is going to be withdrawn for a complete rest. Things will be much easier here when the hill is taken. At present, it is awful. Oh, for tons and tons of ammunition. Buck up, you workmen at home. The army with the most guns and unlimited shells wins in modern war. You should see the damage the dear little French 75s make, and they pop off day and night. God knows what we should have done without them. July 3rd. Turks shall transport this morning, but no damage done. Feeling very run down and seedy and doctor orders me away to Alexandria for a rest, but I do not think I shall go, as I should be fit in a day or so, if only they would stop shelling on the beach. We could then get exercise. Men fall ill day by day through having to continually lie in their dugouts, and then go out in hourly fear of Asiatic Annie's shells. It is much worse over in the French camp at Mordo Bay. The doctor says I have to catch the 2.30 boat for Lemnos, I tell him that I have decided not to go. He replies that in the army you are under two forms of discipline, one when on the active list and one when on the sick list, and that I am on the sick list, and that until a medical officer certifies that I am fit for active service, my officer commanding will be a medical officer whose orders I am bound to obey, that he has certified me as sick, for the army cannot have men on the peninsula who feel faint when they walk ten yards. This eases my conscience. I was beginning to feel like a man who was getting cold feet, and I tell him so. He tells me that a sick man always gets cold feet from shelling, 
and that it is due to his being a sick man more than to the shells. So I proceed to catch the 2.30 boat. What are my honest feelings? I do want to stay and stick it out, and yet I want to go. There, I am quite honest about it. The two thoughts are equally blended. I go down to the beach along the Red Cross Pier, onto a lighter bobbing about in a rough sea, and then I wait. Sick officers and men dribble down steadily, each with a label attached to his tunic. My label has written on it, Syncopal Attacks. I look enviously at the labels on which are inscribed different kinds of wounds. By comparison with their inscriptions, mine reads like another title for Cold Feet and I long to get up and walk back up to the beach. We are towed away out to a little steamer called the Whitby Abbey, in charge of a good fellow, a Puka naval lieutenant. I sit on deck and watch the land gradually get further and further away. Prithia looks but a short walk from W. Beach, yet it is well within the Turkish lines. Never before did I realize what a little, insignificant bite of land do we hold on the Gallipoli Peninsula, and Achi Baba looks impregnable. Tommies on board are telling each other how they came by their respective wounds. A few Punjabis, wounded, sit apart philosophically and say nothing. Officers in wardroom, mostly wounded, have tea and chat shop. I, not wounded, and Army Service Corps, sit in a corner by myself. We arrive at Lemnos about 8 p.m. and enter the harbor that I was in last April. What a lot has happened since those days, and what ages it seems ago. We go alongside a hospital ship, the Cecilia, and our stretcher cases are taken off to the ship. Have a look through the porthole and see a very big saloon full of beds and doctors, orderlies and very smart and efficient nurses busily in attendance. Then we go nearer into the shore and get on a pinnace and go to a pier. Here, three of us, namely Weatherall, Williams of the Royal Scots, and myself, get into an ambulance motor and are driven inland and arrive at the Australian hospital. There we go into the orderly tent, and a sergeant takes down our names, etc., and religion. Religion? Let us talk of religion when all Huns are exterminated. Then a pleasant-looking Australian captain comes in, diagnoses my case, and says, Milk diet, which is entered in a book. We are then taken to another group of three marquees joined together full of wounded Tommies in bed. Then a Major Newlands, one of the leading surgeons of Australia, comes in and sees me, and after a cup of tea we go to sleep. At least we are supposed to. Several of the Australians are chatting, and it is interesting listening to them. Suddenly one of the wounded stirs in his sleep and says, One, two, three, four... One, two, three, four, several times, and finishing by one, two, three, four, and then a pause, and then five, with a sigh of relief. He sits up in bed, and making the row that one makes with one's mouth when urging on a horse, he says, go on, and one of the orderlies goes over and gently puts his head back onto the pillow. He was fast asleep and was going over in his dreams the taking up of ammunition to the trenches. End of section 11 Section 12 of Gallipoli Diary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Gallipoli Diary by John Graham Gillum. Section 12, July 4th to 27th, 1915. July 4th. I and three other officers are in a ward with Tommies, for the hospital is overflowing. Orderlies bring round basins of water to wash and then breakfast of bread and milk. Then the major comes round and sounds me pretty thoroughly, and orders me to stay in bed until further orders. Lunch, rice and milk, very hot, nothing to smoke, flies damnable, and I find myself actually longing to get back to work on the peninsula. 
but I do certainly enjoy at present the relief of being away from shells and bullets and the horrors of war. July 5th. Awakened early by one of the wounded crying loudly for a doctor, the poor chap had been hit in the leg by an explosive bullet and had a pretty bad wound. He was in great agony and amongst other things cried out, What a war! And this is what they do to me! And then he made a continual cluck with his mouth that one makes by putting one's tongue to the roof of one's mouth and drawing it away when annoyed. During the morning he was pretty bad and crying and groaning, but became quite quiet, cheerful, and confident when the doctor arrived. However, gangrene had set in, as he had been four days lying on the battlefield before he was found, and he died suddenly at twelve o'clock. But Tommy breaks the silence by saying, Poor Alf has snuffed it. We were all very quiet for a bit after they came in and neatly rolled the body in a sheet and, placing it on a stretcher, carried it away. But after a bit a cheerful atmosphere comes over us, and we four officers ragged round, the Tommies enjoying the fun. Why be morbid about death? We've all got to go through it. I am allowed to get up at two o'clock, and went and had tea on board the Aragon. This was the ship that my original brigade staff came out on, with the Worcesters and Hants. The old associations that I had with the Aragon, through so many officers that I had become friendly with, and who have now gone west, depressed me somewhat, and I was glad to leave. At every turn I am reminded of those days in April, and while walking along the upper deck I could almost see the ghosts of those cheery men who marched round and round of a morning to the music of popular airs played on a piano by a gifted Tommy. I hear that W Beach was bombarded this morning. About five hundred shells came over, the heaviest bombardment the beach has ever had. The harbor and island have changed completely since I was here last. Great camps, French and English, have sprung up on shore, and the harbor is full of French and English warships and transports and their attendant small craft. July 6th. It is funny hearing the bugles again, and looking round the camps, one might be on one's 14-day annual training. I am very rheumatic -y, but getting fit fast, but I'm going to be sent to Alexandria for a few days' change. I hope to get back to the peninsula before the 29th Division go, for I hear they are going to be relieved shortly and I want to be with them at the end. The 38th Brigade of the 13th Division has arrived here, and the rest of the division is following. I think that is the division which is going to relieve us. It is curious because I was in that division as second lieutenant. At five o'clock the motor ambulance comes for us, and we go down to the British pier. They have made two piers, one for the French and one for the British, and they are the center and hum of life all day and all night. Troops arriving, troops leaving for the peninsula, wounded arriving back from the peninsula, and wounded being sent off, after a brief stay in the Mudros hospitals, back to the bases either Cairo, Alexandria, Malta, or England. And then, of course, stores and ammunition are continually being unloaded and reloaded, and all nations seem to be engaged in the work black, brown, and white. It looks utter confusion, and yet I suppose it is not. The French seem to be much better at system than the British. I think the Australian hospitals are better than the British. They have first-class surgeons, and the orderlies are splendid. The Australians are a wonderful race, and the physique of the men is splendid. Everything they do is done thoroughly. They lack discipline as we know it, yet have a discipline that is not so common with us, namely a rotter and waster is not allowed to comfortably exist. They are an exceptionally formidable weapon, for when they fight, they go on like wild men, never showing fear or attempting to go back. They perform the most extraordinary and hair-raising deeds that history can record, all the time to a flow of very sanguinary and strong language. What a superb army! admirable spirit, pride in their race and country and mother country, cheery and merry all the time, having a very keen sense of humor. As we came off in a pinnace with lighters lashed on either side conveying wounded, the 38th Brigade of the 13th Division, 
part of the first of Kitchener's new army, were embarking on pinnaces and boats towed behind to go on board destroyers to be taken to the peninsula. They were dressed in light drill khaki, with short knickers, putties, and helmets, and their packs, blankets, and ground sheets strapped to their backs, looking exceptionally smart and businesslike. They are very fine men, above the average of the British regular Tommy, and brigaded together appear to be troops of the high standard of our first line. One, of course, could only judge by personal appearance and the ordinary parade drill, which is as perfect as could be. But the near future will prove whether they have the fighting power of troops like the 29th Division. If so, then Britain has become the leading military power in the world, as well as the leading naval power. We came along the hospital ship, the SS Neuralia, a fine boat of the British India Line. Arriving on board, we were welcomed by a nurse, and Weatherall, a Royal Scots officer, and myself were given a cabin, and after a wash we go down to dinner. Imagine our feelings when we were shown to a fine table, daintily laid for dinner, waited on by Singalese dressed in white, long-skirted coats, white trousers, and curious wide-brimmed hats decorated with blue. Go to bed very early, but cannot sleep much. July 7th. Got up just before 6 a.m. and found that the ship had weighed anchor. It is a beautiful morning, and the sea and green hills of Lemnos look very fresh. We pass slowly through the fleet, which looks very formidable, yet which at present is unable to help us on our way. So, out of the harbor to sea. The past seems now like a horrid dream, as one lives idly on board in every luxury that one could have. At times I feel a shirker, yet when a medical officer sends one off the peninsula, his orders take precedence of an order of one superior officer on the active list, and once you have left, you are passed on from doctor to doctor and clearing station to hospital, and one's future remains in the medical authority's hands. Personally, I am feeling much better, the fainting feeling having left, and the rheumatism nearly so, but war is so horrible that I wish it was all over. I've seen more of the horrible side than some of those in the fire trenches, who sit comparatively safely there until the attack, this only applies to the unique situation in Gallipoli, and then, with one objective in mind, namely to get another trench in front, they leap out and charge. Most of them say the feeling is exhilarating and glorious, and those of the slightly wounded say they felt, when wounded while running on cheering, as if someone suddenly hit them with a hot stick. However, the risk I have run is not nearly so great as infantry run. But in future, give me gunnery every time, they having the most thrilling and interesting work to do of any branch of the service. However, let us hope our future will not hold war and its horrors in store for us. July 8th. This is an ideal ship for a hospital ship, luxuriously fitted with cabins and saloons. The ship is painted white, with a red band running all round, and a large red cross in the center on either side. At night a large red cross of electric globes is illuminated, and the great ship lit up makes a pretty sight. We had a burial yesterday, stopping and a great hush falling over the vessel, as the body was shot over the side and fell with a big thump and splash into the sea, resting on the surface a few seconds and then slowly sinking. I thought of the words of Prince Henry in Henry the Fourth, Part One, Food for worms, brave Percy, but the word fishes should be substituted for worms. A great number of wounded men sleep on deck, and by Jove they do look glad that they are out of it for a bit, although they want to get back after a change, some of them. All the nurses are dears, dead keen on their job. I am not wounded, so I don't like talking to them. The badly wounded officers are in beds in a large saloon, and one can look over a balustrade and see them. They are patient, and they stick the monotony admirably. One fine chap, a captain, has a lump of flesh torn from his back by a bomb and has to lie in one position. 
As I pass along the gallery overlooking the ward at all hours of the day, I can see him, either calmly looking at the roof, reading or dozing, and always in the same position, in which he will have to lie for weeks. Bombs make terrible wounds. My friend Cox of the Essex is on board. He was the officer that I saw limping back after the battle on the Wednesday after we had landed, and we have some chats together about those thrilling days. He and his officers were on the Dongola from which boat we landed, and I have mentioned how they played the priest of the parish. I never want to play that game again. A good percentage of those chaps have gone now. There are only two officers in the Essex who have not been hit. Cox has been back to the peninsula once, but is now going to Alexandria sick. I am nearly fit, but bored stiff, and want to get back to my job. The sea is calm, and it is a lovely day, and awfully peaceful and quiet on the ship. The stewards are very attentive. They are natives, as are most of the crew. I always think that the nigger makes a better servant than the white man. Colonel Bruce of the Gurkhas is on board, wounded, and has his servant with him. A ravine up the gully that he captured is now called Bruce's Ravine. This servant at the hospital in Lemnos was allowed to sleep on the floor beside his master's bed, and if his master stirred in his sleep, he sat up, watching him intently. We all had to go before the medical board this morning, a Royal Army Medical Corps general at the head. We had another burial today. July 9th. We arrive at Alexandria at 6 a.m. and berth alongside about 12. It is strange seeing the old familiar scenes again. At 1 o'clock a hospital train comes alongside, with all the carriages painted white, with a red crescent on, not the Red Cross. Curious that our Royal Army Medical Corps should use both the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. The Australian sick and wounded are taken off and sent on board this train, which leaves at three o'clock for Cairo. At eight o'clock we go off in ambulance motor wagons and are taken to the German hospital. It is a very fine hospital, now of course British, and we are put to bed and given cocoa. One of the officers of our party is suffering from a nervous breakdown, and a brother officer of his, an awfully decent chap, who had been wounded in the arm, takes charge of him just as one would a frightened child. In the motor ambulance, the nervous, broken officer put out his hand quickly and made as if to rise, and the wounded officer, with his unwounded arm, linked the other arm in his with a reassuring look. I think little touches like that are very fine. In the hospital, one officer is completely off his head and has to have an orderly in attendance all day and all night. Last night he shouted out in great fear once or twice, imagining shells and Turks. July 10th. It is now 9.30, and I have bathed and shaved and had breakfast, and am in bed awaiting the doctor. They are wheeling bad cases to the dressing rooms. A hospital is most depressing. Went out in the afternoon and did some shopping. July 11th. Very nice day. An Arab procession passes outside our hospital, headed by a band making a most infernal din, all blowing brass instruments as loudly as they can and beating drums and all marching anyhow. Difficult at first to make out what the tune is, as it is such a discord, but on listening intently we made it out to be Sousa's Stars and Stripes. Procession consisted of a whole convoy of wagons loaded with what looks like Manchester goods. What it is all about, no one but the Arabs appear to know. Found out afterwards they were going to a fair, and they were taking goods along to sell. Went out in afternoon and called at club. Saw Chief Padre of the Forces, Horden, and had a long chat with him. Later saw Shooter, Captain of the Honorable Artillery Company, A Battery. Curious running across him. Called on Mrs. Carver at Romley for tea and found several convalescent officers there, and a few other people. Lovely house and garden, and hard tennis court. But give me an English garden every time. Romley is very pretty, and is a very big suburb of Alexandria, stretching along by the sea. Very fine white mansions, standing in lovely grounds. Also several lovely public gardens, beautifully laid out. 
much more picturesque than the English public gardens. They have no railings or walls around, and consequently no entrance by gates. They simply join on and run into the neighboring suburbs. Past a very fine Arab cemetery, full of magnificent mausoleums of marble, which must have cost thousands. July 12th. Went out in afternoon into town. Plenty of troops about. Feel fit and so applied to go back to Peninsula, as the atmosphere in Alexandria is not unlike the feeling of being in khaki in London with all your pals at the front. July 14th. Went before registrar at twelve and sent into convalescence to report tomorrow morning. July 15th. Left hospital. Go down to the docks. Alexandria is a wonderful place now. Always one of the most cosmopolitan cities of the East, she has now added the responsibilities of a military base. Here, from her teeming docks, are fed the troops in Gallipoli and Mesopotamia, and here may be seen at all hours of the day and night great ships being loaded by chattering and chanting natives with food and munitions troop ships also swallowing up men or moving slowly out into the harbor tugs lighters colliers and the like throng her water gates and the quays present a vivid picture of bright colors as the gaily dressed natives go about their work fussy trains puff alongside the ships and disgorge men mules and horses in never-ending streams. Mountains of hay, bully beef, and biscuits are stacked along the quays, and the rattle of gear and the groaning of the great cranes fill the air with strange sounds. And above it all the fierce sun glares down on the hot stones and the pitiless steely blue Egyptian sky, inscrutable and cloudless, spreads overhead like a vast dome. Leaving this hive of industry, I turn my steps to the Regina Palace Hotel, where I am introduced to an Italian family by Cox. Awfully jolly girls. Have some dancing. Meet Neville of the South Wales Borderers, a friend of mine in Birmingham. Go for a motor drive into the desert with Gregory. July 20th. Went out in the evening with Prince Adil and his yacht, Henderson and our French friend. The Prince provided food consisting of cold dishes, cocktails in a thermos flask, and whiskies and sodas. It was delightful cruising about the harbor in moonlight and skimming along the water, heeling right over when we ran before the wind. July 21st. Ordered to join Siang B, a filthy little tramp, packed with troops. Fortunately for us, they are full up, and so I am told to go on board the Anglo-Egyptian, a cleaner boat. Find a draft of Gurkhas on board and a draft of Sikhs. English officers, fine lot of men, about a dozen officers all told on board. Seeks a weird lot, now and again a mysterious chant sung by them comes up from the lower decks. In the morning had quite a touching farewell at the hotel with all the Italian girls, the French children, and my little friend the Russian Cossack, aged five years, and their pretty French governess. I am getting to speak French quite well now. July 22nd. We were to start last night, but owing to submarine scare, we have not yet sailed. 5 p.m. The hospital ship Sedan has just come in, and the hospital train, ambulance, lorries, and motor cars are drawn up, waiting the wounded. I have been on board and have spoken to one of the wounded officers, who tells me that there have been two battles since I left, and that we have made further advance in the center of our line, therefore straightening it a little, but have lost very heavily. Also he told me that the 29th Division are leaving Gallipoli, and that one brigade is at Lemnos or Tenedos. 6.30 p.m. We sail, the Gurkhas and Sikhs giving their respective war cries, something like that of the Maoris which the New Zealanders sing. Two other boats leave at the same time, the Alaunia having 6,000 troops on board. We all steer different courses on account of submarines. 9.30 p.m. The last post sounds, played excellently by a Gurkha, and I turn in, sleeping on deck on account of the heat. They are neat little men, these Gurkhas, something like the Japanese, dressed in wide hats, shirts overhanging the short breech, putties and black bandoliers, bayonets in black cases, and their native weapon, the Kukri, in a black case. 
Curiously enough, they are not British subjects at all. They are natives of Nepal, governed by the Maharaja of Nepal, and he is quite independent, except for having to pay a salt tax to China. I believe, though, that this payment has now stopped, or is about to stop. The Maharaja lends his male subjects, who enlist to the British government, and they train them as soldiers, in return having them to fight our battles when necessary. Altogether, there are about twenty battalions of twenty thousand men, and since the outbreak of war, the Maharaja has practically forced every able-bodied man to enlist. They are good soldiers, but absolutely lost without their white officers, for they are just like children. July 23, 9.30 a.m. Sea rough and ship rolling. Ugh, I do feel ill. 10.30 a.m. Four blasts on the hooter call all of us to boat drill with life belts. July 24th, 8 a.m. We are passing roads on our starboard and are, therefore, entering the danger zone for submarines. It is reported that there are two about. No destroyer to escort us, so I suppose we are safe. Feel much better now. Captain Coble of the Queen's on board, friend of Parnell. Since outbreak of war, he has been with Egyptian army, now going unattached to Gallipoli for his two months' leave taking his holiday by going into battle. 7.30 p.m. Had boat drill today. Gurkha's thoroughly enjoying it. Gurkha guards posted all round the ship on lookout for submarines, with orders to fire when one comes in sight. They are watching intently, and I really believe would rather appreciate the fun if one came along, so that they could show off their marksmanship. We do not arrive at Lemnos till five tomorrow afternoon, so we still have plenty of time to be torpedoed, passing plenty of islands, but not a sign of a ship anywhere. Beautiful moonlight evening. Skipper playing chess with Captain Simpson of the Gurkhas. Other officers sitting about reading. Only fifteen officers all told, white officers of the Gurkhas and Sikhs, and a few unattached. July 25th. Three months ago today, the landing and Achi Baba is not taken yet. 2 p.m. Entering Lemnos Harbor. It is very hot now, and the water dead calm. The harbor is full of transports and warships, and on shore there are large camps in all directions. July 26th. We are now moored alongside the Siang B, which arrived almost simultaneously with us. She has 950 troops on board, drafts, and others returning to duty. No news from Gallipoli, except that things there are much as usual. After August, I hear, the weather breaks up, so that if something is not done in August, we shall have great difficulty in landing supplies and ammunition. The outlook is far from bright. Up to date, the points are with the Turk. An officious military landing officer comes on board, and tells each of us, in as imperious a way as possible, our respective destinations. I get on to the Siang B and hang about waiting. I find Morris on board, who was at the Regina Palace Hotel with me. At six o'clock, the military landing officer comes on board again, and, after arranging for our departure, casually mentions that he had heard that W Beach was heavily shelled last night. He almost licked his lips as he spoke. He had never even heard a gun fired himself. A Royal Naval Division officer tells me that he has a great desire to chuck that military landing officer overboard. This officer is quite an interesting person. Went to France in the early part of the war in the Royal Flying Corps, had a spill which laid him up for six months, and now is in charge of a machine gun section in the Royal Naval Division. We get on board a small steamer, Whitby Abbey, and sail over to the Aragon, the Lines of Communication Headquarters boat, a very nice boat, the Aragon, fitted out with every luxury. At eight o'clock we push off, loaded to the boat's limit, with troops, mail bags, water carts, sandbags, and ammunition. We pass through the host of transports and warships that now crowd the harbor of Mudros. As we pass each warship, the sailors come running to the sides and cheer and cheer. Shouts of, are we downhearted, etc., freely pass between us, and this inspiring demonstration is repeated enthusiastically 
as we pass each great ship of war. It is very nice of them. I think they feel it a bit being bottled up at Mudros. But it is all right. We shall win, even if the war lasts ten years. Stick at your training, you British Boy Scouts. We leave the hills of Lemnos, as we did on that memorable evening of April 24th, three months ago, just as it is getting dusk, the sun quickly setting in the sea. A full moon rises, and on a calm sea we steam north. They provide some food for us on board, bully beef and bread, and later we lie about and try to sleep. A very nice Royal Naval Reserve officer on board stands me a drink. Curiously enough, I came away from the peninsula on this boat on July 3rd, and the same man stood me a drink, though he had forgotten. I suppose he regularly stands a drink to all officers, coming and going. At twelve midnight he is called up on deck, and I go up too and find that land is showing dimly in front. Dark, depressing, mysterious land of adventure, heroism, and death and a chill feeling runs through me. It is the reaction after having a good time in Alexandria, playing soldiers with the little Italian boys and my little cropped-haired Russian Cossack and their pretty French governess. Oh, that little French governess! The officers and men crowd to the upper deck and bows and strain their eyes to the black outline in front. The starlights are sailing up and down in the dark background from the Aegean to the Straits, a distant shriek is heard, followed immediately by another, and two quick flashes burst over the beach in front, followed by two sharp reports, crump, and the young Royal Naval Air Service officers, who have been training for months, at last are within short measurement of the real game of modern warfare. Then the land in front resumes its still mysterious outline, until as we get close, Quiet figures can be seen moving about on shore, working at the unloading of lighters. We drop anchor and are informed that we shall disembark in the early morning, and so lie down again and sleep soundly till morning. July 27th. We wake at five and go on deck, and the old familiar sight of W. Beach greets me, and I point out to several officers who ask me the various points of interest. At 6.20 the Royal Naval Air Service people are informed that they have to go back to Mudros, as they have come to the wrong place. And at 7 o'clock, with Captains Nye and Coble and Wilson, we go ashore in a wobbly lighter, which seems about to turn over in a rather rough sea, and we come alongside one of the piers. W. Beach has altered somewhat. Large cemented water reservoirs had been made by the Jippy Works Department on the highland near our bivvy, and it seems more congested and crowded than ever. I take the officers up to our bivvy and surprise the others, who did not expect me, and I feel quite pleased to get back, the same feeling one has when one gets home to the family after a few weeks' holiday. We have breakfast, and I hear that the 13th Division are on the shore, and that several of the officers of the 13th Divisional train are just along the cliff, and so go along to see them. I found Frank Eady there, a friend of many years standing, and this was the third time during the war that we had run across each other unexpectedly. I was three months with the 13th Division at Bulford, so it was nice seeing them again. They are leaving soon for some unknown destination further up the coast. I find that W. Beach had been heavily shelled on the 5th July, 700 coming over in four hours. They are mostly high explosive shells, and make a nasty mess of any victim which they find. To people working in the various administrative departments, where they are continually walking about in the open, the continual exposure to high explosive shell fire is wearing on the nerves. And cases of nervous breakdown here are becoming more and more frequent. In spite of the most heavy shelling, the administrative work has to go on, and at high speed too. I hear bad news about my old mare. She was killed by a shell while I was away on July 5th. She had been an awfully good pal to me, and we had some good times together, and I think that her name should be put in the roll of honor. Warham, the servant of story of the 13th Division train, was blown up by a shell yesterday in his dugout along the cliff. He was a good chap, and for a short time had been my servant at Bulford. 
There has been but little shelling our way today. In fact, everything seems extraordinarily quiet. At 6 p.m. we go down to the breakwater to bathe, and I find Frank Eady there and other Bulford pals. And then, wonder of wonders, whom should I run into but my friend of many years, the versatile Gordon Findlay Smith. The last time that I saw him was in Piccadilly Circus on December 22nd while motoring. We looked at each other in amazement and then burst out laughing. He has been here ten days and is in a beastly place, which is shelled every day, namely the Ordnance Depot. 8 p.m. The night falls quicker now, but with the same lovely coloring and a full moon is shining. End of section 12